1. Introduction Go to the bee, thou poet, consider her ways and be wise. George Bernard Shaw, Man and Superman, 1903 Honey bees are sweetness and light, producers of honey and beeswax, so it is no great wonder that humans have prized these small creatures since ancient times. Even today, when rich sweets and bright lights are commonplace, we humans continue to treasure these hard-working insects, especially the two hundred billion or so that live in partnership with commercial beekeepers and perform on our behalf a critical agricultural mission. Go forth and pollinate. In North America, the managed honeybees are the primary pollinators for some fifty fruit and vegetable crops, which together form the most nutritious portion of our daily diet. But honeybees also provide us another great gift, one that feeds our brains rather than our bellies, for inside each teeming beehive is an exemplar of a community whose members succeed in working together to achieve shared goals. We will see that these little six-legged beauties have something to teach us about building smoothly functioning groups, especially ones capable of exploiting fully the power of democratic decision-making. Our lessons will come from just one species of honeybee, Apis mellifera, the best-known insect on the planet. Originally native to Western Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and Europe, it is now found in temperate and tropical regions throughout the world thanks to the dispersal efforts of its human admirers. It is a bee that is beautifully social. We can see this beauty in their nests of golden combs, those exquisite arrays of hexagonal cells sculpted of thinnest beeswax. We can see it further in their harmonious societies, wherein tens of thousands of worker bees, through enlightened self-interest, cooperate to serve a colony's common good. And in this book we will see the social beauty of honeybees vividly, and in fine detail, by examining how a colony achieves near-perfect accuracy when it selects its home. Choosing the right dwelling place is a life-or-death matter for a honeybee colony. If a colony chooses poorly and so occupies a nest cavity that is too small to hold the honey stores it needs to survive winter, or that provides it with poor protection from cold winds and hungry marauders, then it will die. Given the vital importance of choosing a suitably roomy and snug home site, it is not surprising that a colony's choice of its living quarters is made not by a few bees acting alone, but by several hundred bees acting collectively. This book is about how this sizable search committee almost always makes a good choice. We will uncover the means by which these house-hunting bees scour the neighborhood for potential nest sites, report the news of their discoveries, conduct a frank debate about these options, and ultimately reach an agreement about which site will be their colony's new dwelling place. In short, we will examine the ingenious workings of honeybee democracy. There is one common misunderstanding about the inner operations of a honeybee colony that I must dispel at the outset, namely that a colony is governed by a benevolent dictator. Her Majesty the Queen. The belief that a colony's coherence derives from an omniscient queen, or king, telling the workers what to do is centuries old, tracing back to Aristotle and persisting until modern times. But it is false. What is true is that a colony's queen lies at the heart of the whole operation, for a honeybee colony is an immense family consisting of the mother queen and her thousands of progeny. It is also true that the many thousands of attentive daughters, the workers, of the Mother Queen are, ultimately, all striving to promote her survival and reproduction. Nevertheless, a colony's queen is not the royal decider. Rather, she is the royal ovipositor. Each summer day she monotonously lays the fifteen hundred or so eggs needed to maintain her colony's workforce. She is oblivious of her colony's ever-changing labor needs. For example, more comb-builders here, fewer pollen-foragers there, to which the colony's staff of worker bees steadily adapts itself. The only known dominion exercised by the queen 
is the suppression of rearing additional queens. She accomplishes this with a glandular secretion called queen substance that workers contacting her pick up on their antennae and distribute to all corners of the hive. In this way, these workers spread the word that their mother queen is alive and well, hence there is no need to rear a new queen. So the mother queen is not the worker's boss. Indeed, there is no all-knowing central planner supervising the thousands and thousands of worker bees in a colony. The work of a hive is instead governed collectively by the workers themselves, each one an alert individual making tours of inspection, looking for things to do, and acting on her own to serve the community. Living close together, connected by the network of their shared environment and a repertoire of signals for informing one another of urgent labor needs, for example, dances that direct foragers to flowers brimming with sweet nectar, the workers achieve an enviable harmony of labor without supervision. Collective Intelligence This book focuses on what I believe is the most wondrous example of how the multitude of bees in a hive, much like the multitude of cells in a body, work together without an overseer to create a functional unit whose abilities far transcend those of its constituents. Specifically, we will examine how a swarm of honeybees achieves a form of collective intelligence in the choice of its home. As will be described in Chapter 2, the bees' process of house hunting unfolds in late spring and early summer when colonies become overcrowded in their nesting cavities, beehives and tree hollows, and then cast a swarm. When this happens, about a third of the worker bees stay at home and rear a new queen, thereby perpetuating the mother colony, while the other two-thirds of the workforce, a group of some ten thousand, rushes off with the old queen to create a daughter colony. The migrants travel only thirty meters, about a hundred feet or so, before coalescing into a beard-like cluster, where they literally hang out together for several hours or a few days. Once bivouacked, the swarm will field several hundred house hunters to explore some seventy square kilometers, 30 square miles, of the surrounding landscape for potential home sites, locate a dozen or more possibilities, evaluate each one with respect to the multiple criteria that define a bee's dream home, and democratically select a favorite for their new domicile. The bee's collective judgment almost always favors the site that best fulfills their need for sufficiently spacious and highly protective accommodations. Then, Shortly after completing their selection process, the swarm bees implement their choice by taking flight en masse and flying straight to their new home, usually a snug cavity in a tree a few miles away. The enchanting story of house hunting by honeybees presents us with two intriguing mysteries. First, how can a bunch of tiny-brained bees hanging from a tree branch make such a complex decision, and make it well. The solution to this first mystery will be revealed in chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6. Second, how can a swirling ensemble of 10,000 airborne bees steer themselves and stay together throughout the cross-country flight to their chosen home, a journey whose destination is typically a small knot hole in an inconspicuous tree in a remote forest corner? The solution to this second mystery will be revealed in chapters 7 and 8. We will see that the 1.5 kilograms, 3 pounds, of bees in a honeybee swarm, just like the 1.5 kilograms, 3 pounds, of neurons in a human brain, achieve their collective wisdom by organizing themselves in such a way that even though each individual has limited information and limited intelligence, the group as a whole makes first-rate collective decisions. This comparison between swarms and brains might seem superficial, but there is real substance here. Over the last two decades, while other sociobiologists and I have been analyzing the behavioral mechanisms of decision-making by insect societies, neurobiologists have been investigating the neuronal basis of decision-making by primate brains. It turns out there are intriguing similarities in the pictures that have emerged from these two independent lines of study. 
For example, the studies of individual neuron activity associated with the eye movement decisions in monkey brains and the studies of individual bee activity associated with nest site decisions in honeybee swarms have both found that the decision-making process is essentially a competition between alternatives to accumulate support, for example, neuron firings and bee visits, and the alternative that is chosen is the one whose accumulation of support first surpasses a critical threshold. Consistencies like these suggest that there are general principles of organization for building groups far smarter than the smartest individuals in them. We will explore these principles in Chapter 9, where we will compare the decision-making mechanisms of bee swarms and primate brains, and in Chapter 10, where we will review the lessons that have been learned from the bees about how to structure a group so that it functions as a smart decision-maker. Group decisions by humans are widespread and important, whether they are small-scale, for example, agreements made among friends and colleagues, medium-scale, for example, choices made in democratic town meetings, or large-scale decisions, for example, national elections or international agreements. Not surprisingly, humans have puzzled over how to optimize group decision-making for millennia, at least since Plato's The Republic, 360 BC, and no doubt long before. And yet many questions remain open about how humans can improve social choice, in Chapter 10, I will offer some suggestions, what I call swarm smarts, because they have been learned from the bees, on how human groups can organize themselves to improve their decision-making. The American essayist Henry David Thoreau expressed skepticism about the wisdom of crowds when he wrote, The mass never comes up to the standard of its best member, but on the contrary degrades itself to a level with the lowest. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche was even more negative about group intelligence when he wrote, Madness is rare in individuals, but in groups it is the rule. Certainly there are many examples of groups making lousy decisions. Think of stock market bubbles or of deadly stampedes from burning buildings. But the reality of honeybee swarms making good decisions shows us that there really are ways to endow a group with a high collective IQ. Dancing Bees The scientific story told in this book started in Germany almost 70 years ago, in the summer of 1944, when a distinguished professor of zoology at the University of Munich, Karl von Frisch, made a revolutionary discovery for which he would eventually receive the Nobel Prize. An insect, the worker honeybee, can inform her hive mates of the direction and distance to a rich food source by means of dance behavior. Monfrisch had already known for nearly thirty years that when a lone forager finds a rich source of nectar, she returns excitedly to her hive and performs a conspicuous waggle dance. In performing this eye-catching behavior, the dancer walks straight ahead on the vertical surface of a comb, waggling her body from side to side. Then she stops the waggle run and turns left or right to make a semicircular return run back to her starting point, whereupon she produces another waggle run, followed by another return run, and so on. Each waggle dance consists, therefore, of a series of dance circuits, and each dance circuit contains a waggle run and a return run. Von Frisch also knew that a bee may continue dancing for some seconds or even some minutes, all the while trailed by unemployed foragers that, in his own words, take part in each of her maneuverings so that the dancer herself, in her madly wheeling movements, appears to carry behind her a perpetual comet's tail of bees. Furthermore, he knew well that after a dance follower has tripped along behind a dancer throughout several circuits of her dance, she rushes out of the hive to search for the bonanza announced by the dancing bee. But before 1944, von Frisch thought that the only thing the dance followers learned from the dancer was the fragrance of the flowers she had visited, which they detected by holding their antennae close to the dancer to smell the floral scents adhering to her body, 
and that upon leaving the hive the newly aroused bees simply searched in ever-expanding circles until they discovered flowers with the memorized fragrance what von frisch discovered in 1944 was nearly incredible the dance followers did not search for flowers with the matching scent everywhere around the hive but only in the vicinity of where the dancer had foraged even if she had foraged in a remote spot such as along a shady lakeside trail far from the hive without a doubt the newcomers were somehow acquiring from the successful forager information about food source location as well as food source scent could this location information be communicated inside the hive by means of the bees dances the answer turned out to be a definitive yes in the summer of 1945 amid the chaos in europe following the end of world war ii von frisch returned to his dancing bees now observing their movements more closely than ever before examining them for clues that would help him solve his mystery he discovered that when a bee performs a waggle run inside a dark hive she produces a miniaturized reenactment of her recent flight outside the hive over sunlit countryside and in this way indicates the location of the rich food source she has just visited her encoding of the information about food source location works as follows the duration of the waggle run made conspicuous despite the darkness by the dancer audibly buzzing her wings while waggling her body is directly proportional to the length of the outward journey on average one second of the combined body waggling wing buzzing represents some one thousand meters six tenths of a mile of flight and the angle of the waggle run relative to straight up on the vertical comb represents the angle of the outward journey relative to the direction of the sun thus for example if a successful forager walks directly upward while producing a waggle run she indicates that the feeding place is in the same direction as the sun or if the waggling bee heads forty degrees to the right of vertical her message is the feeding place is forty degrees to the right of the sun perhaps most remarkably the bees that follow a dancer monitoring her waggle runs are able to decode her dance and put her flight instructions into action while von frisch was deciphering the secret message of the waggle dance he was also supervising a young graduate student named martin lindauer who was to prove von frisch's most gifted disciple in revealing the inner workings of honeybee colonies lindauer is an especially important figure in this book for he pioneered the study of honeybee democracy as practiced in a bee swarm choosing its home lindauer was born in a tiny village in the foothills of the bavarian alps the next to youngest of fifteen children in a poor farming family here he grew up close to nature including the bees in his father's hives but he was also an outstanding student and won a scholarship to a distinguished boarding school in landshut germany in april nineteen thirty nine eight days after his high school graduation he was drafted into hitler's work service to dig trenches and six months later he was transferred to the army and assigned to an anti-tank unit in july nineteen forty two during fierce fighting on the russian front he received deep shrapnel wounds from an exploding grenade this proved his salvation he was removed from the front but the other 156 men in his company went on to the battle of stalingrad only three returned alive while recovering in munich lindauer was recommended by his physician to visit the university and attend one of the general zoology lectures delivered by the famous professor karl von frisch lindauer later recalled that when he did and saw von frisch talking about cell division he returned to a new world of humanity where people create rather than destroy he resolved to study biology and in the summer of nineteen forty three after being discharged from the army as a severely wounded soldier he began university studies in munich ultimately he started his phd research on honeybees with von frisch his adviser in the spring of nineteen forty five dirty dancers lindauer had a knack for noticing little things in passing 
some curious anomaly or surprising behavioral quirk that would eventually turn out to be important. It was thanks to this special talent that Lindauer embarked on his studies of house hunting by honeybees, which he would later refer to as the most beautiful experience in his scientific work. It all began on a spring afternoon in 1949 when Lindauer was walking past the beehives outside the Zoological Institute, and he spied a golden mass of bees, a swarm hanging on a bush. Pausing to study it, he noticed several bees performing waggle dances on the swarm's surface, doing so with their usual attention-grabbing vigor. But instead of striding across a beeswax comb, the normal dance floor for bees, these dancers were walking over the backs of other bees. Initially he assumed that these swarm dancers were foragers bringing food back to the swarm, because all the dancing bees that he and von Frisch had studied over the past few years had been foragers bringing food back to the hive. But with his customary patience in watching the bees, Lindauer lingered by the swarm, kept observing its dancers, and gradually realized that they did not look like foragers, for unlike pollen foragers, they never carried pollen loads, and unlike nectar foragers, they never regurgitated droplets of nectar to adjacent bees. He also saw something odd. Many of the dancers arrived at the swarm dirty and dusty. When he plucked several of these rather grubby bees from the swarm with forceps, dusted them off with a small paintbrush, and examined the debris under a microscope, he found no pollen grains, just various forms of dirt particles. Black with soot, he reported. Red with brick dust, white with flour, or gray and dusty as if they had been grubbing a hole in the ground. Sniffing the bees black with soot, he was reminded of the aroma of a chimney sweep. Lindauer concluded that these dusty and dirty dancers were certainly not foragers. He suspected that they were nest site scouts who had discovered potential nesting cavities amid the rubble of bombed out Munich. An unused chimney here, a cavity in some collapsed brick wall there, or even a forgotten flower chest in an abandoned attic and were indicating the locations of their discoveries by performing waggle dances. He was eager to test this hunch by making further observations of swarm bees, but in 1949, with Germany's economy still in shambles and von Frisch's laboratory short of bees, von Frisch directed the Institute's beekeeper to promptly hive all swarms, lest the bees be lost. This meant that the bees' house-hunting process was cut short. And so, for the time being, Lindauer's study of the house-hunting process was also cut short. But he persisted in seeking approval to leave some swarms alone so he could study their dancing bees, and two summers later, in 1951, von Frisch granted Lindauer permission to study as he wished all the swarms from the beehives kept in the garden of the Zoological Institute in Munich. Later, in chapters 3 to 6, we will review in detail the intriguing story of democratic decision-making by honeybees that Lindauer started piecing together in 1951. For now, we will consider only how he tested his hypothesis that the bees performing dances on a swarm are nest site scouts advertising potential homes. In the summer of 1951, he examined the dances on nine swarms, Sitting patiently beside each swarm for hours and days on end, he labeled each dancing bee with a paint dot when she began her dancing, and he noted the direction and distance of the site indicated by her first dance. Lindauer reasonably assumed that his swarming bees were encoding distance and direction information in their dances in exactly the same way as von Frisch had found for his foraging bees. These swarm-side vigils led Lindauer to a surprising finding. When dancers started to appear on a swarm, they announced a dozen or more widely separated locations. But after a few hours or a few days, they began to announce one location in increasing numbers. Ultimately, during the last hour or so before the swarm took off to fly to its new home, the bees dancing on the swarm all indicated just one distance and direction. 
Lindauer reasoned that if the bees dancing on a swarm had been searching for nest sites, and if they were performing dances to advertise their finds, then the location they were indicating unanimously in the end should correspond to the location of the swarm's new residence. To test this prediction, he tried to follow each swarm when it flew to its new home by sprinting down Munich streets and alleys beneath the airborne swarm. Three times he succeeded and in each case the spot indicated by the bees closing dances matched the address of their new dwelling place so sure enough lindauer's dirty dancers really were house hunters catching the buzz in june 1952 when lindauer was busy in his second summer of swarm watching in munich I was born some 6,500 kilometers, 4,000 miles, away, in a little town in Pennsylvania. A few years later, my family moved to Ithaca, New York, which has been basically my hometown ever since. While growing up in Ellis Hollow, a rural community a few miles east of Ithaca, I spent much time alone exploring the wild areas around our home— shady hardwood forests on the steep hillsides sunlit abandoned fields where the land slopes gently and widening cascadilla creek connecting broad swamps in the valley bottom my favorite find was about a mile from home down a dirt road that led to an old farmhouse here in a sunny spot beside a field of goldenrod i discovered two wooden hives of bees that belonged to a beekeeper I loved visiting these hives. Sitting beside one, I could see bees landing heavily at the entrance with loads of brightly colored pollen, I could hear the hum of bees fanning their wings to ventilate their nest, and I could smell the aroma of ripening honey. That thousands of insects could live together so densely and harmoniously, and could build delicate wax combs filled with delicious honey, was an almost miraculous wonder that left a deep impression. No less impressive was what I saw when I lay in the tall grass beside these hives. Thousands of humming bees crisscrossing the blue summer sky like shooting stars. It was not until high school, when my peers seemed interested mostly in sports, motorcycles, and girls, that I became utterly spellbound by the bees. I'd had a deep curiosity about honeybees ever since a beekeeper made a show-and-tell visit to my third-grade class in elementary school, and I had especially enjoyed earning an insect study merit badge as a Boy Scout in junior high school. I had even daydreamed from time to time about ordering a hive and some bees from the Sears catalog and taking up beekeeping. But I didn't really catch the buzz until the summer day in 1969, when I found a swarm hanging from a tree branch, quickly nailed together some boards to make a crude hive, shook the bees into my hive, and brought them home. Now I had these little sparks of wonderment living in a box that I could gently open to watch them closely, and I did so for several hours each day after work, mesmerized by the intricate behaviors of the individual bees and by the peace of their great community. In the fall of 1970, when I began my freshman year at Dartmouth College, I hadn't yet realized that studying bees could be serious business, and I aimed to become a physician who would do beekeeping as a hobby. But the allure of the bees grew stronger and stronger. I made bees or beekeeping the subject of nearly every college writing assignment. I chose chemistry as my major area of study so that I could become a cryptographer of the chemical, pheromonal language of bees, which was just starting to be deciphered. And I returned each summer to Ithaca so that I could work at the Dice Laboratory for Honey Bee Studies at Cornell. The director of this lab, Roger A. Morse, Doc, understood my passion for the bees and advised me to give graduate school some thought. During my last two years at Dartmouth, I gradually became aware that my interests in entomology had eclipsed those in medicine, so even though I applied to and was accepted by three medical schools, I was thrilled when I was accepted at Harvard to pursue graduate studies with the noted insect sociologist Edward O. Wilson, whose 1971 book, The Insect Societies, had made an enormous impression on me. 
When I arrived at Harvard in the fall of 1974, I had the good fortune of being assigned to Bert Holdobler, a brilliant investigator of ant behavior and a young man of immense personal appeal, for my provisional thesis advisor. Bert had recently moved from the University of Frankfurt, Germany. He had been hired by Harvard as a full professor to seed the university with the Carl von Frisch approach to animal behavior study. Close behavioral observations of animals living in nature combined with incisive experimental investigations on the mechanisms underlying their behavior. In Germany, Bert had studied under Martin Lindauer, so he knew the bees as well as the ants, his own first love. He supported my biophilia, and we were quick to become friends. Bert Holdobler's connection with Martin Lindauer was important to me because I knew that I wanted my Ph.D. thesis research to deepen Lindauer's investigations of how a honeybee colony works as unit, a kind of superorganism. I was especially keen to analyze in greater detail the decision-making process of a honeybee swarm. Back at Dartmouth, I had read Lindauer's little book, Communication Among Social Bees, and had been especially intrigued by Chapter 2, titled Communication by Dancing in Swarm Bees, in which he summarized his studies of how a swarm chooses its home. Indeed, I was so fascinated that I tracked down Lindauer's full report on this work, a 62-page paper, all in German, titled Schwarmbienen auf Wohnensuche, Swarm Bees Out House Hunting. There was just one problem. I could not read German. My solution was to enroll in an introductory German course at Dartmouth, buy a German-English dictionary, make a Xerox copy of Lindauer's paper, and patiently decipher Lindauer's big paper. I penciled in the paper's margins the meaning of every new German word, and this densely annotated copy, now thirty-eight years old, is a prized part of my reprint collection. In poring over this paper, I began to realize that Lindauer's pioneering investigation of the swarm bee's process of collective decision-making provided just a preliminary understanding of the subject, and that it, like all good scientific studies, raised many more questions than it answered. I was also amazed, and I confess delighted, that during the nearly twenty years since Lindauer had published his work in 1955, no one had pressed the investigation more deeply. I resolved to do so, starting with my Ph.D. thesis research. This book aims to present to biologists and general audience what was learned by Lindauer in the 1950s and by myself and others since the 1970s about how the workers in a honeybee swarm conduct a democratic decision-making process to make the life-or-death choice of where to build their new home. This work has revealed how the process of evolution by natural selection, operating over millions of years, has shaped the behavior of bees so that they coalesce into a single collective intelligence. This story about the bees also provides useful guidelines to human groups whose members share common interests and want to make good group decisions. Mainly, though, this book tries to be a window into the private world of a honeybee colony. If it bolsters in any way an appreciation of these little creatures for the beauty of their social behavior, along with their service in keeping the world flowering and fruitful, then it will have achieved its purpose. 2. Life in a Honeybee Colony This being an Amazonian or feminine kingdom Charles Butler, The Feminine Monarchy, 1609 The honeybee, Apis mellifera, is just one of nearly 20,000 species of bees that exist worldwide. They are a surprisingly diverse lot. Some are smaller than a rice grain, while others will half fill a teacup. But they are all descended from one ancestral species of vegetarian wasp that lived approximately a hundred million years ago, in the early Cretaceous period, when huge dinosaurs were still stomping about, and flowering plants were just starting to appear. Even today, many bee species are remarkably wasp-like in appearance, but behaviorally the two groups are distinct. 
nearly all wasps including the familiar paper wasps and yellow jackets are predators that kill other insects or spiders often by stinging to provide the egg-laying females and their growing young with proteinaceous food bees however have abandoned the carnivorous behavior of their ancestors and depend instead on collecting protein-rich pollen from flowers this pollinivorous habit explains the decidedly fuzzy almost teddy bearish look of many bees their bodies are thickly covered with plumose hairs that efficiently catch pollen grains when a bee scrabbles through a flower both bees and wasps regularly visit flowers for both types of insects feed on sugary nectar for energy but it is between the pollen-loving bees and the flowering plants that a strong mutual dependence has evolved over the millions of years since both groups arose these days the two are made for each other bees depend on flowers for adequate nourishment while many flowering plants depend on bees for sexual reproduction bees with their hairy bodies and fixation on flowers as protein sources serve as flying penises for the plants picking up pollen grains from the bursting anthers of one flower and depositing them on the sticky stigma of another introducing a hive of honeybees to any flowering area garden orchard blooming wayside or prairie brings to the neighborhood in effect a large dawn to dusk escort service of the flowers little friends honeybees are unusual bees in that they live in teeming societies whose massive nests of honeycomb fill the boxy hives of beekeepers or as we shall see suitably spacious cavities in hollow trees in most bee species by contrast individuals live in solitude and build small nests in narrow tunnels excavated inside plant stems or in sandy soil the typical life history of one of these solitary bee species starts in late spring or early summer when a mated female emerges from an overwintering burrow the males having died off the previous fall over the next few weeks this motherly bee will excavate a multi-chambered nest provision each chamber with a sticky ball of pollen moistened with nectar lay one whitish egg atop each pollen ball seal up each chamber and then leave her offspring to eat their way to adulthood later that summer she will die long before her offspring emerge as adults mate with one another and prepare for the coming winter clearly most bees are loners a composite being when we look through the glass walls of a honeybee observation hive or gently lift the lid from a conventional beehive and peer inside we see the opposite of loner bees thousands and thousands of bees living together virtually all are female worker bees all of whom are daughters of the one queen bee that lives in their midst even though these workers are females and are fully equipped to care for offspring they have poorly developed ovaries and they rarely lay any eggs if we proceed to search the combs of the hive carefully we will eventually locate the queen who resembles the workers but is a bit bigger with a longer abdomen and longer legs her greater size is impressive but what most renders her conspicuous is how she moves slowly indeed majestically across the combs and how she is treated by her worker daughters as the queen advances the workers before her step back to clear her path and when she pauses the dozen or so workers beside her gingerly step forward to feed and groom her forming a retinue of nudging bees that encircles her completely in contrast to the workers the queen is an amazing layer of eggs depositing them in cells at a rate of one or more per minute or more than fifteen hundred per day with a combined weight nearly equal to her own in late spring and early summer when a colony's brood rearing is at its peak over an entire summer a colony's queen will produce some a hundred and fifty thousand eggs hence about half a million during the two or three years of her likely lifespan most of the pearly white eggs the queen lays will be fertilized but some will be unfertilized 
During the first week of her life, she flew from her colony's hive and mated with ten to twenty males from other hives in the area, and so procured a lifetime supply of approximately five million sperm. The queen stores all these sperm in suspended animation inside a spherical organ called a spermatheca, which lies in the rear of her abdomen behind her massive ovaries. With each egg she lays, the queen decides whether to dispense a few fertilizing sperm or to hold them back, and in this way she determines the sex of her offspring, fertilized for female, unfertilized for male. Whether a fertilized egg develops into a non-breeding worker or an egg-laying queen depends on how it is treated. If it is deposited in a standard size cell in the combs, where after hatching into a larva it will be fed by the workers with standard quality larval food, then it will develop into a worker. But if a fertilized egg is deposited in a large, specially built queen cell hanging from the bottom of a comb, then the larva it gives rise to will be fed a lavish diet of nutrient-rich secretions, so-called royal jelly, and its development will be channeled to a developmental pathway that produces a queen. For the fertilized eggs of bees, food is destiny. A queen withholds sperm from less than 5% of her eggs, but these unfertilized eggs are important, for they give rise to her sons, the colony's drones. These are a colony's brawniest bees, endowed with huge eyes for spying young queens out on nuptial flights and massive flight muscles for chasing after the queens at speeds of up to 35 kilometers an hour, about 22 miles per hour. They are also a colony's laziest bees. Unlike the workers who perform all the household tasks inside their hive, clean cells, feed larvae, build combs, ripen honey, ventilate hive, guard entrance, etc., the drones spend their time at home simply hanging out in restful leisure, from time to time helping themselves to meals from the colony's honey reserves or begging feedings from their worker sisters. Nevertheless, they make a fundamentally important contribution to their colony's success, for in mating with the young queens of the neighboring colonies, they help their colony win in the ceaseless evolutionary competition to pass genes on to future generations. And when it comes to seeking sex, drone honeybees are no slackers. Every sunny afternoon, once a drone reaches sexual maturity at about twelve days of age, he will fly from his hive looking for action. In ways that remain mysterious, he will find his way to one of the traditional honeybee mating areas, drone congregation areas, within a few miles of his home, and will fly about this aerial pickup spot, waiting for a young queen to appear. If one does, he will zoom after her, and if he manages to outrace his rivals and contact the queen, he will inseminate her in flight, ten to twenty meters, thirty to sixty feet, up in the sky. If he doesn't make contact, he'll fly home, rest and refuel, and come out later to try his luck again. One way to think of a honeybee colony is, then, as a society of many thousands of individuals, the queen, workers, and drones just discussed. But to understand the distinctive biology of this species of bee, it is often helpful to think of a colony in a slightly different way, not just as thousands of separate bees, but also as a single living entity that functions as a unified whole. In other words, it can help to think of a honeybee colony as a superorganism. Just as a human body functions as a single integrated unit, even though it is a multitude of cells, the superorganism of a honeybee colony operates as a single coherent whole, even though it is a multitude of bees. The fact that both perspectives, colony as superorganism and colony as society are valid reflects the way in which evolution has repeatedly built higher level units of biological organization by assembling unified societies of lower level units for example during the origins of multicellular organisms natural selection favored some societies of cells whose members cooperated rather than competed bit by bit 
This selection for close cooperation produced the thoroughly integrated societies of cells that we know today, for example, as hummingbirds and human beings. The same sort of selection for extreme cooperation also happened with some societies of animals to produce the thoroughly harmonious, smoothly running insect societies that we can call superorganisms. These include not just colonies of honeybees, but also the gigantic colonies of leafcutter ants, driver ants, or fungus growing termites. A colony of honeybees is, then, far more than an aggregation of individuals. It is a composite being that functions as an integrated whole. Indeed, one can accurately think of a honeybee colony as a single living entity weighing as much as five kilograms, ten pounds, and performing all of the basic physiological processes that support life, ingesting and digesting food, maintaining nutritional balance, circulating resources, exchanging respiratory gases, regulating water content, controlling body temperature, sensing the environment, deciding how to behave, and achieving locomotion. Consider, for example, the control of body, colony, temperature. From late winter to early fall, when the workers are rearing brood, a colony's internal temperature is kept between 34 and 36 degrees centigrade, 93 and 96 degrees Fahrenheit, just below the core body temperature of humans, even as the ambient air temperature ranges from minus 30 to 50 degrees centigrade, minus 20 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The colony accomplishes this by adjusting the rate at which it sheds the heat generated by its resting metabolism, and, in times of extreme cold, by boosting its metabolism to intensify its heat production. A colony's metabolism is fueled by the honey it has stored in its hive. Other indicators of the high functional integration of a honeybee colony include colonial breathing, limiting the buildup of the respiratory gas CO2 inside the hive by increasing its ventilation when the CO2 level reaches 1 to 2 percent, colonial circulation, keeping the heat-producing bees in the central brood nest region of the hive properly fueled with honey carried in from peripheral honeycombs, and colonial fever response, mounting a disease-fighting elevation of the nest temperature when a colony suffers a dangerous fungal infection of the brood bees. I suggest, though, that the single best demonstration of the superorganismic nature of a honeybee colony is the ability of a honeybee swarm to function as an intelligent decision-making unit when choosing its new home. Unique Annual Cycle the key to understanding why honeybee swarms are meticulous in the choice of their living quarters is the unique annual cycle of the honeybee, which depends critically on colonies occupying nesting cavities that are both snug and roomy. Unlike all the other social insect species that live in cold climates, honeybees do not survive winter in dormancy, but as fully functioning colonies in self-heated nests. To achieve this means of winter survival, each colony contracts in winter into a tight, well-insulated cluster of bees about the size of a basketball. The cluster's surface temperature is maintained above 10 degrees centigrade, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a few degrees above a worker bee's chill coma threshold, and so is warm enough to keep the outermost bees alive. Heat is generated within the cluster by the bees isometrically contracting their two sets of flight muscles, one for elevating the wings and one for depressing them, thereby producing much heat but few or no wing vibrations. These flight muscles endow a bee with a surprisingly powerful means of heat production. Bees fly, of course, by flapping their wings, the most energetically demanding mode of animal locomotion, and the flight muscles of insects are among the most metabolically active of tissues. Indeed, a flying bee expends energy at a rate of about 500 watts per kilogram, 250 watts per pound, whereas the maximum power output of an Olympic rowing crew is only about 20 watts per kilogram, 10 watts per pound. 
At any moment, however, only a small portion of the clustered bees will be shivering with maximum intensity, so the total heat output by the approximately 2 kilograms 4 pounds of bees in a winter cluster isn't 1,000 watts, but is only about 40 watts, a rate of heat production like that of a small incandescent light bulb. In a snug cavity, sheltered from heat-robbing winds, a colony with this level of heat output will survive the winter quite nicely. The importance of inhabiting a protective cavity is demonstrated by the sad fate of the occasional colony that fails to find shelter and nests in the open. Almost certainly it will perish when winter's cold arrives. A honeybee colony runs year-round on flower power, for what fuels a colony's heat production all winter long is the twenty or more kilograms, forty-four-plus pounds, of honey that the colony stockpiled in its honeycombs over the previous summer. If one mounts a hive of bees on scales and takes a weight reading each day for an entire year, one will see that winter is a time of steady weight losses as a colony consumes its honey stores, and that summer is a time of episodic weight gains as a colony scrambles to replenish these stores. For example, in Ithaca, New York, my colonies restock their honeycombs mainly during the 60-day period between May 15th and July 15th, when there unfolds a succession of mass flowerings by plants that produce copious nectar, including black locust and basswood trees, sumac shrubs, and various herbaceous plants such as dandelions, raspberries, milkweeds, and clover. On a day when the air is warm, the sun is strong, and nectar is flush, the hive that I keep at home on a set of platform scales will grow heavier by several kilograms, virtually all of it fresh honey. Beekeepers call a string of such days a honey flow. The task of amassing within a short summer season an ample supply of winter heating fuel is one of the greatest problems faced by a honey bee colony. Honey is a dense, energy-rich food, but even so, 20 kilograms, 44 pounds, of the stuff will nearly fill a 16-liter, 14-quart bucket, or more than 50 of those plastic honey bears one sees lined up beside the grape jelly at the supermarket. How much work effort and storage space is needed to create such a bulky hoard of calories? Regarding work effort, given that freshly collected nectar is, on average, a 40% sugar solution, and fully ripened honey is roughly an 80% sugar solution, and given that a foraging bee typically brings home a nectar load weighing about 40 milligrams, 0 0.001 ounces, we can calculate that the collection of enough nectar to produce 20 kilograms, 44 pounds, of honey requires more than one million foraging trips by a colony's workers. And when one also considers the miles flown and countless blossoms visited on each foraging trip, one realizes what prodigious efforts the bees make over summer to sustain their colony through winter. Regarding storage space, Given that it takes 250 square centimeters of honeycomb to store one kilogram of honey, that is, 18 square inches of comb per pound of honey, and given that every 250 square centimeters of honeycomb require about 0 0.9 liters of nest cavity space to accommodate the honey-filled comb and the adjacent passageways for the bees, we can calculate that the storage of 20 kilograms, 44 pounds, of honey requires a nesting cavity of at least some 18 liters, 4 gallons. Thus we can see that when a colony chooses its future home site, it will need to reject tree cavities smaller than these volumes. Ideally, it will find a nesting cavity somewhat roomier still to accommodate extra honey-filled combs and still more combs for the colony's brood-rearing operation, which in spring can fill more than half the cells in a colony's nest as the colony rebuilds its workforce in preparation for swarming. Beekeepers, by the way, have found a clever way to exploit the bees' drive to fill their nests with honey. By housing their colonies in hives that provide vastly more nesting space, about 160 liters, some 36 gallons, than is needed by bees living in nature, 
beekeepers induce their colonies to amass astonishing amounts of honey sometimes more than one hundred kilograms two hundred twenty pounds of honey per hive in a summer thus a colony of hard-working bees residing in a beekeeper's hive will often provide its landlord with dozens of combs brimming with honey the honeybee's annual cycle is unique in other ways besides the overwintering process consider how a colony starts rebuilding its workforce in the middle of winter shortly after the winter solstice when the days begin to grow longer but snow still blankets the countryside each honeybee colony raises the core temperature of its winter cluster to about thirty five degrees centigrade ninety five degrees fahrenheit the optimum temperature for rearing new bees with the cluster's core now serving as a cozy incubator the queen begins to lay eggs using cells that were emptied of their honey during the preceding weeks of cold larvae hatch from these eggs approximately three days after they were laid and are fed by the adult workers at first the workers feed the larvae a proteinaceous food secreted by glands located in their the adult bees heads but after about three days they wean them to a mixture of honey and pollen about ten days after hatching from its egg each larva has grown to nearly fill its cell and starts to spin the cocoon in which it will metamorphose into an adult bee the adult workers build a wax capping over the cell to protect the immature bee during this delicate pupal stage of development once metamorphosis is complete in about another week the fully developed worker bee chews through the capping on her cell and joins her colony's growing workforce when a colony starts its impressive performance of rearing brood in the middle of winter there are only a hundred or so cells containing developing bees but by early spring when the first flowers blossom over one thousand cells hold developing bees and the pace of colony growth quickens daily come late spring when most other insects are just starting to become active honey-bee colonies have already grown to full size twenty or thirty thousand individuals and have begun to reproduce colony reproduction reproduction by a honey-bee colony is a curiously complex affair for each colony is a hermaphrodite meaning that it has both male and female reproductive powers this is decidedly different from ourselves and most other animals where each individual is either a male or a female but it is strikingly similar to many plants such as apple trees in fact to make sense of how a honey-bee colony reproduces i find it helpful to compare how honey-bee colonies and apple trees go about achieving sexual reproduction their basic similarity is that both types of individual colony and tree produce both male and female reproductive propagules the male propagules are drone bees and pollen grains whereas the female propagules are queen bees and egg cells and just as the pollen grains from one apple tree fertilize the egg cells of other trees to create embryos inside seeds that will grow into new trees the drones from one honey-bee colony fertilize the queens of other colonies to create inseminated queens that will give rise to new colonies thus both trees and colonies rely on cross-fertilization to avoid the problems associated with inbreeding colonies and trees also resemble each other in how the male and female sides of reproduction differ for both bees and trees the male side of reproduction is straightforward in late spring and early summer each colony or tree produces a great number of male propagules thousands of drone bees per colony and millions of pollen grains per tree that disperse over the countryside and achieve fertilizations any one drone bee or pollen grain has a low probability of fertilizing a queen or egg but because a healthy individual colony or tree launches a huge squadron of male propagules it has a high probability of achieving reproductive success via its small male gene carriers turning to the female side of reproduction we find a more complex process in both colony and tree in each the fertilized propagule 
queen bee or egg cell is not discharged naked as happens with the male propagules but instead is packaged inside a large and intricate dispersal vehicle that will give it protection and help it along thus the egg cells of an apple tree are sent forth from the parent tree enclosed in apples whereby each egg cell is surrounded by many thousands of protective cells forming the tough seed coat and delicious fruit flesh likewise the queen bees of a honey bee colony are sent forth from the parent colony enclosed in swarms whereby each queen is surrounded by some ten thousand worker bees providing a living shelter and food supply because each swarm or apple is many thousand times larger and more costly than each drone bee or pollen grain it is no surprise that a colony or tree produces relatively few female units each year usually fewer than four swarms and at most a few hundred apples but because the costly female propagules are well protected and richly endowed they have a high probability of successfully establishing a new colony or tree so despite their smaller numbers swarms and apples match the effectiveness of drone bees and pollen grains in propagating the genes of their parents swarming in upstate new york where i live my colonies begin sending forth their drones in late april and they begin casting their swarms each one consisting of a queen accompanied by several thousand workers a week or two later in early may in essence colony reproduction starts up shortly after winter shuts down most years the swarming season begins after we've enjoyed a few weeks with warm days and profuse flowering by the maple trees acer species pluralis or spp pussy willow bushes salix discolor and skunk cabbage plants simplocarpus fetidus during this time the colonies have collected much food their queens have diligently laid eggs and their worker populations have rapidly strengthened i can predict with fair reliability when i will find my first swarm by noting when my hive of bees mounted on platform scales finally ends its six-month-long freefall in weight and begins to bulk up again on fresh nectar and pollen swarming starts early in the summer because each new colony has much to accomplish if it is to survive the following winter specifically each swarm new colony must locate a suitable nesting cavity occupy it and then build a set of beeswax combs raise new workers and store sufficient provisions to last through winter getting an early start certainly helps a colony clear these hurdles even so sadly many new colonies don't store up enough honey and so starve during their first winter in the mid nineteen seventies for three years i followed the fates of several dozen feral honey-bee colonies living in trees and houses around ithaca and i found that less than twenty five per cent of the founder colonies ones newly started by swarms would be alive the following spring in contrast almost eighty per cent of the established colonies ones already in residence for at least a year would survive winter no doubt because they hadn't had to start from scratch the previous summer beekeepers describe the time and energy crunch faced by swarms in a rather grim three-line rhyme a swarm of bees in may is worth a load of hay a swarm of bees in june is worth a silver spoon a swarm in july isn't worth a fly whether in may june or july the first step that a colony takes to prepare for swarming is the rearing of ten or more queens all daughters of the mother queen queen rearing starts with the construction of queen cups tiny inverted bowls made of beeswax they are built usually along the lower edges of the combs in which the colony is producing brood and they will form the bases of the large downward pointing peanut shaped cells in which the queens will be reared next the queen lays eggs in a dozen or more of the queen cups and workers feed the hatching larvae the royal jelly that ensures their development into queens an enduring mystery about honey-bees is what exactly stimulates a colony to begin rearing queens and thereby initiate the process of swarming 
beekeepers know that certain conditions inside a colony's hive congestion of the adult bees numerous immature bees and expanding food reserves and outside the hive plentiful forage and springtime are correlated with the start of queen rearing for swarming nevertheless to this day no one knows what specific stimuli the worker bees are sensing and integrating when they make the critical decision to start the swarming process the development of the new queens is remarkably rapid requiring only sixteen days from the time the egg is laid to the moment when an adult queen emerges from her cell while these daughter queens develop the mother queen undergoes changes that will prepare her for departure in the swarm with each passing day she is fed less and less by the workers her egg production declines and her abdomen no longer swollen with fully formed eggs shrinks dramatically furthermore the workers begin to show mild hostility toward their mother shaking pushing and lightly biting her each time a worker shakes the queen she grasps the queen with her forelegs and shakes her own body for a second or so delivering ten to twenty vigorous shakings of the queen these bouts of rough handling which eventually can become nearly continuous occurring every ten seconds or so force the queen to keep walking about the nest this increased exercise together with the reduced feeding results in a twenty five per cent reduction in the queen's body weight in this way the mother queen usually too large and heavy to fly is put into flying trim while the daughter queens are maturing and the mother queen is slimming the workers are also preparing for the impending mass departure of the mother queen and thousands of workers in a swarm to ensure that they will be well supplied with energy when they leave home the workers do just the opposite of slimming they stuff themselves with honey causing their abdomens to swell noticeably a study in which the stomachs of workers from colonies preparing to swarm were painstakingly dissected and weighed found that most bees had filled their stomachs with a drop or two thirty five to fifty five milligrams of honey thereby increasing their body weights by about fifty per cent thus when a swarm leaves on its journey to a new home approximately one-third of its weight is a food reserve the bloating of the workers is not their only conspicuous adjustment in anticipation of swarming the wax glands located on the ventral plates of four of the abdominal segments of each worker bee become hypertrophied in preparation for the intense wax secretion needed for comb building at the new nest site turning over a worker bee plucked from a colony that is poised to swarm will reveal white scales of beeswax projecting from the overlapping ventral plates but what is perhaps the most striking change in the workers just before swarming is their greater lethargy many of these laggards hang quietly on the combs while others rest in a thick cluster outside the hive entrance giving the alert beekeeper a helpful warning that swarming is imminent the biologist and comic book artist j hostler has nicely called this period of odd inactivity the calm before the swarm several dozen bees however remain active and start scouring the countryside for five or more kilometers three miles in all directions for possible nest sites these enterprising individuals are nest site scouts the central figures in this book and in chapter four we will see who they are in the summer of 2007, I learned that the nest site scouts play a key role in triggering the next main event in swarming, the swarm's explosive departure from the parental nest. My partner in this work was one of my graduate students, Juliana Rangel, who is a fine scientist, being smart, cheerful, and hard-working. We learned that the scout bees are especially well qualified to instigate the swarm's mass exodus because their special occupation causes them to spend time both outside and inside the nest, outside to hunt for potential dwelling places, and inside to refuel and rest. Only a bee that has information from both indoors and outdoors can get the timing right for the swarm's departure. 
From her time inside, a scout bee can tell when some of the developing queens have reached the pupal stage and have had their cells sealed, and from her time outside, she can tell when the weather is sunny and warm, hence favorable for a journey. When both of these requirements for swarming are fulfilled, the scouts burst into action. Starting in the cluster of bees just outside the hive entrance, the excited scouts begin scrambling among their cool, calm sisters. Every few seconds, each scout will pause by a quiet bee and briefly press her thorax against the other bee while activating her flight muscles to produce a 200 to 250 hertz cycles per second vibration that lasts for a second or so. This signal is called worker piping. It sounds, because of high-frequency harmonics, like the engine of a Formula One race car making an all-out acceleration and it informs the quiescent bees that it is time to warm their flight muscles by shivering to a flight-ready temperature of 35 degrees centigrade, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, in preparation for the swarm's departure. The piping by the scout bees is intermittent and faint at first, but over the next hour or so it gradually becomes steady and loud as more and more of the scouts blast out the message, Time to warm up! Ultimately, the piping hot scout bees sense that all their hive mates are flight ready, perhaps by consistently contacting suitably warmed bees, at which point the scouts start producing a second arousal signal, the buzz run, in which each scout bee runs about the nest in great excitement, tracing out a crooked path, buzzing her wings in bursts, and bulldozing between sluggish bees. The message now is, Time to go! and go they do. Now nearly all of the worker bees become excited and run about, crowding toward the entrance opening where they pour out in a torrent and take to the air, pushing the mother queen out as well, creating what beekeepers call the prime swarm. It contains some 10,000 bees, about two-thirds of the colony's population. These swarming bees fly round each other in a wild whirl, forming a cloud approximately 10 to 20 meters, 30 to 60 feet, across, with their queen flying somewhere in their midst. They don't go far. Soon, some of the workers settle on the branch of a tree or similar object. The queen joins them, and over the next 10 or 20 minutes, the whole cloud of bees will condense into a beard-shaped cluster. The worker bees are attracted by the scent of the queen and by the strong lemony odor of the attraction pheromones that the first settlers are releasing from their scent organs, located near the tip of the abdomen, and are dispersing by fanning their wings. Over the next several hours, or several days, most of the swarm bees will hang here quietly, while the scouts will busily search the neighborhood for candidate dwelling places and choose a suitable abode. Once the scouts have completed their democratic decision-making, they will induce the whole swarm to again take flight, and then will guide the flying swarm to its new home. Back in the parental nest, there remain a few thousand worker bees, a dozen or more queen cells, many thousand cells of worker brood, and much food. The stay-at-home workers are now without a queen, but not many days will pass before the first of the new queens emerges. During the waiting period, the parent colony's worker population will rebound as new workers emerge. Often, so many new workers appear that the colony's strength is restored by the time the first virgin queen emerges from her sealed queen cell. If the colony does regain its strength, then the workers will chase the first virgin queen away from the remaining queen cells to prevent her from destroying them. The workers will also refrain from chewing away the wax and pupal cocoon fibers on the capped ends of the queen cells to prevent the other virgin queens from getting free, and they will feed the confined queens whenever they beg for food by pushing their tongues through little slits in their cells. At the same time, the first virgin queen to emerge will announce her presence with queen piping signals called toots. A queen pipes the same way as a worker, by pressing her thorax against a substrate and activating her flight muscles. A queen, however, 
presses herself against a comb instead of against a bee, probably to give her signal a broader audience. Also, a queen's piping signals are longer than those of a worker, for they contain multiple pulses. When the first virgin queen pipes, the workers instantly cease all movement for the duration of her signal, perhaps to minimize the background noise produced by their myriad footsteps, and the virgin queens, confined in their cells, will pipe in response, producing lower-pitched quacks that are somewhat longer than the first virgin queen's toots. These quacks almost certainly inform the first virgin queen that she has lethal rivals. This bad news may encourage the first virgin queen to leave in a secondary swarm, what beekeepers call an after-swarm. Doing so means that the first virgin queen relinquishes the wealth of desirable resources in the parent nest, the beeswax combs, worker brood, and honey stores, and starts down the risky path of founding a new colony. This course of action is, however, probably less dangerous for her than staying home and attempting to kill all her deadly serious competitors. Soon, the workers will start shaking the first virgin queen to prepare her for flight, and in a few days, if good weather prevails, they will push her out of the nest during the departure of a second swarm. This process is repeated with each emerging queen until the colony is weakened to the point where it cannot support further swarming. At this point, if there are still multiple virgin queens in the nest, the workers will allow them to emerge freely. The first one out usually attempts to kill those still in their cells by dashing over the combs in search of cells containing queens, chewing small holes in their sides, and stinging the occupants. If, however, two or more virgin queens emerge together, they will fight to the death, seizing each other and attempting to sting. The battling queen bees grapple and twist, each one struggling fiercely to implant her venom-laden sting in her sister's abdomen. Ultimately, one queen succeeds, and the other, fatally stricken, collapses in paralysis, falls from the comb, and soon dies. The merciless sororicide continues until just one virgin queen remains alive. Several days later, the victor will make her mating flights, and once fully mated, start her egg-laying. Soon her daughters and sons will populate the coveted parental nest. Any virgin queen who departed in an after-swarm will likewise make mating flights once she and her workers have moved into their new home, for no queen ever mates inside a nest. 3. Dream Home for Honeybees If I can with confidence say that still for another day, or even another year, I will be there for you, my dear, it will be because, though small, as measured against the all, I have been so instinctively thorough about my crevice and burrow. Robert Frost, A Drumlin Woodchuck, 1936 Like Robert Frost's woodchuck, a honeybee colony is instinctively thorough about its dwelling place, for only certain tree cavities provide good protection from predators and sufficient refuge from harsh physical conditions, especially strong winds and deep cold. No fewer than six distinct properties of a potential home site including cavity volume, entrance height, entrance size, and presence of combs from an earlier colony, are assessed to produce an overall judgment of a site's quality. The care with which honeybees choose their homes has been known for only about thirty years, which might seem surprising given that humans have been culturing these bees since ancient times. The reason that humans have only recently learned about the bee's real estate preferences is that the essence of beekeeping is the tending of colonies living in hives fashioned by a beekeeper and sited where the beekeeper wants them. The earliest solid evidence of beekeeping comes from Egypt around 2400 BC and consists of a stone bas-relief in a temple that depicts peasants removing honeycombs from a stack of cylindrical clay hives and also packing the honey in pots. Thus, for some 4,400 years the people living in closest association with honeybees 
have focused on devising housing arrangements for bees that serve human purposes and have largely ignored what the bees themselves seek in a home. For example, man-made hives are usually much more spacious than natural nest cavities, so bees living in an apiary will store more honey and swarm less often than will bees living in nature. Likewise, a beekeeper's hives are located at ground level, which is convenient for humans, but dangerous for bees. Honeybee colonies living low to the ground are easily found and attacked by destructive predators, such as bears. Nests of Wild Colonies In 1975, when I began to study the democratic house-hunting process of honeybees for my Ph.D. thesis project, I decided that a logical first step was to try to identify what makes a dream home site for a honeybee colony. This would tell me what a swarm is seeking as it locates multiple candidate sites and works to select the best one. I suspected that to identify the perfect dwelling place for a honeybee colony would be a challenge because the bees might evaluate several attributes of each candidate site and they might weigh each attribute differently when judging the overall goodness of a site. Nevertheless, I figured that if I could identify what attributes are important to the bees, and if I could determine what preference they have for each attribute, then I would be close to achieving my goal. I also figured that to determine the bees' real estate preferences, I should start by finding trees housing wild colonies of honeybees, sawing them down, and splitting open the tree sections housing the bees' nests so that I could scrutinize their natural living quarters. Each colony living in nature occupies a site chosen by scout bees, so it seemed reasonable to expect that consistencies in the nest sites of these wild colonies would yield clues about the bees' nest site preferences. And there could be little doubt that these preferences lie at the heart of the bees' whole house-hunting process, for it is these preferences that guide swarms to take up residence in suitable nesting cavities. Back in 1955, Lindauer had reported experiments conducted in the open countryside east of Munich in which he presented one swarm at a time with a pair of nest boxes that differed in some property, and then he observed which one attracted the greatest interest from the swarm's scout bees. These experiments yielded only preliminary findings because Lindauer could perform just a few trials for each test of a particular nest site property. Nevertheless, they suggested to him that his bees had chosen among his nest boxes based on differences in protection from the wind, cavity size, presence of ants, and sun exposure. Lindauer was impressed by the bees' apparent attention to multiple properties of a possible residence when assessing its desirability, wondered what the ideal bee dwelling might be, and suggested that to solve this mystery, it would be best to ask the bees themselves about this matter. I would start to do so by examining their nests. The prospect of carefully describing the nests of wild honeybee colonies living in the woods attracted me for emotional as well as rational reasons. While an undergraduate student, I had majored in chemistry and done several small research projects in organic chemistry, biochemistry, and biophysics. Of course, these investigations were all conducted indoors in clean, brightly illuminated, and nearly lifeless laboratories. But now, as a beginning graduate student in biology and novice investigator of animal behavior, I was keen to work outdoors using what has been called the von Frisch-Lindauer approach to animal behavior research. In their autobiographical book, Journey to the Ants, Bert Holdobler and Edward O. Wilson explain that von Frisch and Lindauer had a philosophy of research based on a thorough loving interest in a feel for the organism, especially as it fits into the natural environment. Learn the species of your choice every way you can, this whole organismic approach stipulates. Try to understand, or at the very least try to imagine, how its behavior and physiology adapt it to the real world. Then select a piece of behavior that can be separated and analyzed as though it were a bit of anatomy. Having identified a phenomenon to call your own, press the investigation in the most promising direction.
my thesis adviser bert holdobler had presented this way of studying behavior in his ethology course at harvard and more importantly had demonstrated its power by his own spectacularly beautiful studies of ant social behavior so by the end of my first year in graduate school i was raring to go i wanted to gain a feel for honeybees living in nature to further analyze the house-hunting piece of their behavior and to see if i could press the investigation on from where martin lindauer had left it some twenty years before i knew that i would abscond from harvard the moment i had finished taking my final exams for the spring semester and i had my mind set on returning to the dice laboratory for honeybee studies at cornell where i had worked for the previous four summers when an undergraduate student the director of the lab professor roger a morse was truly a generous man he welcomed me back assigned me a desk and provided several essential tools for the project a powerful chainsaw steel wedges and maul and one of the lab's green pickup trucks most importantly doc morse arranged for me to team up with a member of the entomology department's technical staff herb nelson who had worked as a logger in the maine woods when a teenager and could teach me how to cut down big trees without getting killed herb and i started with some of the bee trees i had discovered back in high school while exploring the woods around my family's home these were augmented with ones that i located through a watt ad i placed in the local newspaper the ithaca journal the ad read bee trees wanted We'll pay fifteen dollars or fifteen pounds of honey for a tree housing a live colony of honeybees. 607-254-5443. I feared I'd get no calls, but within a week I had secured the rights to eighteen accessible bee trees in the woods around Ithaca. Two owners took payment in money. All the rest wanted honey. The procedure for collecting these nests was simple but somewhat dangerous. Shortly before sunrise, when all bees were still at home, I would hike to a bee tree with a can of calcium cyanide powder, cyanogaz, an old spoon, and some rags. If the nest entrance was high in a tree that I couldn't climb, I'd also bring an aluminum extension ladder. My aim was to spoon cyanide powder into the nest entrance and then quickly plug it with the rags. The cyanide powder would react with moisture in the air, producing cyanide gas that would kill the bees, but if all went according to plan, not me. Once I did drop the can of cyanogas from the ladder, spilling much of its contents, but I managed to hold my breath long enough to climb down, get the lid back on the can, and dash out of the expanding cloud of deadly gas. By first killing the bees, we could later fell the tree and collect the nest without being ferociously attacked. This protocol also enabled me to census the bee population of each wild colony when I dissected its nest. Having killed the bees, I'd return to Dice Lab to pick up Herb and load the truck with the tools we'd need for the day. Chainsaw, wedges and maul, rope, ramp boards, tape measure, magnetic compass, 35mm camera, and notebook. Our goal was to cut down the bee tree I had just visited, saw out the trunk section housing the nest, wrestle it onto the truck, and haul it back to the lab. I recall being impressed by Herb's confidence in driving the truck deep into the woods to get near each bee tree. We'll have plenty of traction for getting back out once we get that big log loaded on and by his careful inspection of each tree's lean and crown before starting his cutting. you got to know which way the tree wants to fall. Herb's lumberjack skills weren't rusty, and each tree arced down neatly into the woods opening he had chosen. Once we had a tree lying on the ground, we proceeded to cut out the section containing the nest. We did this by making a series of crosscuts, starting far above and far below the nest entrance, and then working our way closer and closer to the entrance until the chainsaw started spitting dark brown punk wood or yellow brown beeswax indicating we had breached the nest cavity we then rolled the nest containing log sometimes a massive two meter long six foot and nearly one meter thick three foot section of the tree's bowl up into the truck got it back to the lab and split it open 
Finally, we would lug the opened nest indoors where I could dissect it carefully under good light while measuring important features of the nest cavity and its contents. To measure the volume of the cavity, I filled it with liter after liter of sand after removing the combs. As I picked through the broken combs and dead bees, sooner or later coming across the lifeless queen, I felt sad to have killed a whole colony, but also excited, knowing that I was the first human to describe in detail the natural homes of honeybees. Over the summer of 1975, we collected and I dissected 21 bee tree nests, enough to give us a broad picture of the nests of wild colonies living in the woods. I also located another 18 nests in trees that were left standing and so yielded information only about their entrance openings. Since the nest entrance is the front door of a colony's home, it is probably especially important to the bees, so I gave it extra attention. We found that the bees occupied many kinds of trees, including oaks, Quercus spp, walnuts, juglans spp, elms, ulmus spp, pines, pinus spp, hickories, caria spp, ashes, Fraxinus spp, and maples, acer spp. This suggested that the bees don't have a strong preference for certain tree species. Not surprisingly, the tree cavities occupied by the bees were generally tall and cylindrical, consistent with the shape of tree trunks. But what was surprising was the discovery that most of these wild colonies were occupying tree cavities much smaller than the hives provided by beekeepers. The average nest cavity was only about 20 centimeters, 8 inches, in diameter, and 150 centimeters, 60 inches, tall. Hence, it had a volume of only about 45 liters, 41 quarts. A tree cavity of this size provides only one quarter to one half of the living space provided by a beekeeper's hive. Were the bees telling me that they prefer relatively small and snug nest sites, ones in which it might be easier to keep warm in winter? Some of the colonies even occupied tree cavities with only 20 to 30 liters of nesting space, though none was found in a space smaller than 12 liters. Was this lower limit of about 12 liters a sign that bees carefully avoid excessively cramped quarters, ones lacking sufficient room for storing the honey needed to survive winter? Certainly the bees living in these tree cavities were making good use of their living space, for each colony had nearly filled its nest cavity with multiple combs. Because each comb formed a wall-to-wall -wall curtain spanning the generally narrow tree cavity, I was impressed by the way the bees had built small passageways in the combs where they were attached to the cavity's wall, so they could crawl easily from one comb to the next. And it was clear that these bees had organized their use of their combs in the way familiar to all beekeepers, storing honey in the upper region of the nest and rearing brood below. The nests collected in August, by the way, revealed that most colonies had been making good progress in stockpiling their winter heating fuel. The nests that I dissected contained, on average, 14 kilograms, 30 pounds, of golden honey. Regrettably, it was all laced with cyanide. The entrance openings of the bees' nests also showed consistencies that suggested possible nest site preferences by the bees. Most nest entrances consisted of a single knot hole or crack with a total area of just 10 to 30 square centimeters, 2 to 5 square inches. And typically they were located near the floor of the tall tree cavity on the south side of the tree and close to ground level. The trends towards small size, floor level, and southern orientation all made good sense to me, for they would make the nest cavity inaccessible to most predators, relatively free of drafts, and perhaps warmed by the sun, all things that would be good for a colony. But the preponderance of nest entrances just a few feet from the ground puzzled me greatly. I figured that a low nest entrance must render a colony vulnerable to detection by predators such as bears, whose attacks can be fatal. And I knew that in medieval times in the forests of northern Europe, Germany, Poland, and Russia, one of the ancestral homes of the honeybees imported in North America 
raids by bears on honeybee nests in trees were such a great trouble for the forest beekeepers who owned these nests that they invented horrific devices to kill honey-loving bears one was a hinged platform mounted outside a bee nest when a bear climbed onto it to attack the bees it would collapse causing the bear to tumble onto a grid of deadly sharp stakes below so at first i was perplexed by the rarity of nests high in trees but as will be explained shortly we now know that bees actually have a strong preference for nesting cavities with entrances located high above the ground i also now know that my initial report of most nests being near ground level was an error generated by an unintentional bias in the way i had sampled the population of natural nests because the nests i studied were ones that had been noticed inadvertently by a person walking past a bee tree and because people are much more likely to notice bees trafficking from a ground level nest entrance than a treetop one i unwittingly studied nests whose entrances were far lower than is typical i am confident on this point because several years later when i became a bee hunter and mastered the ancient craft of lining bees locating bee trees by baiting foragers from flowers and observing their flights back to their nests i found that every hunt ended with me straining to spy the bees zipping in and out of a nest entrance high in a tree to date i have located twenty-seven bee trees by bee lining and i can report that the average height of their nest entrances is six point five meters twenty one feet needless to say i'm now alert to the hidden danger of unintentional sampling bias location 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 even though the descriptive study of the natural homes of honeybees was destructive it remains one of my favorite studies for it put me in touch with honeybees living in nature and it helped me gain some self-confidence as a researcher it also guided me throughout the next step of my investigation of how honeybee swarms choose a home testing whether the nest site patterns we had found in cavity volume entrance area entrance height and so forth were a result of preferences of scout bees or were simply a consequence of the tree cavities that were available the idea for the design of the test came from what i had read about beekeeping in east africa and south africa in these regions beekeepers acquire bees by hanging hives usually hollowed logs with the ends stoppered except for an entrance hole in trees and waiting for swarms to occupy them i had not heard or read of anybody in north america catching swarms with bait hives but i reasoned that if one could do so then i could ask the bees about their nest site preferences by putting up groups of two or three nest boxes with the boxes in each group identical except for one property such as cavity volume or the height of the entrance above the ground i hoped that scouts from wild swarms would discover the groups of nest boxes and would reveal their real estate preferences by choosing among the boxes in a group and consistently occupying those with certain attributes almost always one starts an experimental study with a small-scale low-cost pilot study to figure out what methods are apt to work before undertaking a costly full-scale investigation in the summer of 1975 i did a pilot study to see if wild swarms would occupy bait hives often enough to give my experimental plan a reasonable chance of success using some scrap plywood scrounged from dice lab i built six nest boxes each one a simple cubic box 35 centimeters 14 inches wide tall and deep and bearing a 4.5 centimeter 1.75 inch diameter entrance hole on the front side i designed these boxes to mimic the nest cavities i was finding in bee trees my bee houses looked like bird houses on steroids except that each one had chicken wire nailed over its entrance opening to keep birds out while letting bees in i took each nest box to a place i knew that i'd enjoy visiting in my home territory of ellis hollow and nailed it about five meters fifteen feet off the ground onto the side of a large tree i still remember vividly the thrill i felt a few weeks later in late june when i checked the nest box that i'd mounted on a dead elm tree along cascadilla creek and saw dozens of leather-colored honeybees bustling in and out of its entrance 
A swarm had moved in. Yippee! When swarms occupied two or more of my nest boxes over the next few weeks, I was even more excited. This pilot study had been simple, but it had yielded the triumph of knowing that my experimental plan was likely to work. My plan for the next summer was now clear. I had to set out dozens and dozens of nest boxes of various designs to ask the bees about this matter of their ideal dwelling place. The plan worked well. Each summer in 1976 and 1977, I set up more than 200 green nest boxes in groups of two or three across Tompkins County, and each summer over half of my nest box groups attracted at least one wild swarm. The boxes within each group were spaced about 10 meters, 33 feet, apart on similar-sized trees, or even better yet, on power line poles where they were perfectly matched in visibility, wind exposure, and the like. Each group of boxes was designed to test one nest site preference, and it did so by giving swarms a choice between one box, whose properties all matched those of a typical nest site in nature, for example, average entrance area, average cavity volume, etc., and one or two other boxes identical to the first, except in one property, the value of which was atypical. In this way, wild swarms were tested for a preference in the one variable that differed between the boxes. For example, to test for a preference in entrance size, I set up pairs of cubicle nest boxes that were identical except that one had a typical entrance area of 12.5 square centimeters, 2.5 square inches, and the other had a larger than usual entrance of 75 square centimeters, 15 square inches. Similarly, to test for a preference in cavity size, I set up trios of cubicle nest boxes that were identical except that one box had the typical cavity volume of 40 liters, while the other two boxes had volumes at the two tails of the distribution of nest cavity volumes, 10 and 100 liters. To build the many nest boxes needed for this study, I spent most of my Christmas break in 1975 sawing and hammering and painting in the woodshop at Dye Slab. There I constructed 252 nest boxes and used up enough plywood, more than 70 sheets, for building a small house. With these hundreds of nest boxes I would eventually capture 124 swarms in 1976 and 1977. The swarms demonstrated preferences in the following nest site variables, entrance size, entrance direction, entrance height above the ground, entrance height above the cavity floor, cavity volume, and presence of combs in the cavity. The bees had revealed to me that they prefer a nest entrance that is rather small, faces south, is high off the ground, and opens into the bottom of the nest cavity. These four preferences regarding the entrance opening no doubt help a honeybee colony survive against threats of cold winters and dangerous predators. A small entrance is easily defended and helps isolate the nest from the outside environment. An entrance high up in a tree is less apt to be discovered by predators than one near the ground, and is certainly inaccessible to predators that cannot fly or climb trees. An entrance at the bottom of the nest cavity rather than at the top may help to minimize the loss of heat from the colony by convection currents and an entrance that faces south provides a warm, solar-heated porch from which foragers can take off and on which they can land. Beekeepers, incidentally, face their hives to the south to help their bees fly out in cool weather. This southern orientation is particularly important in the winter months when bees go outside on sunny days to make their critical cleansing flights, that is, to defecate. A Canadian bee researcher based in Alberta, Tibor Sabo, compared colonies living in south-facing and north-facing hives. He found that those in south-facing hives were less apt to suffer a hive entrance plugged by ice in winter and were more populous in spring. The pattern of nest box occupations by swarms also showed clearly that the bees avoid cavities smaller than 10 liters or greater than 100 liters, and that they very much like 40-liter cavities, about the size of a wastebasket, especially ones already equipped with combs. 
Probably the main problem the bees face regarding cavity volume is avoiding undersized cavities since most tree cavities are too small, less than about 15 liters, to hold the store of honey a colony needs to survive winter. The evidence supporting this assertion comes from a small study I did with one of my brothers, Daniel H. Seeley, who owns a whole hillside in Vermont that was logged in the 1800s, but is now forested with stately sugar maple, Acer saccharum, and beech, Fagus grandifolia, trees. In October 1976, Dan and I packed up logging tools and drove north from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Roxbury, Vermont, to spend several days of Indian summer finding out what size cavities scout bees are apt to encounter when prospecting for home sites. Working over a 0.32 hectare, 0.8 acre area, we felled every tree more than 30 centimeters, 12 inches in diameter, and we sawed each felled tree into 120 centimeter, 4 foot lengths, to expose any cavities they contained. We dissected 39 trees and found 14 cavities with an opening to the outside that could provide access to a scout bee. Of these 14 tree hollows, only two, 14 percent, were larger than 15 liters. They were 32 and 39 liters. The preference for a site filled with combs, built by a preceding colony that did not survive winter, doubtless reflects the tremendous energy savings that a colony enjoys if it occupies a site already furnished with a full set of combs. The energy thus saved turns out to be a large fraction of the honey store that a fledgling colony needs to survive its first winter. This is shown by the following calculations. A typical nest in a bee tree contains some 100,000 cells arranged in eight or so combs whose total surface area is about two and a half square meters, three square yards. Building this impressive edifice requires about 1,200 grams, 2.5 pounds, of beeswax. Given that the weight-to-weight -weight efficiency of beeswax synthesis from sugar is at most about 0.20, we can estimate that building the combs in a typical nest requires about 6.0 kilograms of sugar, hence about 7.5 kilograms, 16 pounds, of honey. This mass of honey is about one-third of what a colony will consume over winter. Storing these 7.5 kilograms of honey in the colony's food supply for winter rather than spending it on comb building will greatly boost a colony's odds of surviving its first winter. Recall that I found that 76% of the colonies newly established in tree cavities around Ithaca die during their first winter, and that nearly all of the colonies that do so succumb to starvation. The nest site properties for which I detected no preference were entrance shape, cavity shape, cavity draftiness, and cavity dryness. Honeybees probably prefer tight and dry nest cavities, but because a colony can caulk with tree resins any cracks and crevices that let in drafts and water, the nest site scouts apparently do not pay much heed to these properties. In contrast, a colony cannot modify the volume of a nest cavity, the height of its entrance, or the direction in which it faces, so to get a home site that meets its needs in these properties, the nest site scouts must pay close attention to these properties when evaluating prospective nest sites. The ability of a honeybee colony to remedy a drafty or damp site was neatly demonstrated by the swarm bees that occupied my experimental nest boxes. I had rendered some of the boxes drafty by riddling their fronts and sides with six millimeter quarter inch diameter holes spaced 7.5 centimeters three inches apart. Other boxes I had made damp by dumping two liters, two quarts, of waterlogged sawdust onto the floor of each box. Every swarm that moved into one of the drafty boxes soon made it draft-free by plugging with tree resins all the holes that I had drilled. Likewise, every swarm that occupied one of the damp boxes quickly rendered it dry by hauling out all the soggy sawdust that I had dumped inside. I was greatly impressed by the bees' tidiness. Free Bees One thing that makes studying honeybees so enjoyable is the way that what is learned through curiosity-driven research often turns out, unexpectedly, to have real practical value. 
My best example of this phenomenon is the way that knowing something about the defecation habits of Asian honeybees helped diffuse tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union back in the 1980s. This story starts in the late 1970s, when I had finished graduate school, and was keen to travel overseas and learn about the marvelous species of honeybees that live in the Asian tropics. The Asian hive honeybee, Apis serana, the dwarf honeybee, Apis floria, and the giant honeybee, Apis dorsata. With support from the National Geographic Society, my wife Robin and I undertook a ten-month study of the colony defense strategies of the three Asian honeybee species living in Thailand. We set up camp in the pristine mountain forests of the vast Khao Yai National Park in northeast Thailand, where one can still enjoy the sight of hornbills winging their way between towering dipterocarp trees, the eerie smell of Asian tiger urine deposited along a trail, the whooping calls of white-faced gibbons shortly after sunrise, and the mysterious biology of the Asian honeybees. Gradually, we assembled a picture of each honeybee species' fascinatingly complex array of colony defenses against such enemies as giant hornets, weaver ants, honey buzzards, tree shrews, rhesus monkeys, and honey bears. This was field biology done for biology's sake, and it was a wonderful adventure for two newlyweds. Sometimes I wonder, though, if even half a dozen biologists worldwide have read closely the beautifully detailed 21-page report on the Asian honeybees that we published in the scientific journal Ecological Monographs. A few years later, however, and to my amazement, the knowledge that we'd gained about the Asian honeybees proved important to a large international audience. In 1981, the Secretary of State in the Reagan administration, Alexander M. Haig, alleged that the Soviet Union was waging or abetting chemical warfare against opponents of the communist governments in two countries bordering Thailand, Laos and Kampuchea. If true, this was a violation of two international arms control treaties, the 1925 Geneva Protocol and the 1972 Biological Weapons Convention. The main evidence cited by Haig was a material called yellow rain, that is, yellow spots less than six millimeters, one quarter inch in diameter, that were found on vegetation at alleged attack sites and that supposedly contained fungal toxins. I realized, however, that the yellow spots that U.S. officials called yellow rain were indistinguishable from the yellow spots I called honeybee feces. They were identical in size, shape, and color. Further work revealed that both contained bee hairs and were laden with pollen grains from which the protein had been digested. Eventually, I was able to help Matthew Messelson, a professor of molecular genetics at Harvard and an expert on chemical and biological weapons, show conclusively that yellow rain was indeed honeybee feces, not chemical warfare. One wag said we had uncovered the work of KGBs. Shortly after yellow rain was proven to be bee poop in 1984, officials of the U.S. State Department, without fanfare, ceased accusing the Soviets of violating the two arms control treaties on chemical and biological weapons. The yellow rain story is a striking example of how research rooted in sheer curiosity can unexpectedly yield useful knowledge. But it is not so unusual, for real-world benefits often bubble up from basic research. My first taste of pursuing personal curiosity and getting an unexpected bonus of practical results came from my study with Doc Morse of the nest site preferences of swarms. In the summer of 1976, we had groups of nest boxes set up in more than a hundred sites around Tompkins County, and we caught more than sixty swarms. Given our high success rate in trapping swarms, Doc realized that we should translate our findings about the bees' nest site preferences into recommendations for beekeepers on how to build and position bait hives to catch wild swarms of honeybees. We prepared a simple design, along with a set of guidelines for situating bait hives, 
A good location is about 5 meters, 15 feet off the ground, highly visible but fully shaded and facing south, and published these in the beekeeping magazine Gleanings in Bee Culture and as a Cornell Cooperative Extension Bulletin. Beekeepers responded enthusiastically. Before this, beekeepers wanting to capture wild swarms had to rely on being notified when a swarm had settled somewhere. Then they had to hurry to put it in a hive before the bees finished selecting a nest site and flew away to their chosen home. With bait hives, beekeepers can collect swarms automatically. In recent years, other bee scientists have designed cheaper, lighter, and tougher bait hives made of reinforced wood pulp material and have devised scent lures that slowly leak a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one blend of chemicals citral, geraniol, narolic, and geranic acids from a small polyethylene vial. These scent lures mimic the attraction pheromones that scout bees release from their scent organs to mark a desirable home site, discussed further in Chapter 8. Experiments by Justin Schmidt at the USDA Bee Research Center in Tucson, Arizona, have shown that a bait hive with a scent lure can be five times more likely to attract a swarm than one without a lure, probably because the artificial attraction pheromones make a bait hive much more likely to be discovered by a scout bee, but perhaps also by making it more attractive. Wood pulp bait hives, sometimes called swarm traps, and swarm scent lures are now produced commercially and are sold by the companies that sell beekeeping equipment. Each summer, I put up a half dozen bait hives, partly because I can always use a few additional colonies of bees, but mostly because I like getting free bees. Property Assessments Probably every homeowner has wondered how his or her local tax assessor combines information about the size of a house lot, the floor area of the house on the lot, the number of bedrooms and bathrooms in the house, and so forth, to determine the assessed value of a particular property. I began wondering the same thing about scout bees in August 1974 as I watched several scouts scrutinizing a candidate dwelling place. This happened in the summer before I went off to start graduate school at Harvard. I was working happily for Doc Morris at Cornell's Dice Laboratory, but I was a little worried about my choice of problem for a doctoral thesis, deepening Martin Lindauer's work on how a swarm chooses its home. In twenty years, nobody had tackled, much less solved, the many mysteries raised by Lindauer's study. Clearly, there was a first-rate opportunity here, but could I succeed in making something of it? To begin to see what I might do, I decided simply to watch, with my eyes wide open, a swarm go through its democratic decision-making process. In working for Doc, I had learned how to make an artificial swarm, by shaking a colony, queen and workers, into a cage to render them homeless, and then feeding them lavishly with sugar syrup to get them stuffed with food like natural swarm bees. So I prepared a swarm and set it up behind my parents' house in Ellis Hollow. I also nailed a nest box that I built from scrap plywood to a white pine tree about 150 meters, 500 feet, away, hoping the swarm's scouts would discover it and select it for their new home site. I mounted the box at eye level so I could observe easily any scout bees that might visit it. The weekend that I watched this swarm turned out to be a milestone in my life. The swarm's scouts quickly began advertising several prospective home sites with their dances, and before long one bee was dancing with eye-catching enthusiasm for a location nearby and to the north, my nest box. This bee's lively dance soon gave rise to a small crowd of bees at the box. Back at the swarm, I adorned a few of the bees dancing for my box with dots of paint on the thorax and abdomen, giving different bees different color combinations. This simple trick transformed these individuals from mere members of Apis mellifera into personal acquaintances whose affairs became of the greatest interest to me. At the swarm, I saw how a scout would perform a bout of vigorous dancing, contact another bee with agile antennal movements to beg a droplet of honey, perhaps groom off a pesky fleck of paint, and then fly away for twenty to thirty minutes. When she returned, she might dance again, but she might also just settle quietly within the swarm cluster. 
At the nest box, I saw how my labeled bees would land and agitatedly run into the entrance opening and then scurry back out a minute or so later, whereupon they would either crawl briefly around the entrance and then pop back inside, or conduct a slow hovering flight around the box, usually facing it and maneuvering within inches of the box, apparently giving the nest structure a detailed visual inspection. Never before had I seen a honeybee behave with such persistent intention to gather information. I was thoroughly intrigued. Also, my worries about choice of thesis topic had largely vanished, for I felt confident that I could explore how a scout bee inspects a site. I began to study closely the inspection behavior of nest site scouts the following summer in June 1975. To do so, I had to leave the forested countryside around Ithaca, where since early May I had been busy finding bee trees and describing natural nests, and shift to a location largely devoid of natural homes for honeybees, Appledore Island. This rocky, wind-blown island is barely 900 meters, half a mile long, and lies 10 kilometers, six miles, out in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of southern Maine. It is the site of the Shoals Marine Laboratory of Cornell University and the University of New Hampshire. I was attracted to Appledore because it has no resident honeybees and it has no large trees. Instead, it is inhabited by approximately 1,000 breeding pairs of herring gulls, Larus argentatus, and great black-backed gulls, Larus marinus and it is covered by thickets of poison ivy plants rising three meters ten feet tall together with tangles of blackberry brambles and wind-battered cherry bushes all richly fertilized by the gulls i figured that if i took a honey-bee swarm out to this scrubby island the bees would have to concentrate their house hunting on the artificial nesting sites that i would provide if so then I could observe their behavior under controlled conditions and learn how they assess a possible dwelling place. My first goal on Appledore Island was to make a detailed description of the behavior of scout bees inspecting nest sites. I hoped these observations would suggest how scouts evaluate the critical nest site properties. It was particularly important to be able to watch scouts inside a prospective home site in order to understand how they might measure such things as the cavity's volume and the entrance's height from the cavity floor. To this end, I built a light-proof hut with a cube-shaped nest box mounted on one of its walls. The box was positioned outside a window covered with a red filter, bees cannot see red light, so that I could peer inside the box without disturbing the scouts. The inner surfaces of the box bore a grid coordinate system that enabled me to record where a scout bee went while she was in the cavity. After setting up the hut in a valley on one side of the island, I positioned a small swarm, about 2,000 bees, at the center of the island. The bees had been given dots of paint using a color code that made them individually identifiable. Then I retired to the hut to wait for scout bees. The first time I tried this I waited all morning at the hut without being visited by a scout bee, which surprised and dismayed me. When I returned to the swarm around midday my spirits sank further, for I saw several scouts performing long-lasting dances indicating a location directly away from my hut. Rats! What possibly could the bees have found? I made careful measurements of the direction and distance to the location specified by the bees' dances and plotted the site on my topographical map. Now my spirits sank even deeper, for the bees' dances were indicating unmistakably one of the two lobster fishermen's cottages on the south shore of the island, specifically Rodney Sullivan's cottage. When I had arrived on Appledore a few days before and had been getting oriented to my new surroundings, I had been told to keep well away from the fisherman's private properties, especially Rodney's place, for he valued his privacy and kept a loaded shotgun behind his front door. What should I do? I sought advice from the laboratory's director, Professor John M. Kingsbury, and he kindly went with me over to Rodney's cottage to introduce student Seeley to Fisherman Sullivan. We went by boat 
so Rodney would be able to see us coming, approaching from the front, the water, even while my bees were attacking from the rear, the land. He heard our boat approach, came out on his porch, and told us to come ashore. After we climbed up the rocks to his house, he told us he had an emergency. Hundreds of bees were buzzing in the stovepipe to his wood stove. Never seen this before. Could they have been blown out here during the recent storm? I didn't answer the question, but I did offer to help. While Rodney made a fire in the stove to smoke out the bees, I climbed his steep roof, slippery with splotches of fresh gull poop, and taped window screen over his chimney flue to exclude bees in the future. Rodney was delighted. I was relieved. No longer distracted by Rodney's house, the scouts from my swarm soon started to appear at my observation nest box and began to perform their striking inspection behavior. I saw that a scout bee needs thirteen to fifty-six minutes, average thirty-seven minutes, to inspect a prospective nest site. Her complete inspection is a summation of ten to thirty journeys inside the cavity, each one lasting usually less than a minute and alternating with equally brief periods outside, during which the bee examines the exterior of the nest structure. I call this first inspection, when a scout is popping in and out of the cavity, the discovery inspection. Following the discovery inspection, a scout returns to the swarm, and if the site is desirable, she will advertise it with a waggle dance, and usually will then make repeated visits to the site at approximately half-hour intervals. But these subsequent site visits tend to last only ten to twenty minutes, average thirteen minutes, and don't involve so much in-and-out activity. When a scout is inside a cavity conducting her discovery inspection, she devotes most of her time, about seventy-five per cent, to rapid walking across the inner surfaces. This quick pacing about is interspersed with pauses to rest, groom, and release attraction pheromones from the scent organ, and with short hopping flights. The inside of a dark cavity seems an odd place to attempt to fly about, yet the bees make these little flights that last less than a second and that move a bee from one point to another on the walls, floor, or ceiling of the cavity. A geometric pattern in the movements of scout bees is that early in the discovery inspection a scout walks primarily near the entrance during her journeys inside, whereas later she penetrates to the deepest recesses of the cavity. Three-dimensional reconstructions of the walking paths of individual scouts reveal that, when the inspection is finished, a scout has walked sixty meters, two hundred feet or more, around the inside of the cavity, and has covered all its inner surfaces. I spent four weeks on Appledore Island in 1975, departing without solving the mystery of how scout bees evaluate candidate nest sites. Nevertheless, I felt I'd made a satisfactory progress. I had learned how to work with swarms on this offshore island, where stiff winds and persistent fog sometimes hampered my bee work, but also where the salty air, waves breaking over the rocky shores, and screaming gulls were always invigorating. And I had discovered how a scout bee behaves when inspecting a prospective home site. Knowing this behavior would prove invaluable in planning future experimental work on Appledore. When I returned to the island in July 1976, I focused on the puzzle of how scout bees can measure the size of potential nest cavities, which are immense compared to the size of a bee. Cavity volume is the nest site property that is perhaps most critical to a colony's long-term survival, since any colony occupying a hollow ten liters or smaller cannot store sufficient honey to get through winter. So I suspected the bees have evolved a way to measure cavity volume accurately. How do scout bees measure the volume of a cavity? Their extensive walking in the course of an initial inspection could provide the basis for an estimate, but another hypothesis was that they simply go inside and look around. I first performed experiments with nest boxes in which I could vary the interior light level by changing the amount of light coming in through the entrance hole and the traversable surface area by coating the inner surfaces with fluon, a Teflon type of material that creates a waxy surface that bees cannot walk up. 
I found that in order to measure a cavity's volume, scout bees need either interior illumination greater than 0.5 lux, about the illumination provided by a full moon, or inner surfaces that can be traversed freely. What are the conditions inside a typical tree cavity? Certainly the wood walls inside a cavity are easily traversed by a scout bee. To measure the light level in cavities of the sort inspected by scout bees, I built a model based on the measurements I had made of natural nests. It had a series of openings into which I inserted a light meter. I found the illumination to be less than 0.5 lux except near the entrance opening where some sunlight streams in. Evidently, in nature, scout bees rely primarily on walking about in a prospective nest site to measure its volume. To test this hypothesis more directly, I tried altering a scout's perception of a cavity's volume by manipulating the amount of walking required to move from point to point inside a cavity. To do so, I invented a bee treadmill, a cylindrical nest box mounted vertically on a turntable that enabled me to rotate the box smoothly while a scout bee was inside. By means of a window at the top, I could look inside and see which way the bee was walking. Then I could turn the walls according to whether I wanted to increase or decrease the amount of walking required for her to complete a horizontal circuit. So, if a scout came in through the entrance, and I rotated the walls in the direction she walked, she was carried along and quickly found herself back near the entrance. But if I turned the walls against her, she would need to walk much longer to make her way back around to the entrance opening. The entire device was mounted in my light-proof hut with a short tunnel connecting the entrance in the nest box to an opening in the hut's wall. The only light entering the nest box came in through its entrance, and it is likely that this bright spot provided each scout bee inside the box with a visual reference point, both for finding her way out of the box and for monitoring her progress in circumnavigating it. The volume of this experimental box was 14 liters, on the boundary between an unacceptably small cavity and a suitably large one. If walking contributes to the perception of volume, then the first scout to discover the box should find it either more or less attractive than its true volume would merit, according to whether she had been made to walk more or less than she would in a normal 14-liter cavity. The assay of her evaluation of the box was the number of other scouts she recruited to visit the box. She should recruit more scouts if she found the box suitably large than she would if the box had seemed unacceptably small. That is precisely what I observed in four trials of this experiment. Seven or nine recruits in ninety minutes when the bee walked lots, but only zero or one recruit in ninety minutes when the bee walked little. Evidently, only the bees that had taken long walks judged the box sufficiently roomy and recommended it to their fellow scouts with enthusiasm. It seems clear, therefore, that a scout's estimate of the volume of a cavity is proportional to the amount of walking she must do to circumnavigate it. Every step is a measurement. Nigel R. Franks and Anna Dornhaus, biologists at the University of Bristol in England and the University of Arizona in the United States, have recently suggested a simple method by which a scout bee might judge a cavity's roominess using the information gained from the walking and flying movements that she makes inside the cavity. They point out that physicists have long known that for any open space, the mean free path length, MFPL, of wall-to-wall -wall lines drawn in all directions across the space, is equal to four times the volume, V, of the space divided by its internal surface area. A. MFPL equals 4V divided by A. Thus, volume is proportional to mean free path length multiplied by internal surface area. V equals the quantity MFPL times A divided by 4. It is possible that the extensive walks made by scout bees are a means of estimating a cavity's internal surface area. It is also possible that the short hopping flights made by scout bees, which I had reported but had not linked to the volume estimation process, are a means of seeing how far they can fly before hitting a wall, that is, 
a means of estimating the mean free path length. If both possibilities prove correct, then it may be that all a scout bee needs to do to be certain that a cavity is sufficiently spacious is to ascertain that the cavity provides a suitable combination of internal surface area and mean free path length. Certainly, the results of my experiment with the rotating wall nest box are consistent with this hypothesis. Forcing a bee to walk farther to return to the entrance, thereby increasing the bee's estimate of internal surface area, resulted in a larger estimate of the box's volume. Franks and Dornhaus have proposed an ingenious experimental test of their idea, one that involves hanging a rigid curtain across much of the interior of a nest box and coating the curtain with fluon so that scout bees cannot walk on it. This curtain will shorten the mean free path length of flights inside the nest box, but it will not change either its volume or its walkable surface area. One can then see if the bees behave as if the box has been shrunk. I hope the test will be performed soon and that it will provide support for the proposed rule of thumb, for I think it's an elegant solution to a tough problem. 4. Scout Bees Debate The experience of democracy is like the experience of life itself, always changing, infinite in its variety, sometimes turbulent and all the more valuable for having been tested by adversity. Jimmy Carter, Addressed to the Parliament of India, 1978 When a honeybee swarm chooses its future home, it practices the form of democracy known as direct democracy, in which the individuals within a community who choose to participate in its decision-making do so personally rather than through representatives. The collective decision-making of a bee swarm therefore resembles a New England town meeting in which the registered voters who are interested in local affairs meet in face-to-face -face assemblies, usually once a year, to debate issues of home rule and to vote on them rendering binding decisions for their community. Of course, there are differences in how direct democracy works between bee swarms and town meetings. For example, the scouts in a bee swarm have common interests. For example, all want to choose the best available home site, and they reach decisions by building a consensus. The people in a town meeting, however, often have conflicting interests. For example, some do, and some don't, want to help fund the town library. And they reach decisions by using the majority voting rule. Each individual has one vote, all votes have equal weight, and the option that gets the majority wins. Another basic difference between bee swarm and town meeting is that a scout bee in a swarm, unlike a citizen in a meeting, cannot monitor each exchange within the group's debate and thereby have a synoptic overview of the discussion. Instead, a bee can only observe and react to the actions of her immediate neighbors in the swarm cluster. Hence, she operates without global knowledge of the information that percolates among her fellow swarm bees. While these differences, common versus conflicting interests and local versus global knowledge, between bee swarm and town meeting are real, they do not overshadow several extremely important similarities between the direct democracies of honeybees and human beings. Firstly, in both the insectan and the human forms of this collective decision-making, each decision about a future course of action reflects the contributions, freely given and equally weighted, of several hundred individuals. In other words, the control of the group's actions is distributed among many of its members rather than concentrated in a few leaders. Secondly, because hundreds of individuals are full participants, the group can acquire and process information from multiple sources simultaneously, even ones that are widely scattered. Consider, for example, the first stage of every decision-making process, where the critical challenge is to identify the available options. By virtue of having numerous individuals examining a problem and presenting possible solutions to it, both a bee swarm and a town meeting are much more capable than any solitary bee or single person in coming up with a broad range of alternative options. And the broader this range of options, the more likely it will include the one best option. Thirdly, and most intriguingly, in both bee swarms and town meetings, 
the way the group selects its course of future action is by staging an open competition among the proposed alternatives. An individual proposes a possible way forward. Each listener makes an independent assessment of the proposal and decides whether to reject or accept it, and those that accept it may announce their own support for the proposal. These endorsements often recruit still more supporters for this option. The better the proposal, the more supporters it will attract, and the more likely it is to gain sufficiently broad support to become the community's choice. In the case of the house-hunting bees, the competition among the supporters of different proposals is often fierce, with some scout bees vigorously championing the one lovely tree cavity, while other scouts, just a few bees away on the surface of the swarm cluster, are enthusiastically advertising a second, third, or even fourth desirable dwelling place. Later in the chapter we will see which bees take up the profession of nest site scout, and what prompts these bees to step into this dangerous job. In a nutshell, nest site scouts are elderly bees who were working as common foragers, but then quit this line of work when they sensed that their colony, preparing to swarm, no longer needed additional food. But it is always a friendly competition. The scout bees agree on what makes an ideal home site, they are united in the goal of choosing the best available site, they share their information with full honesty, and ultimately they reach a complete agreement about their new residence. One valuable lesson that we can learn from the bees is that holding an open and fair competition of ideas is a smart solution to the problem of making a decision based on a pool of information dispersed across a group of individuals. Lindauer's Swarms The discovery that swarm bees use debates to aggregate dispersed information was made by Martin Lindauer in 1951 and 1952 when he received permission from Carl von Frisch to use all the swarms that emerged from the hives of bees kept in the garden behind the Zoological Institute at the University of Munich. Thus, at last, Lindauer was able to make a close study of what had aroused his curiosity back in the spring of 1949, dirty dancing bees on the surface of a swarm. The Institute's bee colonies did their part, providing Lindauer with seventeen swarms spread across the months of May, June, and July. Many of the swarms flew across the street to the botanical garden, where they settled on various objects, and Lindauer charmingly named each swarm for its bivouac site. The Linden Swarm on May 18, 1951, the Hawthorne Swarm on July 9, 1951, the Balcony Swarm on June 22, 1952, and so forth. His immediate aim was to determine whether the bees dancing on a swarm are nest site scouts, but his ultimate goal was to understand how a swarm finds its new home site. Knowing the value of starting an investigation of animal behavior with a watching and wondering phase, during which one patiently makes broad observations that can yield unexpected discoveries, Lindauer watched from dawn to dusk the bees performing waggle dances on the surface of each clustered swarm. Knowing, too, that he wanted his dancing bees to be identifiable individuals so that he could begin to enter the world of a bee in a swarm, he applied colored paint dots to the back of each dancing bee. Carl von Frisch had devised a marking scheme back in the 1910s that enables one to number bees from 1 to 599 with just five paint colors, and Lindauer used this system, deftly daubing with a tiny paintbrush one to four tiny dots of shellac paint on the thorax of each dancing bee. Lindauer's endeavor to record the dances on a swarm started easily enough for few bees danced, and their dance performances were intermittent. So at first Lindauer could record in his notebook the time of each bout of dancing, the identity of the dancer, and what location this individual advertised with her dance. In time, however, his task of recording the swarm bee's dance activity became almost impossibly difficult. Sooner or later he faced a dozen or more bees dancing simultaneously on the swarm. He coped with this overwhelming display of dancing bees by becoming more selective in what he recorded. He noted only the time he saw each new, not yet labeled, dancing bee, and the location indicated by each new bee's dance. 
it was exhausting to single-handedly observe label and record the dancing swarm bees for hour after hour sometimes for days on end but it was immensely revealing in chapter one we saw how lindauer tested his hunch that the bees dancing on swarms are nest site scouts advertising potential nesting cavities he found that the site indicated unanimously by the dancing bees shortly before a swarm flew to its new home site matched the address of their new dwelling place even more marvelous was lindauer's discovery that a swarm's scouts conduct a vigorous debate to select their new home one such debate was held on the x swarm a swarm that left its parental hive at one thirty five in the afternoon on june twenty sixth nineteen fifty one soon settled in a privet bush and then hung out there for nearly four days while its scout bees went about choosing a dwelling place on the first day lindauer observed and labeled just two dancing scout bees between one thirty five and three o'clock p m one bee reported a candidate home site approximately fifteen hundred meters to the north while the other proposed a second site three hundred meters to the southeast by three o'clock p m the sky had filled with dark rain clouds and the air had become cooler so the scout bees ceased their explorations for the day the next day the scouts remained inactive until late in the morning when the clouds parted and bright sunshine returned lindauer labeled eleven new dancers between noon and five o'clock p m and that three of them advertised the site fifteen hundred meters to the north two others advertised the site three hundred meters to the southeast and the remaining six indicated six other sites in various directions and distances clearly no agreement among the dancing bees was reached during this second day of debate on the third day the weather was mostly rainy and lindauer recorded just two new dancers both in late morning one advocated the site to the north thereby strengthening this site's slim lead among the dancers with five bees total so far and the other reported a new site about four hundred meters to the southwest on the fourth day the sky cleared the air warmed and the bees became active more than twenty new sites were reported though surprisingly the site fifteen hundred meters to the north did not receive additional dancers lindauer suggested that it might have been a cavity with a leaky roof into which rainwater had seeped the previous day rendering it unattractive as a nesting site most of these twenty new possibilities were announced by just one dancer each and so weren't serious proposals in the bees debate but a few did receive the attention of multiple bees and so became important possibilities for example between nine thirty a m and four o'clock p m nine bees advertised a site located fifteen hundred meters to the west even here however the bees interest eventually faded from four o'clock to five o'clock p m lindauer recorded no new dancers for the western site only one site the one located three hundred meters to the southeast held the bees interest all day with new dancers for this site getting painted on the swarm each hour the rate at which lindauer recorded new dancers for the southeast site grew gradually over the day and that by four o'clock p m this site held a commanding lead but it was not until the final hour of dance activity between four o'clock and five o'clock p m that the recruitment of scouts to the southeast site utterly overwhelmed that to other sites with fully sixty-one dancing newcomers advertising the southeast site and only two recruiting to alternative sites the situation remained the same the following morning with eighty-three out of the eighty-five new dancers in favor of the southeast site. Finally, at nine-forty in the morning on June thirtieth, this swarm launched into flight and flew three hundred meters to the southeast to take up residence in the wall of a bomb-damaged building. The overall pattern that Lindauer reported for the X swarm, initially new dancers appeared on the swarm indicating various possible nesting site, then bit by bit the new dancers became concentrated on one of the sites and finally the swarm flew off in the direction of the favored site proved typical for the seventeen swarms he watched occasionally though lindauer encountered a swarm where the debate did not progress so smoothly for example sometimes the scout bees would find two sites that elicited strong dancing starting at about the same time 
In this situation, both sites would receive plenty of fresh recruits, and so new dancers for both sites would continue to appear on the swarm for many hours. Of course, this made it extremely difficult for the dancing bees to reach an agreement. A study of the pattern of dances produced by scout bees on the propylene swarm, observed by Lindauer in June 1952, shows one example of how a prolonged debate arose when a swarm's scout bees created two equal-strength groups of dancers. The Propylen Swarm's saga began on June 11, 1952, when it left its mother hive at 2.14 p.m. Over the remainder of the afternoon, the scouts discovered and reported on 11 sites, one of which attracted the greatest number of dancers. We see that Lindauer labeled 15 bees dancing for a site some 900 meters to the northeast, but only 14 total for the other 10 sites. So at first it looked like the scouts in this swarm had come close to an agreement in less than three hours of discussion. On the morning of the second day, however, another group of strong dancers appeared, with each of its members promoting a site 1,400 meters to the southwest. Lindauer reported that, their dances were no less lively and continual, and for the observer it was a nerve-wracking task to witness the tug-of-war of these two dance groups that dragged on for two days with seesawing prospects for victory. Throughout the second day, the appearance of new dancers for the northeast and southwest sites was nearly symmetrical, and it was not until late in the morning on the third day, June 13th, that this symmetry began to break. For some reason, the strength of dancing for the southwest site must have weakened slightly, so fewer new dancers for this site were marked, and over the afternoon the mustering of new dancers for the northeast site surged ahead of that for the southwest site. First, 25 versus 9 new dancers, 12 to 2 p.m., then 41 versus 7 new dancers, 2 to 4 p.m., and eventually 34 versus 0 new dancers, 4 to 5 p.m. We see that by the end of the third day an agreement had been reached, but, alas, it was too late in the day for the swarm to undertake its flight to its new home. Swarms rarely take flight after 5 p.m., perhaps to avoid risking a move without a long period of daylight ahead. A swarm's queen may need to make an emergency landing to rest, and when this happens it can take the workers in an airborne swarm over an hour to halt their group flight, locate their missing queen, and reassemble around her. The propylene swarm's delayed decision-making forced it to stay put until the next day, which turned out to be cool and rainy, so it was not until the afternoon of June 15th, fully four days after the swarm left its parental hive, that the bees finally flew off to their new residence in the northeast. Lindauer even observed one swarm that failed to reach an agreement, that is, there never arose a dancer group that so dominated the deliberations that Lindauer marked new dancers for only one site. It was the Balcony Swarm of June 22, 1952. As in the Propylen Swarm, its scout bees got into a balanced competition, with one group of dancers advocating a site 600 meters to the northwest, and a second group favoring instead a site 800 meters to the southwest. For four hours, 12 to 4 p.m., neither group managed to gain a decisive lead. Nevertheless, at 4.10 p.m., the swarm lifted off and then did something that Lindauer could scarcely believe, even though he was seeing it with his own eyes. In his words, The swarm sought to divide itself. The one half wanted to fly to the northwest, the other to the southwest. Apparently, each group of scouting bees wanted to abduct the swarm to the nesting place of its own choice. And each group partly succeeded, for half of the airborne bees started moving southwest toward the main railway station, while the other half began trending northwest toward the Karlstrasse. But neither group managed to keep going in its desired direction, perhaps because each lacked the queen, and eventually the two clouds of swirling bees reunited in the air where they had started. Then a remarkable tug-of-war between the two groups began. Over the next half-hour one group tried again to advance to the northwest, going off a hundred meters before coming back. Then the other group pushed a hundred fifty meters to the southwest, but then it too returned to the original site. At this point 
the bees resettled on the balcony where they had previously been clustered. Sadly, the swarm's queen had become lost during the aerial tug-of-war, and over the next several hours Lindauer watched the swarm cluster gradually dissolve as the queenless bees drifted home to their mother hive. The history of the ill-fated balcony swarm highlights several features of honeybee swarms and their decision-making process. From the tragedy of the queen's loss and the swarm's dissolution, we are reminded that the survival of a swarm's queen, who carries the new colony's genes in her ovaries and her spermatheca, is absolutely critical to a swarm's success. From the failure of the scouts to reach an agreement, we are shown how swarms are not infallible in their decision-making. Occasionally a swarm will produce a split decision, though usually this is just a temporary situation and the swarm manages to resolve the problem. We will see in Chapter 7 that when a split decision arises, a swarm will normally take off, fail to move to either site, resettle, and then conduct further debate, leading to an agreement. Lindauer watched seventeen swarms, of which just two, the Balcony and Mosacher swarms, produced split decisions. Only the Balcony swarm never reached agreement, and this was because it lost its queen. So it seems clear that complete failure in swarm decision-making is rare. Finally, from the launch of the Balcony swarm into flight without prior consensus among the dancers, we are given a strong indication that dancer consensus though conspicuous to the human observer, is not what the bees themselves monitor to know when they should switch from making a decision to implementing a decision. How the bees actually make this switch will be revealed in Chapter 7. My Swarms A great scientific discovery is one that gives rise to shining insights whose light dispels obscurities, opens up new paths, and reveals unknown horizons. Martin Lindauer made such a discovery when he found that a honeybee swarm chooses its future home through a debate in which the nest site scouts express their arguments in waggle dances. He elucidated the function of dances on swarms. He blazed a trail toward understanding the swarm bee's system of decision-making, and most importantly, he guided us into a whole new scientific territory— Sophisticated Group Decision-Making by Non-Human Animals Lindauer was certainly a pioneer in behavioral biology, and like all pioneers, the time and tools available to him were insufficient to explore fully the new terrain he had discovered. It is not surprising, therefore, that his investigation of honeybee democracy was incomplete in many ways. We can see this, perhaps most clearly, in the way he was limited by his equipment— notebook, watch, and paint set, to recording only the appearance of new dancers on his swarms. Ideally, he would have recorded all the dancers, new and old, that appeared on his swarms during each stage of the decision-making process, so that he could have acquired a full picture of the dynamics in the dancing for the alternative sites. This would have shown how the total number of supporters for each proposed site, not just the appearance of new supporters, changed over time, and how, in the end, presumably just one site was being advocated by the dancing bees. Some records indicate that shortly before swarms flew away, the winning site was being advertised by all the new dancers, but these records don't tell us whether in the end the winning site was being advertised by all the dancers, that is, all the old ones and all the new ones. Does the decision-making process in fact end cleanly, with essentially every dancer supporting a single site, the winning site? Lindauer suggested that it does. He wrote that the scouts for the losing sites ultimately gave up their recruitment, presumably by ceasing to dance, but he did not show that they stopped dancing. Also, he did not show when the advocates of the losing sites stopped dancing or how they stopped dancing. It would be, therefore, very informative to have a complete picture of the dancing on a swarm. It would also be extremely desirable to have complete records of the behaviors of individual dancers, so that one could track each dancer's actions following her first bout of dancing. Does she perform multiple bouts of dancing? Is the total amount of her dancing related to the quality of the site that she is advertising? 
And if she stops dancing, how does she decide to do so? Does she quit on her own, regardless of what is happening around her, or only after encountering another bee performing a more vigorous dance? Lindauer's study is an amazing first reconnaissance of how house-hunting honeybees perform their collective decision-making, but it left unanswered countless questions about the rules of procedure that nest site scouts follow when conducting their deliberations. In 1996, I decided to tackle these questions. This was nearly 20 years after I had finished my Ph.D. thesis research on the nest site preferences of honeybees and the way they estimate the volume of a prospective nest cavity. Why hadn't I started addressing the gaps in Lindauer's work back in the mid-1970s? It was because I didn't see how I could get the video recording equipment that I knew I'd need to go beyond Lindauer's analysis of swarm decision-making. In those days, a color video camera, recorder, and monitor, they were all separate units back then, cost many, many thousands of dollars, a price that far exceeded the budgets of the small grants I could get as a beginner scientist. So I changed the focus of my research, but without abandoning the topic of how social animals make collective decisions. Rather, I switched to studying another form of collective decision-making by the bees, how a honeybee colony wisely deploys its foragers among the kaleidoscopic array of flower patches in the surrounding countryside. This is a different sort of collective choice, for whereas a homeless swarm makes a consensus decision about which single option— candidate nest site it will choose, a foraging colony makes a combined decision about how to allocate its foragers among multiple options, candidate food sources. I was attracted to the puzzle of colony decision-making about forager allocation partly because it looked fundamentally similar to nest site choice, being based on competition among groups of dancing bees advertising different options, food sources rather than nest sites, and partly because it looked more tractable than nest site choice. Swarming is an ephemeral phenomenon that lasts at most a few days, whereas foraging goes on all summer long. So for about fifteen years I explored with pleasure how the bees in a hive work together as a unified whole in gathering their food, especially how they wisely distribute themselves among flower patches. In 1995, I summarized this body of research in a book, The Wisdom of the Hive, and with this behind me, I looked forward to resuming my exploration of collective decision-making in honeybee swarms. The starting point was clear. I should obtain a complete record of the scout bee's dances throughout a swarm's choice of its new home in order to get a full picture of how a debate among scout bees unfolds. This broad description of the scout bee's behavior at the swarm would fill the gaps in the description provided by Lindauer, and probably would also yield important discoveries, as indeed it did. Unlike Lindauer forty years before, or myself twenty years before, I now had sophisticated video recording and slow-motion playback equipment that made it possible to build a comprehensive record of the scout bee's dance activity. Also, I now knew how to label thousands of bees for individual identification with plastic color number tags glued on the thorax and paint marks placed on the abdomen, a skill that I had honed in my studies of honeybee foraging. With each bee in a swarm so labeled, I figured that it should be possible to trace each individual's history of dancing throughout the decision-making process. Success in this project would require, however, a formidable amount of painstaking labor. Thousands of bees had to be individually labeled for each swarm. The swarm and video equipment had to be tended throughout each swarm's choice of a home, and the information about each dance, the dancer's ID, the site being advertised, and the dance's duration, had to be extracted manually from the video recordings. It was my immense good fortune to be joined in this endeavor by Susanna Bjurman, an extremely bright and indefatigable undergraduate student at Cornell. She proved an indispensable partner in this project. Working together throughout the summer of 1997, we achieved success. Susanna and I eavesdropped on the deliberations among the scout bees on three swarms, 
and we obtained a complete record of the dances performed for each swarm's decision-making. The debate, recorded on Swarm 1, which was set up at 10 a.m. on June 19. We see that Nest Site Scouts started reporting discoveries between 1 and 3 p.m., and that by the end of the day, seven candidate nest sites, A through G, had been raised for consideration, though none of these had elicited enthusiastic support. The next day the Scout Bees were livelier. By midday, four additional sites, H through K, had been entered into the discussion, and three sites, G, 2,200 meters to the southeast, H, 2,600 meters to the east, and I, 4,200 meters to the south, had received endorsements by multiple dancing bees. Site G appeared to be developing a lead, for nine bees had advertised it, but no site was yet dominant in the dancing. The situation changed markedly between 12 and 2 p.m. Now Site I rose to prominence, supported by 23 out of the 25 dancing bees. This situation persisted for the remainder of the afternoon, though still two more possibilities, Sites L and M were presented, and the dancing bees showed support for sites K, L, and M, as well as site I, until the end of the day. The next morning, however, there was a clear consensus among the dancing bees in favor of site I, and at 9.10 a.m. the swarm took off and flew to the south, no doubt with site I its destination. The debate on Swarm 1 proceeded in a manner reminiscent of what Lindauer described for his X-Swarm. During the first half of the decision-making process, the scouts reported numerous candidate sites located at various directions and distances from the swarm cluster. Then, in the second half of the debate, the dances of the scout bees quickly and smoothly became focused on just one site. Ultimately, there was virtual unanimity among the dancing bees, and the swarm moved to the agreed-upon site. It is worth stressing that the pattern of dances produced by scout bees on Swarm 1 depicts, for each time interval, the number of total dancers for each site, not just the number of new dancers for each site. We can be confident, therefore, that the conclusion of this swarm's decision-making was marked by a real consensus among the dancing bees. The most interesting Scout Bee debate that Susanna and I observed occurred in our Swarm 3. In this one there was a strong competition between two groups of dancers, and for many hours it was unclear which faction would emerge victorious. This swarm was set up at 2.30 p.m. on July 19th, but it was not until the middle of the next day that Scout Bees started advertising potential nest sites with their dances. Six sites, A through F, were announced between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., one of which, Site A, 2,200 meters to the east, quickly developed a strong lead with eight dancing bees promoting it. Over the next four hours, three more possible home sites, G, H, I, were entered into the discussion, and four sites, A, B, D, G, received strong consideration, each being advertised by several bees. Site A, though, was losing its initial lead as Sites B, 900 meters to the south, and Site G, 1400 meters to the southwest, gained more and more support. Between 3 and 5 p.m., only four bees danced for Site A, whereas 17 bees danced for Site B and 10 did so for Site G. At 5 p.m., it seemed that the contest among dancer groups on this swarm was still wide open. This situation changed dramatically during the remaining two hours of dance debate that day, for although bees performed dances for seven sites during these last two hours, including two new sites, J and K, only sites B and G received the support of multiple dancing bees. Susanna and I could see that the supporters of these two sites had managed to gain wide leads over the bees promoting the other nine sites and we made bets on whether the B group or the G group would prevail the next day. I bet on Site B and Susanna on Site G. Whoever would win the bet would be treated to a triple-scoop ice cream cone at the new Ben & Jerry's in Ithaca. The tension was high the next morning. We arrived at the lab shortly after sunrise, got our recording equipment set up before the Scout Bees could resume their debate, 
and waited eagerly to see who would win our little bet. For the first two hours, seven to nine a.m., we both remained hopeful, because both sites were being advertised by about a dozen dancing bees. Starting around nine a.m., though, my optimism began to ebb, for the dancers supporting Susanna's Site G began to build a commanding lead over those for my Site B, with 32 versus 17 Bs respectively between 9 and 11 a.m., and 20 versus 4 between 11 and 11.54 when it started raining. Somehow the Site G Bs had managed to overwhelm those for Site B. The rain continued throughout the afternoon, during the night, and until about 8 a.m. the next day. The scout bees resumed dancing a little after 9 a.m., and now they showed unanimous support, 73 out of 73 bees, for Site G in the southwest. Shortly before noon, the bees flew off to the southwest, and shortly after noon, Susanna and I motored off to Ben and Jerry's. It was a great pleasure to watch the dance competitions among scout bees, but it was an even deeper pleasure to analyze the diagrams that we prepared many weeks later after we had extracted all the information we needed from our 48 hours of video recordings. These diagrams gave us a crystal clear picture of the main features of the scout bees' decision-making process. First, they showed that the bees' debates tend to start slowly, with an information accumulation phase during which scout bees put a sizable number of widely scattered alternatives on the table for discussion. In the three swarms that Susanna and I watched, the number of sites considered was 13, 5, and 11. These sites were located in various directions and at various distances, 200 to 4,800 meters, from the swarm cluster which indicates that the intrepid scouts from these swarms had searched some 70 square kilometers, about 30 square miles, of countryside for possible dwelling places. Most of the candidate sites were introduced during the first half of the deliberations, but as we can see with sites L and M in Swarm 1, sometimes a few got introduced rather late in the discussion. Certainly, a swarm does not manage to identify all its alternative options simultaneously, but as we will see in Chapter 5, this asynchrony usually does not lead to swarms making poor decisions. Second, the plots of the dance records showed that the scout bees' debates end with all or nearly all of the dancing bees advocating just one site, that is, showing a consensus. A burning question is, therefore, how does the fierce competition among groups of bees favoring different options get transformed into a harmonious agreement? Specifically, how is it that the number of dancers builds up for one site, generally the best one, as we will see in Chapter 5, while at the same time it falls to zero for all the other sites? We will see how the bees accomplish these things using some nifty tricks in Chapter 6. Third, our analysis showed that the bees' decision-making process is a highly distributed and thus a democratic one, involving dozens or hundreds of individuals. Susanna and I observed 73, 47, and 149 bees performing dances in the three swarms we studied. These counts, however, probably underestimate the typical number of dancing bees in a swarm. This is because we used unusually small swarms, with only 3,252, 2,357, and 3,649 bees, to keep doable our task of individually labeling the bees. Swarms in nature generally contain 6,000 to 14,000 bees. The mean percentage of dancing bees in our labeled bee swarms was 2.8%, which is similar to the 5.4% figure for natural swarms reported by David Gilley, another dedicated Cornell undergraduate student who investigated the mystery of the identity of scout bees. Next section. Given that 3-5% to of the bees in a swarm participate in the dance debate, we can estimate that a typical swarm of some 10,000 bees will have approximately 300-500 to individuals contributing to the decision-making process. Intrepid Explorers The profession of nest site scout is performed only a few days each year, usually in the late spring or early summer. 
This fact, together with the fact that worker bees have short life spans, only three to five weeks during the warm months of the year, tells us that many generations of bees will pass without the need arising for individuals to explore for new accommodations. And yet, when a colony prepares to cast a swarm, a small fraction of its workforce springs into action as nest site scouts. These intrepid explorers are the prime movers of the whole swarming process. They determine when the swarm leaves its mother hive, as discussed in Chapter 2, they make the swarm's life-or-death choice of a suitable nesting cavity, they trigger the swarm's takeoff to fly to its new home, see Chapter 7, and they steer the swarm during its flight, see Chapter 8. Who are these all-important bees? And what stirs them to action? Evidently, scout bees are forager bees that have radically switched their behavior so that instead of seeking bright blossoms, they search for dark crevices. The first evidence that nest site scouts are reconfigured foragers came from an experiment conducted by Martin Lindauer. On May 11, 1954, Lindauer set up a colony in a locale east of Munich where flat fields stretch to the horizon, and few trees and houses offer nesting cavities. There was, however, plentiful forage for the bees, and within a week they began filling the combs in their hive with brood, pollen, and honey. Lindauer expected them to swarm shortly, and eventually they did so, casting a swarm on May 27th. Ten days before this, on May 17th, Lindauer had set up a table 250 meters, 820 feet, from the hive, and on it he had placed a feeder filled with rich sugar syrup, granular sucrose dissolved in honey. In a few days he had more than a hundred bees from his hive foraging eagerly at his feeder, and he had each one labeled with paint marks for individual identification. Next, on May 22nd, he placed two artificial nest sites beside the feeding table, a straw skep and a wooden hive. Over the following few days, Lindauer started to see curious changes in the behavior of the bees visiting his feeder. First, the eagerness of their foraging decreased. Fewer and fewer of his labeled bees made trips to the feeder, and those that kept coming visited less and less often. Sometimes they sucked only hesitantly at the rich sugar syrup. Eventually, on the morning of May 25th, Lindauer noticed that his foraging bees made only a pretense of coming to the feeding dish. They did sip very briefly at it, but then they flew up and buzzed around in the near vicinity for some time. A knot hole in a nearby oak tree drew their attention, as did the two artificial nest sites Lindauer had provided. Over the afternoon, six of his labeled foragers, B-73, B-100, B-106, B-113, B-119, and B-156, conducted fifteen inspections of the skep and eight of the hive. There could be no doubt. Some of his foragers had become scouts. The second indication that nest site scouts are converted foragers comes from a study conducted by Dave Gilley, the gifted undergraduate student who joined my laboratory and quickly fell in love with the bees. To earn an honors degree at Cornell, a student majoring in biology must write a senior thesis based on original research. Dave approached me in the spring of his junior year about attempting an honors thesis project with the bees. I suggested he probe further the mystery of who becomes a nest site scout, and he happily accepted. Lindauer had shown that some scouts were previously foragers. Dave wanted to see if all or most scouts were previously foragers. If so, then the scouts should be among the oldest bees in a swarm, for it is well established that foragers are the oldest bees in a hive. Dave tested this prediction by setting up five small colonies of bees in early May 1996, and every three days, from May 5th to July 22nd, adding to each one a cohort of 100 bees that had just emerged from brood combs held in an incubator, zero-day-old bees. All the bees in each age cohort were labeled with a paint dot of a particular color, indicating the group to which they belonged. Over the next several weeks, as Dave filled the colonies with colorful bees, 
the bees filled their combs with brood, pollen, and honey. Then one by one in June and July, the colonies swarmed. Once a swarm had settled into a cluster outside the laboratory building, Dave would watch it patiently for paint-marked bees performing dances. And each time he saw such a bee, he would record her age and give her another paint mark, to avoid counting this bee again. Once he had sighted fifty or so nest site scouts of known age, he collected the entire swarm, narcotized the bees with carbon dioxide before placing them in a freezer, and finally picked over the dead bees to count how many were in each age cohort. These counts enabled him to calculate the age distribution of the nest site scouts that would be expected if they were drawn randomly from among all the known age bees in the swarm. The nest site scouts included many more older, that is, forager age, bees than would be expected if the known age scouts had been drawn at random from the pool of known age bees in the swarm. These findings support the idea that scouts come largely, if not entirely, from the ranks of a colony's foragers. Both scouts and foragers make long-distance excursions from a central location, swarm or hive, and then must find their way home, so it is easy to imagine that bees with foraging experience make the best scouts. Having foraging experience evidently prepares a bee for the special job of house hunting, this certainly cannot be the whole story, however, because many foragers never go searching for real estate opportunities. We now know that having certain genes also predisposes a bee to serve as a nest site scout. Biologists have shown repeatedly and in many animal species that differences in behavior among individuals arise from differences in both their genes and their experiences, so it is not surprising that scouts and non-scouts in honeybee swarms differ in nature, genes, as well as nurture, experience. The need to have the right genetic stuff in order to become a scout bee was shown by two behavioral geneticists, Jean E. Robinson and Robert E. Page, Jr., now professors at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and Arizona State University. They established three colonies, each of which was headed by a queen that had been instrumentally inseminated with the semen of three unrelated drones, A, B, and C. The three sperm donors for each queen carried distinct genetic markers so that the investigators could determine which drone, A, B, or C, fathered any given worker in a colony. Robinson and Page then prepared artificial swarms, the method is explained shortly, from their colonies, set these swarms up outdoors, and collected about forty scouts, dancers, and forty non-scouts, non-dancers, from each swarm. Finally, they conducted a paternity analysis of each collected bee and statistically analyzed their findings to see if the offspring of some drones were more likely to be scouts than were the offspring of other drones. In two of the three swarms, they found that, yes, the offspring of the three drones differed dramatically in the likelihood of becoming a nest site scout. For example, in one swarm, one drone fathered over 60% of the scout bees, even though he fathered less than 20% of the worker bees overall. One wonders what it was about this drone's genes that gave his daughters their proclivity to set out as enterprising house hunters, going boldly where no bee had gone before. Of course, it is only when a colony is in swarming mode that some foragers, especially those endowed with genes fostering exploratory behavior, adopt the special role of house hunter. How do these bees know when it's the right time to change their occupation from forager to scout? One hint of how the bees might do this comes from what we humans must do to concoct an artificial swarm for an experimental study such as the one just described by Gene Robinson and Rob Page. Basically, this is a matter of rendering a queen and a contingent of her workers homeless but not hungry. To do so, you first search through a hive of bees until you locate the queen, and then you sequester her safely in a matchbox size queen cage. Next, using a large funnel, 
you shake several thousand worker bees off the hive's combs and into a shoebox size swarm cage that has bottom, top, and ends made of wood, but sides made of window screen for ventilation. At this point, you suspend the queen cage inside the swarm cage so the worker bees have their queen, and you close the top of the swarm cage so the bees are contained. Finally, you feed the caged bees lavishly by brushing sugar syrup onto the screen sides of the swarm cage. It is absolutely essential to feed the bees until they are sated, and then to keep them full of food for several days. If you don't, when you shake the worker bees from the cage, you will see that the workers cluster conveniently wherever you have mounted the queen, still confined in the queen cage, but you will not see scout bees springing into action. I know this from failures experienced firsthand. When I began making artificial swarms, I sometimes made the mistake of not feeding a swarm sufficiently before setting it up. Then I would sit beside the swarm for days, waiting for the scout bees to start their dancing, wondering why they didn't. It seems that a critical stimulus for inducing a food collector to transform herself into a house hunter is that her stomach has been filled with food for a few days. Lindauer observed this transformation from hungry forager to sated scout during the study described that he performed in May 1954. The colony used in this study was housed in a glass-walled observation hive, so Lindauer could watch the behavior of foragers both inside and outside the hive. When he established his sugar water feeder 250 meters from the hive on May 17th, there was little natural forage available, and the bees that found his feeder danced vivaciously when they came home laden with sugar syrup. Over the next few days, he labeled more than 100 foragers at the feeder. From May 22nd on, however, the flowers of horse chestnut trees, Aesculus hippocastanum, provided plentiful nectar, the bees gradually filled their hives' combs with honey, and when Lindauer's foragers returned home, they had difficulty finding hive bees who would accept their loads of sugar syrup. It is now well established that when returning foragers experience difficulty unloading their nectar, they lose their zest for dancing and foraging. In the extreme condition of a strong colony that has its combs filled with brood and food, hence it is primed to swarm, it is likely that foragers will find it impossible to unload their nectar and will linger at home with their stomachs bulging. This forced inactivity may stimulate a few foragers, those who are constitutionally inclined to explore, to turn to nest site scouting. I find it extremely suggestive that Lindauer started seeing some of his labeled foragers exploring his nest sites, not exploiting his feeder, a few days after he started noticing most of his previously active foragers sitting around idly, either in some quiet spot inside the hive or in the beard of bees hanging outside the entrance. Anecdotal observations like these are the perfect springboard for an experimental investigation designed to test conclusively whether it is a persistently full stomach per se, or something else associated with forced indolence, that informs foragers to become scouts. Students take note. 5. Agreement on Best Sight Love quarrels oft in pleasing concord end. John Milton, Samson Agonistes, 1671. In the previous chapter, we saw how the quarrels among scout bees, like those among human lovers, oft in concord end. Now we will see if the agreements reached by the bees are pleasing. That is, when the dancing bees reach a consensus about their new home site, are they apt to have chosen the best site? The answer is yes. But before looking at the evidence that a swarm usually chooses the best of the many candidate sites the scouts discover, let's first consider the structure of the choice problem faced by the house-hunting bees. This will sharpen our appreciation of a honeybee swarm as a democratic decision-making body. A swarm of bees selecting a nest cavity faces a decision-making problem akin to what a person faces when choosing a place to live. This is a complex choice problem, 
for it is one where there are numerous alternative solutions, for example, houses or apartments, and each one has many attributes, for example, neighborhood, number of bedrooms, and such. And, as is true for all decision-making problems, finding a good solution is a twofold process. First, identify the possible alternatives, then choose among them. In an ideal world, the decision-maker would be able to learn about all the alternatives and all the attributes of each, calculate the value of each alternative in light of all its attributes, and rationally choose the one with the highest value. Doing all these things will produce optimal decision-making. In the real world, however, truly optimal decision-making rarely happens, because decision-makers must pay costs in time, energy, and other resources to acquire and process information, and these costs usually preclude making the decision using all the relevant information. For example, someone hunting for an apartment in a large city would have to expend excessive time, money, and mental effort to survey the entire market of available rental properties, evaluate them all, and make the perfect choice. Given that decision-makers do not possess unlimited time, boundless resources, and infinite powers of reason, psychologists and economists now recognize that real-world decision-making, often called bounded rationality, relies on simplified mechanisms of choice termed heuristics. These generally involve reducing either the breadth or the depth or both of the decision-maker's consideration of the alternatives. For example, the decision-making heuristic called satisficing reduces the breadth of the search for alternatives. It takes the shortcut of setting an acceptance threshold and ending the search for alternatives as soon as one is encountered that exceeds this threshold. Imagine, for example, someone who has just moved to a distant city, is hunting for an apartment, and can't search the housing market broadly because she needs to start work immediately at her new job. If she simply picks the first apartment that is acceptable, which almost certainly is not the best one available, then she will have used the satisficing heuristic. Another decision-making heuristic, called elimination by aspects, reduces the depth of the decision-making task. Someone using this heuristic to find an apartment first decides what attribute is most important, say, commuting distance, sets an acceptance limit, say, no more than a 20-minute commute, and eliminates all the apartments that exceed the limit. The process is then repeated, attribute by attribute, no more than $1,000 per month, a park for jogging within five blocks, until either a choice is made or the set of possibilities is narrowed sufficiently to switch over to a thorough evaluation of the finalists. This person probably won't choose the apartment that would be the best overall. She will not consider an apartment that has a 22-minute commute, even if it has a low rent and a beautiful park nearby. But she certainly has diminished the time, expense, and mental effort needed to find a place to live. Given that humans and other animals usually make decisions by drawing on a toolbox of heuristics, it is remarkable that a honeybee swarm does not use these shortcut methods of decision-making, and instead selects its new living quarters by taking a broad and deep look at the bee housing market. As we have seen in Chapter 4, a swarm makes its decision only after its scout bees have discovered numerous alternative nest sites and have performed a multifaceted inspection of each site. In the full-size natural swarms studied by Martin Lindauer, the mean number of candidate sites reported by scouts on a swarm was 24, range 13 to 34. And even in the small, artificial swarms studied by Susanna Bierman and me, the mean number was 10, range 5 to 13. And, as we have seen in Chapter 3, each candidate's site is evaluated with respect to at least six attributes, for example, cavity, volume, entrance height, and entrance size. Thus, a honeybee swarm pursues an unusually sophisticated strategy of decision-making, one that involves nearly all of the information relevant to the problem of choosing the best place to build its new nest. Note, 
Even a honeybee swarm is not all-knowing, for even though it sends out hundreds of scouts to search for candidate nest cavities, these bees probably don't discover all the available dwelling places. A swarm is able to be so thorough in choosing its home because its democratic organization enables it to harness the power of many individuals working together to perform collectively the two fundamental parts of the decision-making process, acquiring information about the alternatives and processing this information to make a choice. We will now look at the evidence that honeybee democracy does indeed achieve nearly optimal decision-making. Best of N to investigate whether a swarm scouts usually reach agreement on the best available site, I needed to go beyond observing their dances for natural nest sites on the swarm cluster. Specifically, I needed to present them with an array of artificial nest sites that differed in quality, and I needed to do so in a location lacking natural nest sites so that the scouts would focus their attention on my artificial dwelling places. With such a setup, I could find out if a swarm's scout bees consistently choose the best nest site out of a set of alternatives biologists refer to this as solving a best-of-end choice problem, or if they don't actually achieve such optimal decision-making. One can imagine various ways in which a swarm's choice of its new home could fall short of perfection. As we saw in Chapter 4, a swarm's scout bees do not enter all the candidate sites into their debate at the same time, but instead do so over many hours or even a few days. If the best site happens to be presented late in the debate, its supporters might have difficulty overtaking those advocating a poorer site that was presented early on and has gained much support. Or even if the best alternative is entered into the debate at the start, it could lose out if the bees advertising it fail to tout its high quality. How scout bees indicate a site's quality in their waggle dances will be discussed in Chapter 6. Yet another way that the best site might lose out in the scout bees debate, even if it is reported promptly and correctly, is if this site is especially hard to find by recruits, maybe because it is far away or because it has an obscure entrance opening. Either situation will hamper the mustering of support for the best site. Given the many situations that seem like they could cause swarms to perform suboptimally in choosing a home, I wondered if swarms really are so skilled at solving the best of end choice problem. To find out, I needed to test their decision making skills with controlled experiments. Mediocrity in 15 Leaders. To perform these experiments, I returned in the summer of 1997 to Appledore Island in the Gulf of Maine, where some twenty years before I had good luck in getting swarms to be interested in artificial nest sites. In the intervening years, I had studied the bees mainly at the Cranberry Lake Biological Station, deep in the forested Adirondack Mountains of northern New York State, where flowers are sparse and bees are eager to forage from artificial food sources. Studying the bees in the North Woods had been thrilling. Each summer, my students and I had uncovered secrets about the beautiful inner workings of a honeybee colony, particularly those that enable a colony to gather its food efficiently. Also, I had fallen in love with swimming in the lake's crystalline water, watching the northern lights glow in the midnight sky, and falling asleep to the haunting calls of loons. But by 1997... I was ready to return to the brilliant sunshine, ferocious gulls, lush poison ivy, and invigorating salty air of Appledore Island. My first goal was to figure out how to make an artificial nest site that was acceptable but not ideal to the bees. If I could solve this problem, then I could test whether or not swarms achieve optimal decision-making. The design of the test called for presenting swarms one at a time, with an array of five nest boxes that would offer four acceptable home sites and one ideal home site, and then seeing how reliably swarms would select the best of the five nest boxes. From my studies in the mid-1970s of the bees' nest site preferences, I knew that bees prefer nesting cavities that have a large volume, 40 liters, and a small entrance, 15 square centimeters, 
so I decided to see if I could dilute the goodness of a nest box by decreasing its cavity volume or increasing its entrance area. Each nest box had a cavity volume of 40 liters, but this could be reduced to 20, 15, or 10 liters by placing an inner wall in the appropriate location. Similarly, I could enlarge each box's entrance from 15 square centimeters to 30 or 60 square centimeters by replacing one entrance reducer with another. It was essential that the nest boxes differed only in cavity volume or entrance area, so I positioned each nest box inside an open-sided shelter. These shelters all faced the same direction, so all five nest boxes had identical exposures to wind, sun, rain, and gull poop. In early August, I loaded my pickup truck in Ithaca with five nest boxes, five shelters, the swarm stand I had used for video recording the scout bees' debates, and three hives of bees for making artificial swarms. After driving to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, I loaded my equipment on the RV John M. Kingsbury, the workhorse research vessel of the Shoals Marine Laboratory. It would ferry me and my 60,000 co-workers from the dock in Portsmouth, down the Piscataqua River, and out to the cluster of offshore islands known as the Isles of Shoals, of which the 96-acre Appledore is the largest. My 13-year-old nephew, Ethan Wolfson Seeley, had joined me as research assistant. Soon we were off. Standing in the brilliant sunshine, drinking in the beauty of coastal New England, I felt exhilarated to be returning to one of my favorite outdoor haunts where I had made some of my first scientific discoveries. But I also felt slightly apprehensive to be returning to experiments with swarms which I remembered were extremely difficult, even on Appledore Island. I had heard that Rodney Sullivan, my lobster fisherman friend, had left the island and sold his cottage. Would the new owners allow me to screen off their chimney to deter my scout bees? I also knew that over the past twenty years the Shoals Marine Laboratory had built several new dormitories and laboratories. Would these new buildings contain attractive home sites for the bees? And I wondered if I had designed my experimental nest boxes correctly so that they could be tuned to the right settings of cavity volume and entrance area to produce a mediocre but still acceptable nest site would these nest boxes work? I soon stopped worrying, however, reminding myself that I've always made progress in my studies whenever I've watched the bees closely, paid close attention to unexpected results, and treated failed attempts to reach a goal as finger posts indicating a better way to go forward. Certainly the remote setting of Appledore Island, 640 kilometers, 400 miles, from Cornell University, and 10 kilometers, 6 miles, out in the Atlantic Ocean, would give me a perfect opportunity to focus my attention on the bees. In a few days, Ethan and I had set up a swarm on the porch of one of the laboratory buildings, and had placed two nest boxes in grassy sites on the north half of the island, both of them 250 meters, 820 feet, from the swarm, but in slightly different directions. To help gain the scout bee's interest, the nest boxes were set up with a large cavity volume, 40 liters, and a small entrance opening, 15 square centimeters. Already I had introduced myself to the new owners of the Sullivan Cottage, from Massachusetts and without shotgun, had explained why I wanted to put a screen over the top of their chimney, and had done so with their blessing. Now we sat patiently by the swarm, watching for bees performing waggle dances on the swarm's surface to see what the scout bees would report. All bees announcing one of the two nest boxes would be left alone, but any bee indicating some other site would be plucked off with forceps, dropped into a small cage, and later put in a freezer. This censorship of the scout bee's communications turned out to be critical to our success. From time to time, a bee would appear on the swarm dancing excitedly for a rogue sight, and if we did not remove her quickly, there would soon be an unstoppable escalation of interest in the distracting sight as bees recruited to the site would come back and recruit still more bees there. Such snowballing of the scout bee's interest in an unintended sight 
actually happened three times that summer. In two cases we managed to find the place of interest by reading the bees' dances to determine the direction and distance to the site they were excitedly advertising, plotting its estimated location on a map of the island, and then searching there for scout bees flying in and out of some small opening. One site was a space beneath a pile of old boards, and the other was a small cave in a stone wall. I rendered both sites worthless to the bees by opening them up. The third time, however, our search-and-destroy operation failed even though we poked around for hours in the right general area, which was among the three old houses on the south shore of the island. Evidently, a scout bee had discovered first-rate living quarters somewhere in the evil-looking jungle of poison ivy behind these houses, a place that we didn't dare explore. Because we could not eliminate this site, we could not extinguish the bees' raging interest in it, so all we could do was remove the swarm with its errant scout bees and start over with a new bunch of bees. Fortunately, all our other swarms focused their house-hunting efforts on our nest boxes, and in doing so they taught us how to make one into a mediocre but acceptable dwelling place. The first lesson we learned was that I had guessed wrong about doing so by enlarging the entrance opening to thirty or sixty square centimeters. If we gave a swarm of bees a forty-liter nest box with a fifteen square centimeter entrance, they showed great interest in the box, as indicated by a rapid build-up of scout bees at the box soon after its discovery. For example, on August 10, 1997, one such nest box was found shortly before 1 p.m., and by 2.30 p.m. there were more than ten bees crawling and flying about outside this nest box. There could be no doubt that the scout bees had judged this box to be highly desirable and had recruited others to it. In fact, around 1 p.m., back at the swarm cluster, we had observed several bees advertising the box with vigorous waggle dances. But after we enlarged the entrance opening to 60 square centimeters at 2.30 p.m., the number of bees outside the box plummeted, falling to just one or two bees by 3 p.m. This sudden abandonment of the box suggested that the scouts were no longer attracted to it. At 3 p.m., the entrance was reduced back to 15 square centimeters, and the number of scout bees outside the box shot up as before, reaching more than 12 bees by 4.30 p.m. But after the entrance was enlarged again to 60 square centimeters at 4.30 p.m., the counts of the scout bees plummeted again, dropping to less than one bee by 6 p.m. The next day we observed the same pattern of strong buildup of bees outside the box when its entrance was 15 square centimeters and a steep crash in their number after we enlarged the entrance to just 30 square centimeters. These results, confirmed by those obtained from a second swarm a few days later, taught us that scout bees judge a nest box with a 30 or 60 square centimeter entrance opening to be a low-quality, probably even unacceptable, home site. They also showed us how easy it was to conduct an opinion poll of a swarm's scouts, simply count the bees outside each nest box. We next tried to create a medium-quality nest site, by reducing the cavity volume to something less than 40 liters. This approach worked well. Our first trial started with scout bees discovering both nest boxes late in the day on August 13, 1997. The next morning we set the volume of one box at 40 liters and that of the other box at 15 liters. Both boxes had the entrance opening set to 15 square centimeters. The number of scout bees outside the 40-liter box rose steadily throughout the morning and reached nine bees by early afternoon. Meanwhile, the number outside the 15-liter box stayed low at just one or two bees. It was clear that the scout bees were treating the 40-liter box as a high-quality site. But were they treating the 15-liter box as a medium-quality site, that is, one not highly desirable but certainly acceptable? To see if the bees would accept the 15-liter box, at 12.30 p.m. we enlarged the entrance opening of the 40-liter box to 60 square centimeters to render it unacceptable, and we watched to see if the bees would now accept the 15-liter box. They did. 
While the number of bees at the 40-liter box plunged, the number at the 15-liter box climbed to a high level, and at 1.28 p.m., the swarm took off to fly to the 15-liter nest box. The reason for the sharp drop in number of scouts at the chosen site shortly before swarm takeoff will be discussed in Chapter 8. Thus, this first trial yielded evidence that we could present our bees on Appledore with a mediocre but acceptable dwelling place if we gave them one of our nest boxes with the volume set at 15 liters and the entrance set at 15 square centimeters. Additional trials made with two other swarms produced results similar to those from the first swarm. When given a choice between two nest boxes with different volume settings, a swarm's scout bees would build up much more strongly at a 40-liter box than at a 15-liter one, so long as both boxes had a small, 15-square-centimeter entrance opening. But when the 40-liter box was severely degraded by enlarging its entrance opening to 60 square centimeters, the scout bees would become numerous at the 15-liter box and eventually would accept this box for their future home. Window on a Bee's Mind Further evidence that we had found the right formula for creating a mediocre but acceptable home site came from observations made at the swarm cluster rather than at the nest boxes. At the swarm cluster, we could see scout bees performing dances simultaneously for the 40-liter and 15-liter nest boxes when both had small entrances. We could also identify which nest box each dancing bee was advertising by noting the angle of the waggle runs in her dance, for we had carefully positioned the nest boxes so that their directions differed by 30 degrees. We were most grateful to the bees for saving us the trouble of giving the scouts from the two sites different labels. Now, it is well known that when a bee performs a waggle dance to recruit hive mates to a food source, she decides how strongly she should dance based on the desirability of her flower patch. For instance, a bee advertising flowers brimming with sweet nectar might perform a strong dance that contains a hundred dance circuits and lasts for two hundred seconds, whereas a bee reporting on a poorer nectar source might produce a rather weak dance that contains only ten dance circuits and lasts just twenty seconds. This correlation between flower desirability and dance strength, number of dance circuits, means that the waggle dance provides us with a window on a bee's mind, especially on her sense of the quality of what she is reporting to her hive mates. Assuming that this window works for bees advertising nest sites as well as food sources, we decided to look through it to see how scout bees advertising our 40-liter and our 15-liter nest boxes judged the quality of each as a prospective home. We did so by video recording the dances performed side by side on a swarm by two groups of scouts, those reporting on our 40-liter nest box and those reporting on our 15-liter nest box. The fact that both nest boxes elicited dancing by the scout bees told us that both were of considerable interest to the bees. But even more telling was what we learned by carefully reviewing the video recordings and measuring the strength of each bee's dance. We found that bees reporting the 40-liter box performed strong dances that on average contained about 35 circuits and lasted about 85 seconds, whereas the bees reporting the 15-liter box performed weaker dances that on average contained only about 14 circuits and lasted only about 45 seconds. These findings strongly support the conclusion that the bees judged our 15-liter nest box to be an acceptable but mediocre home site. The indication of acceptability is that the scouts produced dances for the 15-liter nest box. We don't expect scouts to advertise an unacceptable site. And the indication of mediocrity is that the scouts produced relatively weak dances for the 15-liter nest box. Critical Experiment On Appledore Island, during the sunny days of August 1997, I had learned from the bees how to tune my experimental nest boxes so that I could present a swarm with a choice among five possible home sites, four of them fixer-uppers and one a dream home. 
So at this point I was ready to present Swarms with the best of five choice problem, and I was extremely eager to do so. But alas, I had to wait until the following summer to conduct this critical test of their decision-making skills. Fall semester classes start at Cornell in the last week of August, and each fall semester I'm part of a team that teaches a popular class in animal behavior, so I needed to get back to Ithaca to give my lectures. I also needed to set up the special glass-walled hives of bees that we use in the course to introduce students to the pleasures of watching and wondering about bee behavior. In June of 1998, I returned to Appledore Island. With me was the smart and dedicated Cornell undergraduate student, Susanna Bierman, who had helped me the summer before in documenting the Scout Bees debates. Our goal now was to test the decision-making skills of swarms by giving them the best-of-five choice test. Administering this test required two people working as a team, one sitting at the swarm to eliminate any scouts performing dances for sites other than the nest boxes, and one circulating among the nest boxes to count the scouts visiting them. We set up the nest boxes in a fan-shaped array on the east side of the island so that the boxes were about the same distance, approximately 250 meters, but in different directions, at least 15 degrees apart from the swarm. We began each trial of the experiment by arranging the inner walls inside the five nest boxes so that one offered a 40-liter nesting cavity and the others offered a 15-liter cavity. Next, we mounted the swarm to be tested on the swarm stand. Once the swarm had formed its cluster and scout bees had begun flying from the cluster, one of us started monitoring the scouts' dances to remove reports of sites other than our five boxes, while the other person started checking the nest boxes, visiting each box every half hour and counting the bees there. We performed five trials of the experiment, each with a different swarm of bees and each with a different location for the excellent nest box. It should be noted that we did not change the location of the excellent nest box between trials by moving one excellent box around. Rather, we did so by leaving the five boxes in place and adjusting their volume settings. Thus, in each trial, a different box was given the 40-liter setting that made it the excellent option. The full results of the five trials of this experiment show for each trial how many scout bees were counted outside each nest box over the course of the trial. We can see that in all five trials, the swarm's scouts found all or nearly all five nest boxes, which means that each swarm had knowledge of most of the candidate sites. We can also see that in each trial the scouts did not find the nest boxes simultaneously, though they did find them all on the same day, and that they never found the excellent nest box first. For example, in trial one, scout bees were seen at the four mediocre nest boxes in the morning, but not at the excellent nest box until the afternoon. Furthermore, we can see that sometimes a substantial crowd of scout bees had formed at one or more of the mediocre boxes before even one scout had found the excellent box. In Trial 2, for example, the number of scouts outside the mediocre nest box 1 grew steadily between 11.30 a.m. and 2 p.m. and had reached more than five bees by the time the excellent nest box 2 was discovered shortly before 2 p.m. Given that the excellent nest box was never found first, and so always started out behind in the race to gain supporters, it is impressive that in four out of the five trials, one, two, three, and five, the excellent nest box eventually gained the most supporters and became the chosen site. So the five swarms did not achieve a perfect five-for-five five score in this choice test, but they did demonstrate impressive skill in decision-making. To see why this is so, consider the probability of getting the observed outcome purely by chance. If the swarms had chosen at random among the five nest boxes, then the probability that they would have chosen the best box in four out of five trials is vanishingly small, just 0 0.0064. In other words, one would expect to get the observed outcome of four correct choices and one incorrect choice simply by chance, only one time in 156 repetitions of the experiment. 
1 divided by 156 equals 0 0.0064. It is clear, therefore, that, compared to relying on chance, the democratic decision-making process found in a honeybee swarm greatly increases a swarm's likelihood of selecting for its future home the best of the candidate sites located by the intrepid scout bees. I often find it useful to ponder instances where the bees behave unexpectedly, asking myself, what is this surprise telling me? Trial four of the best of five choice test in which the swarm chose a mediocre site was a good eye-opener about how a swarm's knowledge of each prospective nest site is at first extremely fragile and easily lost. In the four other trials in which the swarms chose the best site, the counts of the scout bees suddenly changed in two ways after the excellent site was found. They rose rapidly at the excellent site, and they fell steadily at the mediocre sites. In trial four, however, neither change occurred following the discovery of the excellent site. Why not? For some reason, neither of the two scouts that discovered the excellent site ever produced a waggle dance to announce her discovery. It is puzzling that neither bee reported her find, because in trial two and trial three, the bees that found the nest box in this location, at the north end of the array, had produced waggle dances even though they had found only a mediocre fifteen-liter nest box there. It seems clear, therefore, that there was nothing wrong about the location per se. Whatever the cause of the puzzling, non-dancing by scouts from the excellent nest box in Trial 4, the consequence was clear. The swarm overlooked the best possible dwelling place on the island. Meanwhile, a slow build-up of scout bees persisted at one of the mediocre nest boxes, and eventually the swarm chose this second-rate nesting site. This anomalous outcome shows us how it is critically important to the success of a swarm's decision-making that when a scout discovers a prospective home site, she reports it so that it becomes one of the options debated on her swarm. In the next chapter, we will see that the bees have a nifty rule of house-hunting behavior that normally results in every respectable housing option found by a swarm's scout bees getting included in their debate. Good decisions require good information. Swarm Knows Best One might question whether the results of the experiment just described really show that honeybee swarms are good decision-makers. After all, to draw this conclusion from the best of N experiment, one has to assume that a 40-liter cavity with a 15-square-centimeter entrance is indeed a high-quality nest site, and that a 15-liter cavity with a 15-square-centimeter entrance is indeed a medium-quality nest site, so that in choosing the former over the latter, a swarm improves its ability to survive and reproduce. This seems to me to be a reasonable assumption, for why would honeybees have a preference for 40-liter cavities over 15-liter ones unless natural selection has favored having this preference? Certainly, studies of other animals, including various birds, reptiles, insects, and fish, have found that the nest site preferences of these animals enhance their reproductive success. In 2002, I decided to test my assumption that the housing choices of honeybee swarms really are good choices, ones that help colonies survive and reproduce. Regrettably, this test required an experiment in which many colonies would die, for I needed to compare the survival probabilities of colonies living in hives embodying what the bees do and do not prefer in a home. To do this, I installed artificial swarms in hives of two different sizes in the spring, then left them alone all summer and saw whether the two types of colonies differed in probability of surviving the following winter. As discussed in Chapter 2, most honeybee colonies living in nature starve during their first winter. Each swarm contained approximately 10,000 bees, a typical population size for natural swarms. For the two sizes of hives, I chose ones that held either five or fifteen of the rectangular wooden frames that hold the beeswax combs in a hive, because these are the numbers of frames needed to hold the amount of comb that bees will build inside a fifteen-liter or a forty-five-liter tree cavity. 
Natural swarms occupy empty tree cavities and must invest heavily in comb building. So, to give my artificial swarms the same challenge, I installed them in hives containing empty frames in which they had to build their combs. I did install a sheet of beeswax foundation in every other frame to induce the bees to build their combs neatly within the wooden frames. Each year that I have conducted this experiment, I have set up five colonies of each type in early June, then followed them for the next twelve months to see which ones would survive to the following spring. To date, I have performed three replicates of the experiment, in 2002 to 2003, 2003 to 2004, and 2004 to 2005, so I have followed the fates of thirty colonies. For colonies in the fifteen-frame hives, the probability of winter survival has been 0 0.73, eleven out of fifteen colonies. But for the colonies in the five-frame hives, this probability has been only 0 0.27, four out of fifteen colonies. The large difference in colony survival between the two treatments has only a tiny probability, p equals 0 0.02, of arising simply by chance. Almost certainly the colonies in larger hives survived better because they amassed larger stockpiles of honey to sustain them through winter. I can make this claim because I weighed each colony's hive at the start of the experiment in June and again in October after heavy frosts ended the bees foraging for the year, and I recorded widely different average weight gains for the two sizes of hive, 23 versus 10 kilograms, 51 versus 22 pounds, most of which is honey. Also, when I examined the combs of the colonies that died in this experiment, almost always I found them empty of honey. The poor bees starved. These stark statistics on colony survival as a function of hive roominess are solid evidence that swarms really do know best about their housing needs, and in exercising their nest site preferences they really do make good decisions. They also make clear why honey bee swarms go to so much trouble to find good homes. 6. Building a Consensus We deprecate division in our meetings and desire unanimity. It is in the unity of common fellowship, we believe, that we shall most surely learn the will of God. Society of Friends, Book of Discipline, 1934 A dissent-free decision. This is what normally arises from the democratic decision-making process used by house-hunting honeybees, and, quite frankly, I find it amazing. We have seen in the last two chapters how the debate among a swarm's scout bees starts with individuals proposing many potential nesting sites, vigorously advertising the competing proposals, and actively recruiting neutral individuals to the different camps. All this makes the surface of a swarm look at first like a riotous dance party. Yet out of this chaos, order gradually emerges. Ultimately, the debate ends with all the dancing bees indicating support for just one nesting site, usually the best one. Exactly how the scout bees achieve unanimity at the end of a protracted debate is the subject of this chapter. Consensus building is sometimes the basis of democratic decision-making in human groups, such as trial juries, Quaker meetings, and groups of friends. But it is not so common. What is common is for a human group to end a debate, election, or other democratic process with its members strongly divided in their preferences. At this point, the group must invoke some formal decision rule, for example, majority rule or a weighted voting system, to translate its split vote into a single choice. This kind of group decision-making has been called adversary democracy because it arises from a group of individuals who have conflicting interests and different preferences. In contrast, the group decision-making of swarm bees is unitary democracy since it involves individuals who have congruent interests, choose the best home site, and shared preferences, small entrance opening, etc. Thus, in looking closely at the inner workings of the unitary democracy of a honeybee swarm, 
we will be examining a democratic process that is intriguingly different from our all-too-familiar adversary democracy. Later in the book, in Chapter 10, I will discuss some practical lessons that we humans can learn from the bees for improving human group decision-making, especially when the members of a group have common interests, as do the bees in a swarm. The group solidarity with which a swarm's scout bees end their debate is critical to the success of the entire swarm. After all, a swarm contains just one queen, so when a swarm takes off to fly to its new home, it needs to do so as a single cohesive entity that travels to a single new home site. Split decisions are wasteful and can even be fatal. As we have seen with Lindauer's balcony swarm, if a swarm takes off with the scouts still strongly advertising multiple home sites, the swarm won't succeed in moving to any of the sites, hence it wastes time and energy. And if the swarm loses its queen during the aerial tug-of-war between the different parties of scout bees, then it pays the ultimate price of complete failure, for it is doomed without its queen. It seems of paramount importance, therefore, that a swarm's scouts reach an agreement on just one site among the many that have been found before the swarm launches itself into flight. A good way to begin to understand how the scout bees achieve unanimity is to re-examine the synoptic records of the scout bees' debates. Consider the debate of Swarm 3. It shows two striking phenomena that must be explained to understand how a swarm's scouts build a consensus. First, there is the curious way that the support for the winning site, Site G in the southwest, grew steadily and ultimately dominated the discussion. Between 1 and 3 p.m. on July 20th, only four out of the thirty, thirteen percent, dancing bees advertised Site G. But by 9 to 11 a.m. on July 21st, thirty-two out of the fifty-two, sixty-two percent, dancing bees advertised this site. And on the morning of July 22nd, shortly before the swarm departure, seventy-three out of the seventy-three, one hundred percent, dancing bees advertised Site G. Presumably, Site G was the best of the eleven sites considered by this swarm, since swarms generally choose the best of the candidate home sites under consideration. Chapter 5. So, our first critical puzzle about the bees' system of decision-making by consensus building is this. What causes the support of the scout bees for the best site to grow and grow throughout a debate? The second striking phenomenon is the way that the support for all the poorer sites eventually evaporated. We can see that sometimes the loss of support happened quickly, as in the case of Site A in the east, and sometimes it happened gradually, as with Site B in the south. But sooner or later, all the bees that performed dances for the poorer sites lost their enthusiasm for them and ceased advertising these sites. The attrition of support for the rejected sites can also be seen at the sites themselves. One study shows, for example, how in the Best of N experiment on Appledore Island, the counts of scout bees at all the nest boxes except the chosen one dropped essentially to zero by the end of each trial. So, our second critical puzzle about the bees' method of consensus building is this. What causes the support of the scout bees for the poorer sites to fade over the course of a debate? Lively versus Lackluster Dances We know that a swarm contains approximately 10,000 worker bees, and that a few hundred of these bees function as nest site scouts. We also know that a swarm's scouts locate a few dozen candidate nest sites that deserve to be advertised with waggle dances. Each candidate site is originally discovered by a single scout bee, the one who chances to find it while prospecting knot holes, crevices, and other dark places for a good nesting cavity. This means that only a few dozen scouts truly discover the sites that get debated during a swarm's decision-making. Most scouts learn about and become committed to a particular site by being recruited to it. Each of these recruits follows a dance advertising a site, flies out, locates the advertised site, and makes an independent evaluation. If the proposed residence satisfies her scrutiny, then she too will dance for it when she returns to the swarm. Given these facts about scout bees, 
We can view a swarm's democratic choice of its future domicile as a kind of election process in which there are multiple candidates, possible nest sites, competing advertisements, waggle dances for the different candidates, individuals who are committed to this or that candidate, scouts supporting a particular site, and a pool of individuals who are still neutral, scouts not yet committed to a site. The scouts supporting a site can produce dances that will convert neutral individuals into additional supporters for their site. Also, the scouts supporting any given site can become apathetic voters and rejoin the pool of neutral scouts. The whole decision-making process can be depicted schematically as a set of positive feedback loops of recruitment of neutral bees into supporters for the different sites along with leakage of some supporters back into the pool of neutral scouts. Looking at the Scout Bees debate in this way, it is clear that in order for the supporters of the highest quality site to be successful in ultimately dominating the debate, they must do the best job of gaining converts, presumably by showing the greatest zeal in advertising their site. Does this happen? More specifically, when an evangelizing scout bee advertises a potential nest site with a waggle dance, does she adjust the strength of her dance in relation to the absolute goodness of her site? If all the scouts do likewise, then the highest quality site should indeed receive the most compelling advertisements. The first evidence that this actually happens comes from observations made by Martin Lindauer in the summer of 1953. He set up an artificial swarm in the broad moorlands east of Munich, and there he also set out two empty wooden hives, 75 meters, about 250 feet, from the swarm. On the first day of this experiment, scouts from Lindauer's swarm quickly discovered his two hives sitting exposed in the windswept fields, and they performed rather sluggish dances advertising their two finds. Little by little there grew a small crowd of inquisitive scouts at each hive. By the end of the first day, Lindauer had labeled thirty dancers total for his two hives. On the second day Lindauer noticed an exceptionally lively dancer on the swarm cluster, a scout who turned out to be advertising a snug underground cavity located beneath a tree stump in the corner of a small woodlot. This site was thoroughly protected from the wind by thick bushes, had a 3 centimeter wide 1.2 inch diameter entrance opening and a 30 liter 27 quart cavity volume and was wonderfully dry inside despite heavy rains in recent days it was a perfect bee home lindauer normally killed all bees advertising rogue sites but on this day he wisely made an exception this excited bee was allowed to continue announcing her discovery within an hour other boisterous dancers were also indicating the natural nest site, and after another hour the scouts were dancing unanimously in favor of this site. It was the clear winner in this debate. The fact that the scout bee that discovered this first-class dwelling place announced her find with an eye-catching dance, even though she had not visited either of Lindauer's test hives, suggested to him that scouts are able to judge the absolute quality of a site through reference to an innate scale of nest site goodness. Also, the fact that this first dancer and her fellow advocates of the tree stump site danced more strongly than the bees advertising the two hive sites gave Lindauer an indication that a scout's dance provides information not only about a site's location, but also about its quality. He summarized his observations by reporting, the most lively dances indicate a nest site of the first quality. Second-rate homes are announced by lackluster dances. Representing Site Quality in Dance Strength Good decision-making by a honeybee swarm depends critically on the scouts adjusting dance strength in relation to site quality, so that scouts advocating higher-quality properties are better at attracting additional supporters. Nevertheless, it was not until the summer of 2007 that I looked closely at how nest site scouts provide information about site quality in their waggle dances. I had recognized for years that Lindauer had made only preliminary observations on this important subject, so I had long known that more convincing evidence was needed, but I had procrastinated. 
I left this gaping hole in the analysis open for so long because I had little doubt that what Lindauer had claimed was correct. Better sights elicit stronger dances. It was certainly consistent with what I had observed here and there. For example, I had often noticed how some scout bees perform longer and livelier dances than others. Also, from the best-of-five choice test conducted on Appledore Island, where I had seen scouts performing dances side by side for either a 40-liter or a 15-liter nest box, see Window on a Bee's Mind in Chapter 5, I had seen that the bees reporting on the better home site performed stronger dances. Furthermore, in previous studies by myself and others on how a honeybee colony wisely deploys its foragers among nectar sources, a group decision-making process that depends on a colony's foragers making graded advertisements of the various nectar sources, we had found that the richer the nectar source that a bee exploits, the greater the number of dance circuits she produces when she returns to the hive and advertises the source. In short, the richer the nectar source, the stronger the waggle dance. We had also figured out how a dancing bee adjusts the number of dance circuits that she produces in relation to nectar source richness. She does so by adjusting two aspects of her dancing, the rate of dance circuit production, R in dance circuits per second, and the duration of dance circuit production, D in seconds. The total number of dance circuits produced, C in dance circuits, in a dancing bee's advertisement is the product of the rate and duration of her dancing, C equals R times D. So, Richer nectar sources elicit livelier, higher R, and longer-lasting, greater D, dances than do poorer nectar sources. These findings about nectar source foragers matched perfectly with Lindauer's report that nest site scouts announced an inferior nesting place with a faint-hearted dance, while those from a superior nesting place solicited with a lively and long-lasting dance. By 2007, however, I had reached the point in my analysis of the bees' house-hunting process where I knew that I really needed to get solid, quantitative information about how the scouts code nest site quality in their dances. To accomplish this, we would need to work under the controlled conditions provided by Appledore Island. I say we because I teamed up with two collaborators on this project, Marielle Newsom, an undergraduate student at Cornell, and Kirk Vischer, a behavioral biologist from the University of California at Riverside. Marielle had done beekeeping with her father and was headed to graduate school at the University of Michigan to study insect behavior, so she was keen to help. Kirk is a longtime collaborator in various bee studies, going back to when we were both students at Harvard, and he has always been the best possible partner, intelligent, skilled, good-natured, and highly enthusiastic. Our plan called for positioning one artificial swarm in the center of Appledore Island and two nest boxes 250 meters, 820 feet, from the swarm, but only about 40 meters, 130 feet apart, so the swarm's scouts would be likely to find the two boxes more or less simultaneously. One box offered a high-quality, 40-liter, nesting cavity, while the other presented a medium-quality, 15-liter, one. For each of the first five to seven scout bees that appeared at each box, we would record with a data logger when she was at her nest box, and we would record with a video camera when she was at the swarm and how strongly she danced to advertise her site. Analysis of the video recordings in the evening would reveal exactly when each scout danced and how many dance circuits she produced. What made the execution of this experiment seem daunting at first was the fact that to examine the behavior patterns of individual scout bees, we would need each scout to be individually identifiable as soon as she was sighted at one or the other nest box. I expected this need would require us to laboriously prepare swarms in which each bee was labeled for individual identification. We certainly had no way to know in advance which of the thousands of bees in a swarm would first appear at our nest boxes, so we couldn't label in advance just the few first pioneering scout bees. Fortunately, Kirk had an ingenious solution to our scout bee ID problem. 
In a previous study, he had found that he could apply identifying paint marks to a scout bee during her visit to a nest box without distressing her. To do so, he placed a small insect net over the box's entrance after he saw a scout bee go inside to inspect the box's interior. Then, when the scout came out a minute or so later and flew into the net, he would gently pin her between folds of the coarse mesh netting material. Next, he applied paint marks to her thorax through the netting material, taking care to keep the paint from soiling her wings. Finally, he would release her near the nest box's entrance opening, hence right where she had been caught. Amazingly, scouts show no sign of being troubled by this bizarre experience, a genuine abduction by aliens, for immediately upon release they resume scrutinizing the nest box. Working on Appledore Island for most of the month of July, we performed seven trials of our experiment and succeeded in seeing how 41 and 37 scouts advertised the 40-liter and 15-liter nest boxes, respectively. The first thing we noticed in performing this experiment was that the scout bees reported on their sites for at most a few hours, and that an individual scout bee's report was often spread over several trips back to the swarm. These features of scout bee behavior can be seen in one study, which shows the records of the 11 scouts observed in the trial conducted on July 17, 2007. The first scout bee, labeled with a red dot, hence named Red, showed up at the 40-liter nest box at 9.33 a.m. Red then spent about 10 minutes examining the nest box inside and out, whereupon she flew back to the swarm and excitedly announced her discovery with a waggle dance that lasted for six minutes and comprised 162 dance circuits. She then flew off the swarm, was sighted again at the 40-liter nest box around 10 a.m., and then spent another 10 minutes there before returning to the swarm at 10.10 10 a.m., now Red spent about six minutes crawling across the surface of the swarm, but this time she did not perform a waggle dance. Indeed, even though she revisited the nest box again from 10.16 to 10.26, the only dance she ever performed was the one extremely enthusiastic and persistent dance containing 162 dance circuits during her first return to the swarm. Note, too, that Red even stopped visiting the nest box after about 10.30 a.m. So, curiously, within about an hour of discovering the 40-liter nest box and announcing her important find with an impassioned waggle dance, the scout, Red, had lost her enthusiasm to perform dances for and make visits to her high-quality nest site. How and why scout bees stop advertising and visiting a prospective home site will be discussed later in the chapter. For the rest of the morning, Red was seen hanging out at the swarm, sometimes crawling slowly about, but mostly sitting motionless, utterly indistinguishable from the vast majority of the swarm's quiescent members, except for her shining dot of bright red paint. Looking at the records of the other ten scout bees, we can see that Red's behavior was typical. Whether a bee visited the 40-liter high-quality nest box or the 15-liter medium-quality one, the pattern of her visits to her potential home site was basically the same. Each bee made an initial inspection of the box that lasted 5 to 35 minutes, then she flew back to the swarm and spent 5 to 30 minutes there, often announcing the site with a waggle dance, then she revisited the nest box for another 10 to 30 minutes, and then she returned again to the swarm for another 5 to 40 minutes, perhaps performing another waggle dance. Such shuttling between swarm and nest box usually went on for another hour or so, during which time the scout first lost her motivation to advertise the site, and later lost even her desire to visit the site. Our main finding from this work was that there was a strong difference between the scout bees from the high-quality 40-liter and the medium-quality 15-liter nest boxes in how zealously they advertised their sites, that is, in the total number of dance circuits a bee produced before she retired from active scouting duty. There was great variation among the bees of each group, but on average, the dance circuit total per bee was higher for scouts from the 40-liter box compared with those from the 15-liter box, 89 versus 29 dance circuits per bee. 
and it seems clear that these scout bees could tell whether their sight was high or medium in quality during the first visit to the site, for upon the first return to the swarm cluster, 76%, 31 out of 41, of the scouts from the 40-liter nest box advertised it with a dance, but only 43%, 16 out of 37, of the scouts from the 15-liter box did so. At first, we were surprised to find so much variation, noise, in the strength of the scout bees' reports on their sites, because the large scatter in the bees' reports for both the high-quality and the medium-quality sites created much overlap between the distributions of dance strength for these two sites. It is only on average that a higher-quality site elicits a dance with more circuits. On a bit of reflection, however, we realized that for the swarm as a whole, the reporting on each candidate site is spread over many bees. So, even though there is noisy individual reporting of site quality, there is clear swarm-level reporting of site quality. In other words, at the group level, there is a sharp difference in strength of advertising between alternatives that differ in quality. The superiority of swarm-level reporting relative to individual-level reporting is demonstrated as follows. If one takes one bee's report at random from each of two distributions and compares the number of dance circuits in these two reports, and then one does this over and over, one will find that the advertising of the 40-liter box is stronger than the advertising of the 15-liter box only about 80% of the time. This shows that a single scout from the better site does not always make a stronger report than a single scout from the poorer site. But if one takes six bees' reports at random from each of the two distributions, sums the dance circuits in these six reports, and compares the total number of dance circuits for the two groups of six bees, and then one does this over and over, one will find that the total advertising of the 40-liter box is greater than that of the 15-liter box, not 80% of the time, but 100% of the time. This shows that six bees from the better site will always make a stronger collective advertisement than will six bees from the poorer site. So, if a swarm finds itself in a choice between two acceptable candidate sites, like our 40-liter and 15-liter nest boxes, it is highly likely that the force of persuasion, the total number of dance circuits produced for a site, will be greater for the better site. The group-level reporting of information about nest site quality neatly solves the problem of noisy individual-level reporting of this information once there are multiple bees advertising each option. But at the start of the decision-making process, when the scout bees are just starting to discover, inspect, and report back on potential nest sites, there will be only a few bees reporting on each site. So, noise in the scout bee's reporting remains a serious problem at the outset. The potential for decision-making errors arising from individual-level noise in reporting on sites is especially great when each site is discovered. For if the scout that discovers a site fails to report on it with a waggle dance, the site won't be entered into the scout bee's debate. Indeed, it will be lost from the swarm's attention unless another scout happens to find and report the same site, which is most unlikely. A solution to this problem would be to have each scout bee that discovers a site likely to report on the site and thereby enter it into the debate. Marvelously, the bees appear to do exactly this. In our experiment, Marielle, Kirk, and I found that the two scout bees that first visited the two nest boxes in each trial almost always, with probability of 0 0.86, performed waggle dances upon return to the swarm, whereas the scouts that visited the same nest boxes subsequently, probably having been recruited to the boxes, were somewhat less likely to perform waggle dances, with probability of 0 0.55. We do not know what gave the initial scouts their especially strong motivation to dance. Perhaps it was each initial scout's experience of finding the site by herself, not having followed another scout's dance to find it, or of inspecting the site by herself. This discoverer-should-dance rule is not foolproof, however. As we have already seen in the best-of-five-choice test, in which swarms were presented with a five-alternative choice, 
one 40-liter nest box and four 15-liter nest boxes. One swarm failed to choose the best 40-liter option because two scout bees that discovered it independently both failed to report it with dances. Consequently, the swarm overlooked the excellent alternative and ended up occupying one of the mediocre ones. There is one more important feature of scout bee behavior that caught our attention in July 2007. Each of the marked scouts visited just one of our two nest boxes, even though the two boxes were only 40 meters, 130 feet, apart, a distance that a flying bee needs only 10 seconds to traverse. Such sight fidelity by the scouts is noteworthy because it provides further support for Lindauer's suspicion that when a scout bee evaluates a prospective home site, she makes an estimate of its absolute quality based on an innate, genetically specified scale of nest site goodness. In other words, she does not make an estimate of a site's relative quality by comparing it to other sites that she has visited. Because our swarms were prepared from colonies that had not recently swarmed, we could be sure that our bees had no prior experience as scouts before coming to Appledore Island. And because we did not see any of them visit more than one nest box on the island, we could be confident that they did not compare one site with the other. Nevertheless, those that visited the high-quality site danced more strongly than those that visited the medium-quality site. Evidently, a worker bee possesses both an innate knowledge of what constitutes an ideal home site and an innate ability to determine the absolute quality of the site that she has inspected. This is not a far-fetched claim. Various studies of worker honeybees have shown that when a flower-naive bee searches for flowers, she spontaneously prefers objects with complex shapes, certain colors, for example violet rather than green, and certain odors, floral rather than non-floral. This innate knowledge of floral cues naturally steers the novice forager's attention toward flowers. Finally, I should emphasize that almost certainly a scout bee does not consciously think through her evaluation of a site. Instead, she probably does so unconsciously, with her nervous system integrating various sensory inputs relating to cavity size, entrance height, and the like, and generating within her a sense of the site's overall goodness. It may be that finding a desirable tree cavity feels to a homeless scout bee as inherently pleasurable as feasting on a delicious meal does to a hungry human being. The Strong Grow Stronger one key to understanding why the scout bee's support for the best site grows and grows throughout a debate is that the supporters of the best site advertise it the most strongly. To be precise, the scout bees from the best site produce the greatest number of dance circuits per bee on average, as we have just seen. And this is true in nature, not just in experiments. Consider again the scout bee debate in which site G to the southwest prevailed, presumably because it was the best available site. Throughout the debate, the bees advertising site G produced the greatest number of dance circuits per bee. For example, between 3 and 5 p.m. on July 20th, when there was fierce competition among sites A, B, D, and G, the average numbers of dance circuits produced per scout bee for these four sites were 59, 29, 42, and 74. Likewise, the next morning, between 9 and 11 a.m., when the contest had narrowed to sites B and G, the average numbers of dance circuits produced per scout bee for these two sites were 16 and 42. Note, the bees danced only about half as strongly this morning relative to the previous afternoon, because the weather had deteriorated overnight. Indeed, a rainstorm started at the end of the morning. The bees always slow their house-hunting process in cool or stormy weather. Because the best site stimulates its supporters to dance the most strongly, its supporters have the highest per capita success in converting neutral scouts into additional supporters. And because these additional supporters will likewise have the greatest per capita success in attracting still more supporters, the differences in number of supporters among sites that differ in quality will grow exponentially. In principle, one group of supporters will eventually overwhelm all the others, 
which is precisely the pattern that we have seen in the swarm bees debates one study illustrates how this works for the basic situation of two competing sites that differ in quality the high quality site on the right which is more desirable by virtue of its smaller entrance opening stimulates its supporters to advertise it with ninety dance circuits on average as did our forty liter nest box the medium quality site on the left which has a larger entrance opening elicits thirty dance circuits on average from its supporters as did our fifteen liter nest box the two sites are discovered simultaneously each by just one scout at ten a m during the first three hours the two scouts produce ninety dance circuits and thirty dance circuits so the relative force of persuasion total amount of advertising for the two sites is three to one if we assume that eight neutral scouts are recruited to the two sites and in proportion to the level of advertising for each site then by one p m there will be six scouts supporting the high quality site and two supporting the medium quality one by one p m the two original scouts will have ceased advertising and visiting the sites now what happens over the next three hour period the six supporters of the high quality site will produce a total of five hundred forty dance circuits six bees times ninety dance circuits per bee while the two supporters of the medium quality site will produce a total of sixty dance circuits two bees times thirty dance circuits per bee thus the relative force of persuasion for the two sites becomes nine to one during this second three hour period if twenty neutral scouts are recruited to these sites more recruits now than before because there is more advertising and if they are recruited to the two sites in proportion to the amount of advertising for each then by four p m there will be eighteen scouts supporting the high quality site but still only two supporting the medium quality site so we can see that even though this debate started out with a one-to-one -one ratio of supporters for the two sites after three hours the ratio became three to one and after three more hours it reached nine to one we can also see that if the debate continues it won't be long before the high quality site achieves complete domination of the debate just as in nature a curious feature of the bees consensus building process is that the domination of the debate by one site's supporters can be driven entirely by differences in the per capita strength of advertising of the various sites one might suppose that building a consensus among the dancing bees would also require the neutral scout bees that are getting converted into supporters to pay attention to the different types of advertisements and ignore the weaker ones representing poorer sites but in fact the neutral scouts don't need to follow dances selectively in the example just given the neutral bees become supporters for the two sites strictly in proportion to the amount of dancing for the two sites it is as if a neutral scout simply strolls across the surface of the swarm follows the first dance that she encounters gets recruited to the site advertised by this dance and then becomes a supporter for this site although we don't know if this is exactly how a dance following scout b behaves we do have evidence that they do not selectively follow dances for certain sites but instead follow dances at random the evidence comes from an experiment conducted by kirk vischer and one of our mutual friends scott camazine a gifted physician nature photographer and fellow honeybee fanatic in december nineteen ninety five in the desert east of indio california where large trees are rare and so natural homes for honeybees are scarce kirk and scott set up artificial swarms one at a time and two nest boxes these boxes attracted the interest of the scout bees from their swarms kirk and scott then labeled for individual identification each scout that performed a dance for one of the nest boxes and they video recorded all instances of dancing and dance following throughout each swarm's decision-making process then they reviewed the recordings to see which of their labeled dancers eventually became dance followers for those that did they determined whether each bee selectively followed dances for the nest box that was not the one she had previously visited and advertised perhaps so she could do some comparison shopping remarkably they found that the dancers that became dance followers 
followed dances for the two nest boxes simply in proportion to the amount of dancing for the two boxes. Thus, these bees gave no sign of doing anything more sophisticated than following dances chosen at random. We see, therefore, that the debating scout bees appear to use a simple method to build an agreement. The better the potential home site, the stronger the dancing of the scout bees supporting it, and the greater their effectiveness in recruiting additional supporters for their place. The new supporters of each spot visit and evaluate it for themselves, thereby checking the claims of the previous advocates of the site and avoiding untested information being spread like a rumor, and then they likewise announce it with dances, weak or strong according to their evaluations of the place. Bit by bit, because the positive feedback, the recruitment of recruiters, is strongest for the best site, the supporters for this site increasingly dominate the discussion. Complete agreement requires, however, not only that the support for the best site steadily grows, but also that the support for the poorer sites gradually fades. We will turn now to seeing how the support for the losing sites melts away. The Expiration of Dissent for an agreement to emerge within a group that is debating multiple options, all of the group's members who start out supporting the losing options must eventually withdraw their support for these options and either switch their support to the winning option or quit the debate altogether. In short, the dissent must expire. We have seen that this happens in the dance debates among scout bees on honeybee swarms, such that every bee that starts out dancing for a rejected site eventually ceases doing so. But we've not seen exactly how this occurs. Back in the early 1950s, Lindauer wrestled with this important puzzle about the bee's consensus-building process, but he never quite solved it. He seemed to favor the idea that a scout bee ends her support, her dancing, for one site only when she learns about a superior site and shifts her dancing to it. He expressed this view as follows. Scout bees that could only find lesser nest sites easily change their votes in favor of a different nest site. Even if they dance for their nest site at first, they decrease their dancing bit by bit, become noticeably more interested in the lively dances of the other scout bees, and finally take off to seek out the other nest site. On their inspection visits, they can now draw a comparison between their own and the new nest site, and if the latter is really more suitable, from now on, they also dance for it on the swarm cluster. In this way, all the interest of the scout bees is concentrated bit by bit on the best of all the nest sites. There are two critical elements of this hypothesis for how scouts cease dancing for losing sites. A bee compares her old site with a new site, to which she was recruited by lively dances of other bees, and if she finds the new site superior, she converts to dancing for the new and better site. Thus, we can call this the compare and convert hypothesis for the expiration of descent. It is certainly a plausible hypothesis. It is, after all, how we humans usually resolve disagreements in a debate. The group's members propose various courses of action, individuals hear and compare the various proposals, and eventually the individuals who initially favored a losing proposal change their minds and convert to supporting the winning proposal. I suspect that Lindauer reasoned by analogy to consensus building by humans as he worked to understand how the scout bees reach an agreement, for he described the bees as not remaining stubborn about their first decision and letting their minds be changed. Even though Lindauer stressed the compare and convert hypothesis to explain the expiration of dissent among nest site scouts, he also reported some observations that weren't entirely consistent with this hypothesis. For example, he wrote, It is still not understood why those scout bees that had found an inferior nest site gave up dancing for the site over time, even when nothing changed about their nest site and they had not yet inspected any new housing possibilities. Clearly, he had seen instances in which a scout bee quit dancing for one site even before she knew about another site, hence before she could compare her old site against a new one. 
Indeed, in his magnum opus of 1955, Lindauer included a beautifully detailed record of one scout who quit dancing for one sight and then sat quietly on the swarm for nearly two hours before she began following dances that directed her to a second sight. This shows clearly that sometimes a scout bee will quit dancing for a sight without first comparing it to another sight. The two critical elements of this alternative hypothesis for how scouts cease dancing for losing sights are these. A bee does not compare her old sight with a new sight, and she does not convert to dancing for a new and better sight. Instead, she simply loses her motivation to dance for one sight, and then becomes quiescent, not even visiting her sight. Thus, we can call this the retire and rest hypothesis for the expiration of descent. Whenever you have two competing and mutually exclusive hypotheses to explain a single mystery, you can determine which one is false by identifying some phenomenon about which the two hypotheses make clearly different predictions. You then go out, observe the critical phenomenon, and see which hypothesis doesn't correctly predict what you have observed. You know immediately that this hypothesis is false. This strong inference procedure may sound esoteric, but it is something we all do all the time. For example, if the light doesn't go on in a room when you turn on the light switch, you wonder if the cause is, hypothesis 1, the bulb burned out, or, hypothesis 2, the power went out. If the former, then you predict that the lights will work in another room, but if the latter, then you predict that they won't. So, you check the lights in another room, and when you find out that they work, you know immediately that the power went out hypothesis is bogus. To distinguish between the compare and convert hypothesis and the retire and rest hypothesis for how the descent among the dancing scout bees expires, I made use of the fact that these two hypotheses make distinctly different predictions about when a scout will cease dancing for a losing sight relative to when she follows a dance for another sight. A critical prediction of the compare and convert hypothesis is that a scout will cease dancing for a losing sight only after she has followed a dance for another sight, and then located this sight and compared it to her current sight. In contrast, a critical prediction of the retire and rest hypothesis is that a scout will cease dancing for a losing sight even before she has followed a dance for another sight. Testing these two predictions was simply a matter of setting up swarms, one at a time, labeling with bright paint marks the first few bees that performed dances on each swarm, and then observing these labeled bees steadily whenever they were at the swarm to see when they danced and when they stopped dancing, and when, if ever, they followed the dances of other bees. I focused my attention on the first few dancers to appear on each swarm, because I knew, from eavesdropping on the scout bees' debates, that the early dancers tend to advertise losing sights. Since I needed to be able to observe all instances of my focal bees producing or following dances, I limited myself to labeling only a few, four to eight, scout bees on each swarm. This, in turn, meant that I needed to repeat the entire observation protocol on several swarms to get data on a sufficient number of bees. The work would be slow going, but this was fine by me. I knew that it would be both pleasurable and valuable to watch steadily my small company of brightly colored scout bees on a swarm, noting for each individual all her comings and goings, and all her dance producings and dance followings, until the swarm finished choosing its new home. Times spent outdoors closely observing bees always include the thrill of discovery. I watched thirty-seven scout bees in six swarms, which required a total of 66 hours of steady observation. As expected, most, 31 or 84 percent, of the scouts first advertised a site that was eventually rejected, and only a few, 6 or 16 percent, danced initially for the site that was ultimately chosen by their swarm to be its future home. Of the 31 bees that started out supporting a losing site, Twenty-seven ceased advertising their sites before the end of the swarm's decision-making, and the other four almost did so, 
for their dancing had become feeble by the time the swarm finished its decision-making. The key question, then, is how did the twenty-seven bees that quit supporting a losing sight do so? Did they stop dancing only after or even before they had followed dances for other sites? One study shows how three of these bees behaved on one swarm that chose a site in the south for its new home. We see that the first bee, Red, stopped dancing for a losing sight in the west on her second trip back to the swarm, and that she did so without first following a dance for another sight. Likewise, the second bee, Pink, stopped dancing for a losing sight in the southwest on her third trip back to the swarm, and she too did so without first following a dance for another sight. It was not until her fourth trip back to the swarm that she followed five circuits of a dance promoting a site to the west, and so possibly learned about an alternative site. Finally, the third bee, Orange, stopped dancing for a losing site in the east on her fifth trip back to the swarm, and just like Red and Pink, she did so without first following a dance for another site. So all three of these bees ceased their dancing before they followed a dance for another site. Their behavior was typical. Of the twenty-seven bees of interest, twenty-six, ninety-six percent, stopped dancing for their losing sites before they followed dances for other sites, and only one, four percent, stopped her dancing for a losing site after she had followed a dance for another site. The finding that only one out of the twenty-seven bees stopped her dancing for a losing sight after she had followed a dance for another sight indicates that the compare-and-convert hypothesis is incorrect, at least for the vast majority of scout bees. These results also increase our confidence that the retire-and-rest hypothesis is correct. So what caused the dancers for the losing sights to retire from advertising these sites? Clearly, most were not stimulated to do so by encountering a bee dancing extremely enthusiastically for another site, for most ceased producing dances before they followed any dances. One strong possibility is that the bees were driven to retire from advertising the losing sites by an internal neurophysiological process that causes every scout to gradually and automatically lose her motivation to dance for a site, even one that is high in quality. Such a process would foster consensus building among the scouts, for automatic fading of each bee's dancing would prevent the decision making from coming to a standstill with groups of unyielding dancers deadlocked over two or more sites. It might also help the dancers reach unanimity more quickly than they would otherwise, for endowing each bee with an automatic tendency to lose interest in any given site would make each bee a highly flexible participant in the decision-making process. One piece of evidence that strongly supports the idea that scout bees have an internally driven tendency to stop dancing for any given site is something I noticed about the 37 scout bees that I watched to test the compare and convert and the retire and rest hypotheses. Each bee reduced the strength of her dancing over consecutive trips back to the swarm. For example, in one study we see that for the bee red the decline in dance strength, number of dance circuits per trip to the swarm, was abrupt, 49, then zero. For the bees pink and orange, however, the declines in dance strength were more gradual, 74, 31, then zero, and 87, 60, 56, 10, then zero. Note, one can also note this consistent drop in dance strength in the dance records of the individual scouts. When I tabulated all instances for all 37 scout bees in which a bee made a series of returns to the swarm with dancing for a particular site followed by a return without dancing, I found that the bees had produced 51 such series. They varied in length from one trip back with dancing to six consecutive trips back with dancing. Then, I grouped the 51 series into six sets according to series length, and for each set I calculated the mean number of dance circuits in trip 1, in trip 2, and so forth. Finally, I compared the results for the six sets by aligning them with respect to the trip back when the Scout B did not dance. This revealed that, regardless of series length, 
there was a regular pattern of the scouts producing fewer and fewer dance circuits across a series of trips back to the swarm, and that the rate of decline in the number of dance circuits per trip did not differ markedly between bees producing long and short series. On average, there is a remarkably regular decline in the number of dance circuits produced per trip back to the swarm, and the rate of this decline is approximately 15 fewer dance circuits per trip. It is important to note that the same pattern of steady decay in dance strength is seen with all scout bees, both those advertising a chosen site, high in quality, and those advertising a rejected site, lower in quality. The only difference is that a bee that advertises a high quality site tends to start her reporting by performing a large number of dance circuits, whereas one that advertises a low quality site will tend to start her reporting with a smaller number of dance circuits. Because the rate of decay in dance strength per trip back to the swarm is the same for all scouts, a bee from a high-quality site will tend to advertise her site over many consecutive trips back to the swarm, and in some will produce a strong advertisement with many dance circuits, whereas a bee from a medium-quality site will tend to advertise for only a few consecutive trips back to the swarm, and in some will produce a weaker advertisement with fewer dance circuits. Consequently, a scout bee supporting a superb site relative to one supporting a poorer site will be both a longer and louder supporter of her site. And as we all know, in any contest for popular support, the side with the most persistent and most zealous supporters is the one most likely to prevail. It appears, therefore, that a swarm's scout bees do something sharply different from what humans do to reach a full agreement in a debate. Both bees and humans need a group's members to avoid stubbornly supporting their first view. But whereas we humans will usually, and sensibly, give up on a position only after we have learned of a better one, the bees will stop supporting a position automatically. After a shorter or longer time, each scout bee becomes silent and leaves the rest of the debate to a new set of bees. This regular turnover in which scouts are dancing can help a swarm's scouts quickly reach an agreement, for in this schematic depiction of consensus building on a swarm, all of the bees that were active dancers at 10 a.m. have retired by 1 p.m., and all those that were active dancers at 1 p.m. have retired by 4 p.m. There is, however, one important case in which human group decision-making operates in a manner similar to that of honeybee swarm house hunting. It is how scientists conduct their social decision-making on scientific theories. Many have noted that new and better ideas succeed in scientific debates through attrition, that is, by one generation of scientists retiring from their field and eventually dying off. But before this generation drops from the debate, the next generation of scientists will have listened carefully to the various arguments made by their predecessors, been persuaded by the most compelling claims on the truth, and adopted the new theory. Thus, the support for a new and better theory, for example, the sun-centered theory of Copernicus and Galileo, grows while it fades for an older and poorer one, for example, the earth-centered theory of Ptolemy. The most often quoted statement describing this social process is by Max Planck, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die, and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. One difference between aged scientists and aged scouts, though, is that the people tend to drop out of the debate reluctantly, sometimes not until death, whereas the bees do so automatically. I cannot help but wonder whether science would progress more rapidly if, in this regard, people behaved a bit more like bees. 7. Initiating the Move to New Home And so doth this soft shivering pass as a watchword from one to another until it comes to the inmost bees, whereby is caused a great hollowness in the pomegranate, when you see them do thus, then may you bid them farewell. 
for presently they begin to unknit and to be gone. Charles Butler, The Feminine Monarchy, 1609 Anyone who has the immense good fortune of watching a honey-bee colony cast a swarm will be treated to many astonishing displays of animal behavior. First there is the feverish rush of thousands of bees out of the hive and up into the sky. Minutes later the cloud of swirling, swarming bees mysteriously condenses into a tight crowd hanging from a tree branch, where for several hours or several days Nearly all the bees sit quietly, almost motionless. Only the swarm's scouts remain active, flying to and from the swarm cluster and performing their eye-catching dances on its surface to advertise candidate nest sites. Next, after one of these sites becomes the unanimous choice of all the dancing bees, comes the most wondrous sight of all. Suddenly, in about sixty seconds, the entire swarm cluster disintegrates and takes flight, filling the air with the roar of thousands of airborne bees. This flying mob immediately begins moving off in the direction of its chosen home, and in another minute or two it will have vanished. As Charles Butler expressed it so nicely back in 1609, you may now bid them farewell. In this chapter we will look at how an entire swarm of bees manages to leave its bivouac site together and at the right time. With few exceptions, a swarm's tightly synchronized takeoff occurs only after its scouts have finished their job of choosing the new dwelling place. This means that, as we review the mechanisms of social coordination during swarm departure, we will be seeing how a swarm maintains its coherence as it switches its mission from making a decision to implementing a decision. Probably it will be no surprise to learn that the scout bees are the rabble-rousers who initiate a swarm's journey to its new home, thereby extending their leading role in our story into the chapters on how swarms take action. But what will be surprising are the nifty signals the scouts use to animate their drowsy swarm mates and the way the scouts know when the time has come to initiate their swarm's journey. Indeed, until recently these were deep mysteries about the inner workings of honeybee swarms. Pre-Flight Warm-Up In the spring of 1980, Bernd Heinrich, a gifted insect physiologist at the University of California at Berkeley, now at the University of Vermont, turned his attention to the mechanisms of temperature regulation in honeybee swarms. Over the previous twenty years, Heinrich had pioneered the study of temperature control in insects, so he began his study of honeybee swarms with a great deal of background knowledge. He knew that two previous studies had reported that the temperature inside a swarm cluster like that inside a beehive, can be kept by the bees at about 35 degrees centigrade, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, nearly the same as the core body temperature of a human. He also knew that an individual worker honeybee can produce heat by shivering, isometrically contracting the two sets of flight muscles in her thorax, and that her flight muscles must be warmed to at least 35 degrees centigrade, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, to produce a sufficiently high wing beat frequency, nearly 250 beats per second, to generate the lift needed for bee flight. Furthermore, Heinrich knew that before leaving the parental nest, swarming honeybees stuff themselves with honey so that a swarm starts out with a sizable but finite supply of fuel for warming itself, for powering the scout bees' flights to and from the swarm, and for building the first beeswax combs in the swarm's new home. What he did not know were the exact pattern of temperatures inside a swarm cluster, how the bees control these temperatures, and how they manage their energy supply. Being a hobby beekeeper and curious about bees, Heinrich worked with the police and fire departments of Walnut Creek, California, as well as the Eco House Swarm Hotline of Walnut Creek, to collect 14 natural swarms in the San Francisco Bay Area during May and June. Back at his laboratory on the UC Berkeley campus, he studied these swarms using various scientific tools, 
including tiny electronic thermometers, thermocouple probes, and a special cylindrical chamber made of plexiglass, respirometry vessel, in which he could place a swarm to measure its metabolic rate at various ambient temperatures. Heinrich discovered many marvelous things about temperature regulation in honeybee swarms, all of which are key to understanding how a swarm prepares to fly to its new home. First, he found that a swarm does indeed precisely control the temperature of the cluster's core so that it stays at 34 to 36 degrees centigrade, 93 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit, regardless of the ambient temperature. He also found that a swarm allows the temperature of the cluster's mantle, outer layer, to vary with the ambient temperature, but that it keeps the mantle temperature above 17 degrees centigrade, 63 degrees Fahrenheit, even if the ambient temperature falls to freezing, 0 degrees centigrade or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. This means that the outermost bees, which are the coolest, keep themselves warm enough to stay active on the swarm. If they were to cool below 15 degrees centigrade, 59 degrees Fahrenheit, they would enter chill torpor and easily fall from the swarm. They would also be too cold to warm themselves back up by shivering. When Heinrich looked at how the bees achieve their characteristic pattern of temperatures in a swarm, he found that they do so without expending much of their onboard energy supply, that is, the honey in their stomachs. At air temperatures above about 10 degrees centigrade, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the resting metabolism of a swarm, the metabolism that occurs when the flight muscles of the swarm bees are not being activated, provides more than enough heat to keep a swarm's core at 35 degrees centigrade and its mantle above 17 degrees centigrade. Indeed, at high ambient temperatures, above about 20 degrees centigrade or 76 degrees Fahrenheit, the resting metabolism produces so much heat that both the mantle bees and the core bees spread themselves out, creating ventilation channels to release excess heat from the core. But when the ambient temperature falls below 17 degrees centigrade and the mantle bees start to feel too cool, they crowd inward, causing the swarm cluster to shrink, its porosity to decrease, and its heat loss to diminish. In this way, the mantle bees skillfully trap inside the swarm cluster the metabolic heat generated by the thousands of resting immobile bees, and they also keep themselves sufficiently warm. It is only when the air temperature falls below about 10 degrees centigrade, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, that the mantle bees must take the extra step of raising their metabolic rate by shivering. Thus, Heinrich discovered that the bees in a honeybee swarm have an effective means of conserving their energy reserves. The mantle bees, those most exposed to low temperatures, minimize their need for active metabolism by doing two things when the air becomes cool. One, letting their body temperatures drop to just above the chill torpor temperature rather than working to maintain a higher body temperature, and two, keeping their body temperatures above the chill torpor temperature mainly by huddling rather than shivering. Of course, these energy conservation measures mean that most of the time the outermost bees in a swarm are too cold to fly, something that is easily demonstrated by skimming a spoonful of mantle bees from a swarm and shaking them into the air. The bees tumble to the ground rather than fly away. So, before a swarm can take off to fly to its new home, the cool bees in the mantle must warm their flight muscles to the flight-ready temperature of 35 degrees centigrade. And not just in theory. When Heinrich made continuous recordings of the temperatures at various locations in a swarm cluster from when the bees settled to when they departed, he found that during the last hour or so before takeoff, the temperature in the mantle did indeed rise to match the 35 degrees centigrade of the core. In June 2002, some 20 years after Bernd Heinrich published his insightful report on The Mechanisms and Energetics of Honeybee Swarm Temperature Regulation, I traveled to Germany to look more closely at the pre-flight warm-up of swarm bees. Shortly before, I had the great good fortune of receiving a research prize from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, 
which gave me the wherewithal to conduct research projects in Germany. I was hosted by my teacher and friend, Bert Holdobler, who had become the director of the Institute for Behavioral Physiology and Sociobiology at the University of Würzburg. This institute includes a laboratory devoted to research on honeybees. It was started by Martin Lindauer when he was a professor of zoology at Würzburg, 1973-1987, and is now directed by another good friend, Jürgen Tautz. Jürgen is highly skilled at studying the sensory abilities of insects, and his laboratory is stocked with much state-of-the-art scientific equipment for probing the workings of nature. On this trip, I was keen to collaborate with Jürgen to use one particularly powerful instrument, an infrared video camera. With it, one can measure the temperatures of many objects, such as bees, simultaneously and without disturbing them. Also in Jürgen's laboratory were two superb graduate students, Marco Kleinheitz and Brigitte Buyok, both experts in using the video camera and the computer software that converts the camera's images into accurate temperature readings. The goal of our four-person team was simple. Explore how the mantle bees in a honeybee swarm warm their flight muscles prior to takeoff. The plan of using video thermography to see how the outermost bees prepare for takeoff worked nicely. Over a two-week period, we recorded the temperatures of mantle bees within a 10 by 10 centimeter, 4 by 4 inch area on two swarms, starting when each swarm formed its cluster and continuing until it launched into flight. Both swarms showed the familiar set of events shortly before takeoff. The scouts became unanimous in their dancing, and the non-scouts began to move excitedly. Both swarms also revealed something new in the images recorded with the infrared video camera. The thoraces of all the bees on the swarm's surface began to glow with unusual warmth just moments before the swarm's explosive takeoff. The finding that most captured our attention was the way that the percentage of bees with a thoracic temperature of at least 35 degrees centigrade rose exponentially over the final half hour before takeoff. For the first 20 minutes, the percentage of the surface layer bees with thoraces warmed sufficiently for flight rose slowly and remained below 20 percent. Then, starting about 10 minutes before takeoff, the percentage of hot bees began to rise faster and faster. Soon, 100 percent of the surface layer bees had a thoracic temperature of at least 35 degrees centigrade, and at exactly this moment, the swarm bees took wing. We are confident that at the start of a swarm's takeoff, all of the bees in the cluster, not just the outermost ones, are hot enough for rapid flight. After all, Heinrich's work had shown that the bees in a swarm cluster's core are warm enough for flight at all times. Also, the images from our infrared video camera showed that as our two swarms approached the moment of takeoff, the interior bees began to shine brightly before the surface bees did, looking like hot coals glowing beneath a layer of cool ashes. There is also the fact that immediately after both takeoffs had started, that is, when the outermost bees had taken flight, the inner bees began to take flight. Indeed, it is because there is so little delay between outer and inner bees taking flight that a swarm cluster needs only about 60 seconds to disintegrate. What stimulated the mantle bees to warm up, and how was it that each swarm's takeoff began just seconds after all of the surface layer bees had warmed their flight muscles to at least 35 degrees centigrade? In other words, what stimulated the bees to prime themselves for flight, and what finally triggered them to take flight? We will now probe these two mysteries. Piping Hot Bees If you listen closely to a swarm by carefully placing an ear beside the massed bees, you will hear pulses of a distinctive, high-pitched piping sound starting about an hour before the swarm flies off to its new home. Each sound pulse lasts about a second, and because its pitch sweeps upward, it resembles the rising engine whine of a Formula One race car making a quick acceleration. 
at first one hears these shrill piping sounds only occasionally because just one bee at a time is producing them but over the last half hour before takeoff more and more bees start piping and the pulsing hum radiating from the swarm rises to a crescendo when it does the swarm cluster breaks up and all the bees take wing could this high-pitched piping be a signal from the scout bees to their quiet swarm mates with the message ladies warm your flight muscles to begin to explore this possibility i wanted to identify which bees in the swarm cluster were producing the high-pitched piping sounds actually this was a long-standing goal I had first heard these mysterious sounds way back when I began studying swarms as a graduate student in the 1970s, but I could never pinpoint which particular bees among the thousands in a swarm were their source. Finding the piping bees was especially difficult because the pulsing hum seemed to emanate from inside the swarm cluster, thus from bees out of sight. The piping bees also stymied Martin Lindauer in the 1950s, for he wrote, Now a hundredfold high humming could be heard at the cluster, but I could not definitely find out whether this comes from the buzz runners or from other bees. The buzz runners mentioned by Lindauer will be discussed later in this chapter. The discovery of who does the piping came serendipitously in the summer of 1999. It started with a chance observation I made at my camp beside Ox Cove in easternmost Maine, the wonderfully secluded site to which I had retreated to figure out how the descent among dancing scout bees expires. See chapter 6. I can still remember as if it were yesterday, witnessing for the first time a worker piping on a swarm. I had set up a swarm outside my cabin, labeled with paint dots the first few dancers, scouts, on the swarm, and was watching steadily my little band of brightly painted bees, recording their behaviors. On August 2nd, at 10.48 a.m., just five minutes before the swarm flew away, my attention was drawn to the scout bee, Blue, who did something unexpected on the swarm's surface she ran excitedly over other bees for a few seconds then paused for about a second pressed her thorax against a stationary bee and then ran on repeating the sequence of run pause press six times before she burrowed into the cluster and disappeared i noticed that each time my bee blue paused and grabbed another bee she drew her wings tightly together over her abdomen and then her wings seemed to vibrate slightly. Was Blue producing the piping sound? I could hear the sound, but with just my naked ears I could not be sure the sound came from her. So that afternoon I drove to Morgan's garage in the nearby village of Pembroke and bought a three-foot length of rubber vacuum hose about six millimeters, one-quarter of an inch, in diameter, a size that would fit snugly in my ear. This simple sound tube would enable me to localize the source of sounds coming from my swarms, for it would function like a primitive stethoscope, conducting to my ear only sounds produced near its open end. A few days later, when I watched a second swarm and used my rubber hose to listen in on another painted scout bee doing the run-pause-press maneuver, I was thrilled to hear the perky piping sound. I was fascinated by the sights and sounds of the piping worker bees, and was keen to describe their signal in detail and to test the idea that they are alerting the quiescent members of the swarm to warm their flight muscles for takeoff. This would require a sophisticated sound analysis combined with careful observations and experiments. Fortunately, Jurgen Tauts was easily persuaded to join in the venture, and in August 2000, he joined me at Cornell, bringing with him from Germany the miniature microphones and digital audio and video equipment that we would need for the project. Soon we had a swarm set up in a quiet spot at my laboratory, with the swarm clustered on one side of a vertical board, so that we could easily monitor everything that happened on the swarm's surface. Inside the swarm we mounted two microphones and several temperature probes, and directly in front of the swarm, 
we positioned a video camera that recorded both the bee's sounds from the swarm's interior and the bee's actions on its surface. With numerous microphone and thermometer wires leading from it, a video camera continuously recording its activity, and two biologists hovering over it, our swarm looked rather like a patient in an intensive care unit. Because I now had a search image for a piping bee, one dashing over the swarm's surface but pausing frequently to seize a motionless swarm mate, I was able to spot pipers at a glance when we started hearing their shrill piping sounds. From our video recordings, Jürgen and I quickly confirmed my previous observation that the piping bees are exceptionally excited scout bees. The bees made this crystal clear by switching between worker piping and waggle dancing while scrambling over the surface of the swarm. This mixing of signals became especially noticeable during the last half hour before takeoff when the piping grew strongest. How the scouts know when to start piping will be explained later in this chapter. We saw then that after a scout bee had finished a bout of waggle dancing, she was very likely to start producing a string of piping signals. From our audio recordings of pipers sounding off near one of the microphones, we learned that each pipe is a single pulse of sound that lasts about one second and is composed of a fundamental frequency of 200 to 250 hertz cycles per second, plus many harmonics, multiples of the fundamental frequency in the range of 400 to 2000 hertz. It is these high-frequency harmonics that make each pipe sound so shrill. That the fundamental frequency of the piping sound matches the wing-beat frequency of a flying bee is strong evidence that a bee produces this sound by activating the flight muscles in her thorax to create strong vibrations in her body. Probably most of this vibration energy passes as a sharp blast into the bee that the piper has grabbed hold of and pressed against, but some passes into the surrounding air, creating the sounds that humans can hear while eavesdropping on a swarm. Jürgen and I also learned from our sound recordings that the upward sweep in the pitch of each pipe is produced by a shift in the fundamental frequency from 200 to about 250 hertz and an increase in the amount of sound energy in the high-frequency harmonics. Probably a piper creates these changes by pulling her wings together, thereby stiffening her thorax and raising its resonant frequency. At this point, Jürgen and I wanted to test the hypothesis that the function of worker piping in swarms is to stimulate bees to prepare for takeoff. Our first step was a check that worker piping really occurs only in the last hour or so before takeoff, when the bees in a swarm are making their flight preparations. We did this by measuring simultaneously the level of piping in a swarm and the temperatures in the swarm's core and mantle for many hours prior to takeoff. Here is an example of the patterns in piping and warming that we found. Three hours before takeoff, 11.30 a.m., when the ambient temperature was 23 degrees centigrade, 73 degrees Fahrenheit, and the swarm's core and mantle temperatures were 34 and 31 degrees centigrade, 93 and 87 degrees Fahrenheit, we heard no piping. Then, about 90 minutes before takeoff, we began to hear piping, but only intermittently. Finally, during the half hour before takeoff, the sound of the piping bees was continuous and loud, for by then multiple bees were piping simultaneously. At the same time, the mantle temperature began rising, and just when the temperature throughout the clustered swarm reached 37 degrees centigrade, 99 degrees Fahrenheit, it launched into flight. The finding that worker piping coincides perfectly with swarm warming, both phenomena build to a climax at takeoff, provided strong support for the hypothesis that this signal functions to stimulate bees to prepare for takeoff. However, because we had shown only a correlation between worker piping and swarm warming, and because a correlation does not demonstrate causation, we could not firmly conclude that a swarm's warming is a response to the scout's piping. The possibility remained that the piping had not elicited the warming, 
and that there was some third factor that had stimulated both piping and warming. It has been suggested, for example, that what informs the cool and quiescent bees in a swarm that it is time to warm themselves for takeoff is another signal, called the shaking or vibration signal. To produce this signal, one bee seizes another with her two front legs and then violently shakes her own body in an unmistakable up-and-down movement for a second or two. Like a person rousing a drowsy friend with a firm shake on the shoulder, the shaking bee incites her fellow swarm bee to greater activity. But because shaking signals are produced throughout the house-hunting process, not solely or even principally in the last hour before takeoff, it seems clear that the shaking signal is not the critical signal used by the scouts to prepare the swarm for flight. Evidently, the shaking signal serves instead to raise the general level of activity of other workers in the swarm, so that they are more alert and responsive to waggle dances, worker pipings, and other stimuli. At night and during times of poor weather, all the bees in a swarm will become inactive, probably to conserve energy, so it makes sense that the scout bees have the shaking signal to stimulate the general reactivation of others, mainly other scouts, I suspect, when conditions again become favorable for house hunting. To test more conclusively our hypothesis that piping is the flight preparation signal, Jürgen and I needed to perform an experiment in which we would manipulate the piping signals in a swarm and look for an effect on its warming. In principle, the manipulation could consist of either artificially blasting swarm bees with the piping signal, or artificially blocking them from receiving this signal. We took the latter approach. To prevent piping workers from contacting a group of bees in the swarm mantle, we mounted a 25 by 20 centimeter, 10 by 8 inch, screen vertically over a swarm surface so that the outer layers of bees in the swarm cluster were on the outer side of the screen. On this side of the screen we had mounted two small cages, each of which was equipped with a temperature probe. Both cages soon became filled with mantle bees. We prevented the scouts from contacting, hence sending piping signals to, the bees inside one of the cages, by closing it with a screen cover when we started hearing bees piping. Simultaneously, we treated the bees inside the other cage in exactly the same way, except that we closed their cage with a cover that had a large opening through which pipers could pass. Given our hypothesis that piping bees stimulate bees to warm up for takeoff, we predicted that the mantle bees in the closed cage would not warm themselves to a flight-ready temperature at the time of takeoff, whereas those in the open cage would do so. This is precisely what we found. The open cage bees showed the usual pattern of a dramatic rise to approximately 35 degrees centigrade, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, in the final minutes before takeoff, but the closed cage bees did not. For fun, at the end of each trial, after all the uncaged and open-caged swarm bees had departed, we removed the cover of the closed cage and prodded the bees inside who were eerily calm. All tumbled to the ground, too cold to fly. Without a doubt, these caged bees had missed the scout bees' persistent alerts to warm up for takeoff. Boisterous Buzz Runners the investigation of the piping signal solved the mystery of how the scout bees prime their swarm mates for flying to their new home, but it left unsolved the puzzle of what finally triggers the highly synchronized, virtually explosive takeoff of the thousands of bees in a swarm. A strong possibility was an eye-catching behavior that Martin Lindauer, who first described it, named the Schwirlauf. English-speaking bee biologists call this behavior the buzz run. It is well named in both German and English because a buzz running bee runs across the swarm cluster, turning this way and that, usually with her outspread wings whirring and buzzing noisily. Sometimes she is dashing over the backs of the immobile bees, and other times she is bulldozing between them. Lindauer reported that buzz runners are prominent on the swarm cluster in the final few minutes before takeoff starts and he suggested that by barging and boring through the cluster, 
the buzz runners disperse the interconnected bees and so initiate their concerted takeoff. This was an enchanting hypothesis, but it remained to be tested. And even if it proved correct, many questions would remain about the hyperactive buzz runners. What is the interplay between worker piping and buzz running as a swarm prepares for and then takes to flight? Which bees in a swarm perform buzz runs? And how do buzz runners know when to produce their rough signal? In tackling these questions, I was joined by Claire Richoff, a Cornell undergraduate student who turned out to be a born researcher. We began our investigation of the case of the buzz runner bees in May 2005, as soon as Claire had finished the final exams in her spring semester classes. We started with a stakeout for buzz runners on swarms to find out when they conduct their activities. To do this, we mounted a swarm of bees on one side of a vertical wooden board and video recorded the activities of the bees within a 10 by 15 centimeter, 4 by 6 inch region of the swarm's surface. We started each round of surveillance when the swarm bees began to produce piping signals and ended it when the bees flew off to their chosen home. Claire would play back the recordings in slow motion, scanning them for bees running erratically over the swarm's surface. My studies of worker piping led us to expect that some of the running bees would be pipers, and Lindauer's report indicated that others would be buzz runners. To know whether or not any given runner was a piper, we followed each one for several seconds with a small microphone, to pick up any piping sounds she might be producing, and added this audio information to the video recording. Buzz runners were easily identified among the running bees by the conspicuous buzzing of their outspread wings. Claire's painstaking examinations of our surveillance records yielded two important findings. First, she saw that more and more runners went into action during the final hour preceding takeoff, so that just before its takeoff a swarm teams with bees dashing over and through the cluster. Second, and more remarkably, she saw that all of the runners produced audible signals, pipes or buzzes or both. At first the running bees produced just piping signals. But little by little they started to combine piping with buzz running, ramming into other bees and revving their wings, and during the final five minutes before takeoff, more than 80% of the running bees produced buzz runs. This told us that the buzz runners are the same bees as the pipers who we already knew to be scout bees. Thus we learned that the scout bees give both the piping signal to prime the swarm for takeoff and the buzz run signal to trigger, evidently, the takeoff. What is the evidence that the buzz run signal stimulates bees to take flight? First, there is the fact that the buzz run is an ephemeral signal that is seen in just one context, when idle bees are being stimulated to take flight. So we see buzz runners briefly just before a swarm pours forth from its hive, as described in Chapter 2, and again just before it takes wing from its bivouac site. There is also the fact that buzz run production rises to a crescendo moments before swarm takeoff, suggesting that the former causes the latter. And, perhaps most telling, there is what Claire found when she reviewed the video recordings of many episodes of a buzz runner blasting through a knot of lethargic bees. She found that they were more dispersed and more active after they had experienced the buzz runner's forceful persuasion than before. One feature of a buzz runner's behavior that should be noted is that sometimes she will launch herself into flight, fly around the swarm cluster for a few seconds, and then land back on the cluster and resume her buzz running. The phenomenon of buzz runners taking flight is important because it points to the evolutionary origins of their lively signaling behavior. Almost certainly the buzz run signal is a ritualized form of a bee's takeoff behavior, which consists of a bee spreading her wings, starting to buzz them, pushing clear of other bees if need be, and finally taking to the air. 
ritualization is the name biologists have given to the process whereby some incidental action of an animal becomes modified over evolutionary time into an intentional signal usually the incidental action is a byproduct of an activity performed in one particular context so the animal's action is a reliable indicator of this context the buzz run illustrates this idea nicely when a bee is about to take flight she inevitably buzzes her wings so wing buzzing by a bee is a reliable indicator to others that she is about to take flight the next step in a signal's evolution is for the receivers to detect it and use the information it provides to improve their decision making if the receiver's improved decision making also benefits the senders then the senders will benefit by making the signal more conspicuous and so more easily detected by the receivers in the early stages of the evolution of the buzz run signal the quiescent bees in a swarm probably improved their decision making about when to take flight by responding to the wing buzzing of other bees taking off the improved decision making by the quiet bees probably produced better coordinated takeoffs which also benefited the active bees so natural selection favored modifications of the wing buzzing by the active bees to make it more conspicuous to the quiet bees given the present-day form of the buzz run it appears that these modifications include exaggerating the wing buzzing starting it long before the moment the buzz runner takes flight and adding to it the actions of running and ramming i think the buzz run shows nicely how sometimes we can glimpse the evolutionary origins of the marvelous signals that bind bee to bee to bee in a swarm one final question regarding the buzz run is why did honeybee swarms evolve this signaling system in other words why should the scout bees send everyone else in the swarm a signal of when to launch into flight I suggest that this signaling system evolved because it is only the peripatetic scout bees that can sense when all the bees in the swarm cluster are ready for departure, and the buzz run signal enables the scouts to share this critical information with their swarm mates. As we have seen, for all the bees in a swarm to launch into flight together, each bee must have her thorax warmed to at least 35 degrees centigrade, 97 degrees Fahrenheit but how can all the bees in a swarm know when they've all become hot enough one way would be to have some bees travel across the swarm cluster with each one measuring the temperatures of her swarm mates along the way and then sounding a departure alarm when her canvassing tells her that the required warmth has been achieved by all i suspect that this is how it works on swarms for we now know that the scout bees move quickly throughout the swarm cluster with each scout pausing every few seconds to press her thorax against another bee and produce the piping signal perhaps each time a scout presses against another bee she also senses her temperature and we now know that it is the scout bees that strongly produce the buzz run signal in the final few minutes before takeoff when all the bees have the high body temperature required for departure if the hypothesis of scout bees as mobile temperature sensors information integrators and group activators proves correct then the mechanisms mediating the initiation of takeoffs by honeybee swarms present us with an intriguing system of behavioral control within a large group it is one in which a small minority of individuals actively pull the group to collect information about its global state and then when the group reaches a critical state these individuals produce a signal that triggers an appropriate action by the whole group the governance of a honeybee swarm is proving ever more extraordinary consensus or quorum we know that a swarm starts to switch from making a decision about its future home to implementing this decision when its scout bees start to produce the piping signals that inform the non-scout bees that the time has come to warm up their flight muscles so far so good but how do the scout bees know when to start producing their piping signals given the striking way that the dances on a swarm come to represent one site and then the swarm moves to this site 
It is tempting to think that the scouts used the appearance of dancer consensus to know when to start piping, rather like Quakers discuss and wait to find common ground and then, recognizing they have reached a sense of the meeting, know when to take action. By this hypothesis, a scout votes in favor of a site by dancing for it. The scouts act and interact, as we have seen in Chapter 6, so that gradually their votes come into agreement in favor of a superior site, and somehow the voting pattern of the scouts is steadily monitored so that they know when they've reached an agreement and can start acting on their decision. There were, however, two facts that cast doubt on this appealing hypothesis. First, neither Lindauer nor I nor anyone else had seen any sign of scout bees polling their fellow dancers, something that surely they would need to do to sense a consensus. Second, Lindauer had seen two out of the nineteen swarms that he studied launch into flight without a consensus among the dancers, that is, when there were two strong coalitions of dancers advertising two distinct sites, for example, his balcony swarm. Were these cases of takeoff with dancer disagreement bizarre anomalies that should be ignored, or were they valuable clues that should be heeded? I chose to heed them, and did so in a series of collaborative studies with my good friend and former student Kirk Vischer, who shares my passion for figuring out how honeybee colonies work. I first met Kirk in the fall of 1976 when he enrolled in the Biology of Social Insects class I was teaching at Harvard. We clicked right away. Here was someone who was already extremely knowledgeable about honeybees from years of beekeeping with his father, someone with a powerful intellect, someone with a modest sense of self, a quick smile, and a love of biology. I was to learn later that Kirk is also a fabulous gadgeteer, expert statistician, and computer whiz, all things that I'm not. Today Kirk is on the faculty of the University of California at Riverside. Even though Kirk and I now live on opposite sides of the North American continent, we teamed up because both of us had long wondered whether the scouts on a honeybee swarm know when to start their piping by sensing a quorum, sufficient number of scouts, at one of the nest sites, rather than by sensing a consensus, agreement of dancing scouts, at the swarm cluster. By the quorum-sensing hypothesis, a scout votes for a site by spending time at it, the number of scouts rises faster at better sites, and somehow the bees at each site monitor their numbers there so that they know whether they've reached the threshold number, quorum, and can proceed to initiating the swarm's move to this site. This hypothesis can explain the cases of take-off with disagreement among dancers as instances where a quorum was reached at one site before the competition between dancers from different sites had eliminated the dancing for all but one site. We tested these two hypotheses with experiments performed on Appledore Island. In our first experiment, we presented four swarms, one at a time, with two identical nest boxes that offered the bees two superb nest sites. Our goal was to foster strong debates on our swarms and then see if they would take off before their dancing bees had reached a consensus, as Lindauer had reported for two of his swarms. In each trial, we positioned the swarm at the island's center on a porch of the old Coast Guard building, and we placed both nest boxes near the rocky shore, each 250 meters, 820 feet, from the swarm, but in different directions, to the northeast and to the southeast. We also wanted to census the scout bees inside and outside each nest box, so each box was mounted against a window on the side of a light-proof hut. The plan worked. We found that our swarms would discover both nest boxes at about the same time, would tend to develop a balanced debate over these two highly attractive sites, and would routinely take off when scout bees were still dancing strongly for both sites. Most telling was the spectacle that we witnessed on July 7, 2002. At 12.04 p.m., when both nest boxes were being advertised by dozens of bees performing vigorous dances, 
Our swarm took off, and then the large cloud of swarm bees split itself in two. Separate groups of airborne bees gathered on the north and south sides of the Coast Guard building, and at 12.09 each group began to move off slowly in the direction of its nest box. Both groups, however, traveled only about 40 meters, 130 feet, toward their nest box before stopping, and at 12.15, when we noticed that the swarm's queen was back on the porch of the Coast Guard building, both groups started to return there and resettle around her. This first experiment showed us that consensus among dancers is not necessary for a swarm to initiate its move to a new home. Hence, we could reject the consensus-sensing hypothesis for how scouts know when to start piping. This experiment also provided some support for the quorum-sensing hypothesis, because we noticed that swarms consistently started preparing for flight, that is, their scouts started piping, once twenty to thirty or more bees were seen together at one of the nest boxes, usually with about ten to fifteen bees inside and ten to fifteen outside. This suggested that in the decision-making system of honeybee swarms, twenty to thirty bees present simultaneously at one of the potential nest sites is a quorum. It should be noted, however, that because scout bees spend much of their time at the swarm cluster, seeing some twenty-five bees at a prospective nest site at any one time means that the total number of bees making visits to and thereby expressing support for this site is about fifty to one hundred bees. In performing our second experiment on Appledore Island in June and July 2003, we sought to make a direct test of the quorum-sensing hypothesis for how scouts know when to start producing their piping signals. Our plan was to test a critical prediction of this hypothesis, delaying the formation of a quorum of scout bees at a swarm's chosen nest site, while leaving the rest of the decision-making process undisturbed, should delay the start of piping and thus the take-off of the swarm. This was a critical prediction of the hypothesis, because if we found that this prediction was wrong, then we would have dealt a death blow to the hypothesis of quorum sensing. Kirk and I devised a simple but effective way to delay quorum formation. We placed five desirable nest boxes close together at one location on the island. This caused the scouts visiting the site to be dispersed among five identical nest cavities rather than concentrated at one. We then saw how long it took a swarm, once it had discovered the site of the nest boxes, to start piping and eventually take off to fly to the site. We also performed with each swarm another control trial with just one nest box. The two trials for each swarm were performed using two different sites on the island, so each trial began in the same way, with one scout bee discovering an attractive nest box in a new site. In all four swarms that we tested, the scouts concentrated their attention on the single box in the one nest box trials, and a crowd of bees built up there rapidly. But they distributed themselves evenly among the multiple boxes in the five nest box trials, so the crowds of bees at these boxes built up more slowly. And in all four swarms, there was indeed a marked delay to start of piping and to start of takeoff in the five nest box treatment relative to the one nest box treatment. The times from discovery of the nest boxes to start of piping and to start of takeoff were 162 and 196 minutes on average in the one nest box trials, but 416 and 442 minutes on average in the five nest box trials. It should be noted that the amount of waggle dancing back at the swarm did not differ between the two treatments. Also, the level of dance consensus was the same for both treatments. The bees were always unanimous in dancing only for the side of the nest boxes. It seems clear, therefore, that our five nest box treatment did not disturb anything in the decision-making process at the swarm cluster, and yet it delayed the start of piping and the start of takeoff. Thus, this experiment yielded strong support for the quorum-sensing hypothesis. 
Based on our two experiments conducted on Appledore Island in 2002 and 2003, Kirk and I drew the conclusion that a quorum of scouts at one of the proposed sites, not a consensus among dancers at the swarm, is the key stimulus for scouts to start piping and thereby initiate preparations for swarm takeoff. But how do we reconcile this conclusion with the fact that by the time the swarm takes off, it must have a consensus among its scouts in order to fly as a unit to a single chosen site? One possible answer is that the preparations for takeoff, which generally take an hour or more, provide sufficient time for the positive feedback process of recruitment to the best site to produce the necessary unanimous agreement among the scouts. There may, however, be more to the story. It may be, for example, that the piping signals, which Kirk and I learned in 2006, are produced only by scouts returning to the swarm from the chosen site, inform the scouts from the losing sites, all those without a quorum, that the contest is over, and that they should stop advertising these sites. This would certainly help the scouts reach full agreement about their future home, but whether the scouts from losing sites really respond to piping signals in this way remains unknown. Exactly how the scouts sense a quorum also remains unknown. One possibility is that they use visual information. For humans, and perhaps also for bees, the constantly moving scout bees are easily detected visually outside the cavity and even inside it, at least around the entrance opening, which admits considerable light. Another possible means of sensing the number of bees at a site is by touch. It is a curious fact that as soon as a site acquires multiple scouts, they begin to make frequent contacts with one another. Many even start to perform what look like buzz runs inside and outside the prospective nest site, and so butt against other bees. It seems entirely possible that a bee could use the rate of contacts with scouts in general, or collisions with buzz runners in particular, as an indicator of the number of fellow scouts at a site. Still, a third possibility is the use of olfactory information. Scout bees standing in the entrance opening of a potential home often fan their wings and expose their scent organs, thereby releasing the lemon-scented blend of attraction pheromones, the message of which is, Come here! Presumably to help other scouts find this special spot. It is possible that the level of these attraction pheromones rises with increasing numbers of bees at a site. Testing these various possibilities remains a subject for future study. Why Quorum Sensing? At first thought it seems odd that the scout bees use quorum sensing rather than consensus sensing to know when to begin preparing their swarm for its flight to the new home. After all, a consensus among the dancers is needed for a swarm to execute successfully a move to its chosen home site. Both Lindauer, with his Balcony and Mozach swarms, and Kirk and I, with our Appledore swarms in 2002, saw what happens when a swarm takes off when its dancers are strongly divided between two sites. The cloud of airborne bees splits up, both halves stall in their moves, and finally they rejoin by resettling wherever their weary queen alights. Thus the bees have a big to-do but get nothing done. Why don't the scouts use consensus sensing, and thereby avoid the risk of their swarm splitting after takeoff and going nowhere? One likely reason is that sensing a consensus among the dancing bees would be extremely difficult for the bees. Presumably, each scout would have to pull the advertisements of her fellow scouts, which would involve traveling over the swarm cluster, reading dances, and keeping a mental tally of these readings. Doing all these things would be especially difficult on larger swarms with more scouts and thus more dances to pull. Quorum sensing, however, need not become more difficult with increasing swarm size because the quorum size could be fixed, hence independent of swarm size. Another likely reason that scouts don't use consensus sensing is that quorum sensing, unlike consensus sensing, 
enables a swarm to strike a good balance between speed and accuracy in its decision-making. Consider first the matter of speed. Using a quorum as the trigger for the start of takeoff preparations means that these preparations can begin as soon as enough scouts have approved of one of the sites, even if many other scouts are still visiting and advertising other sites. In other words, there's probably no need to wait for full agreement if the outcome can be sensed in advance. If the bees used a consensus as the trigger, then the start of a swarm's takeoff preparations would be delayed by the extra time needed to reach a consensus. Consequently, the swarm bees would burn through more of the small store of energy, honey, they brought with them. This further depletion of a swarm's energy reserve would be considerable if the delay in start-of-flight preparations were to force a swarm to postpone its departure to the following day. Swarms rarely take off after 5 p.m., and so spend another chilly night camping out. Now consider the matter of accuracy. It seems that the quorum used by the bees is 20 to 30 bees present simultaneously at a site, half inside, half outside, which requires that some 75 scout bees are actively supporting this site since each one spends only part of her time at the site. Using a 20 to 30 bee quorum evidently helps ensure accurate decision-making because it guarantees that scout bees will not begin producing piping signals until a sizable number of them have independently scrutinized a site and judged it worthy of their support. This makes it extremely unlikely that a swarm will choose a poor site when a better one is available, for a poor site will not attract a large quorum of scouts. To see why, imagine that a scout makes a mistake, judging a poor site to be a good one, and recruits strongly to a poor site. Her followers will correct her error when they examine it themselves, find that it fails their scrutiny, and refrain from advertising the site further. Thus, the mistake of the erring scout is soon silenced, the number of scouts at the site quickly dwindles, and the swarm rejects this low-quality site. I suspect that quorum size is a parameter of the bee's decision-making process that has been tuned over evolutionary time to provide an optimal balance between speed, favored by a small quorum, and accuracy, favored by a large quorum. We will examine this matter further in Chapter 9. The idea that a group can strike a better balance between speed and accuracy in its decision-making if it uses a quorum rather than a consensus to know when to start taking action is nicely illustrated by a story told to me by a neighbor friend who is a Quaker. Some years ago the members of her meeting wrestled with the question of whether or not to change the location of their meeting house. In meeting after meeting the subject was discussed, with the friends always seeking a united wisdom, but every discussion ended with an adjournment for further consideration, because an agreement could not be reached. Why? Because there was one friend, an elderly lady, who felt strongly that the proposal was a mistake, withheld her consent, and so blocked a decision. If the meeting had used a quorum, acting when a sufficient number or proportion of its members agreed, it would have reached its decision in a few weeks, but waiting for a consensus required four years. What finally enabled the meeting to achieve a united judgment was the death of the one disapproving friend. Some decisions do need to be made quickly, even if the choice is imperfect. The Quaker way of business, with its unceasing patience in finding full agreement, would be extremely risky for a homeless swarm of bees hanging in limbo under the open sky. 8. Steering the Flying Swarm much have I marvelled at the faultless skill with which thou trackest out thy dwelling cave, winging thy way with seeming careless will from mount to plain or lake and winding wave. Thomas Smybert, The Wild Earth Bee, 1851. Thomas Smybert, writing about bumblebees flying home or lake and winding wave 
in his native Scotland, lauded the marvelous ability of bees to return home after visiting distant flowers. His praise is richly deserved. We now know that a worker honeybee can navigate to and from flowers blooming ten or more kilometers, more than six miles, from the hive, a thoroughly respectable distance for a creature only fourteen millimeters, about half an inch, long. We also now know that bumblebees and honeybees find their way home using navigation methods like those used for ages by sailors making a passage over open water to reach a familiar harbor, steering according to a compass, for bees this is the sun, and keeping a running tally of distance traveled, but then relying on memorized landmarks when within sight of the goal. How individual bees can range so widely without getting lost was one of the mysteries that Carl von Frisch and Martin Lindauer dug into most deeply in the 1950s, and since then other biologists have further revealed how a bee guides herself out to flowers and home to hive. Meanwhile, the related mystery of how a swarm of bees steers itself to its new home was neglected, probably because it seemed a mind-boggling puzzle. Somehow a school bus-sized cloud of some ten thousand flying insects manages to sweep straight from bivouac site to new dwelling place. The path of its flight usually stretches for hundreds or thousands of meters, up to several miles, traversing fields and forests, hilltops and valleys, and swamps and lakes. Perhaps most amazingly, the airborne colony pilots itself over the countryside to one specific point in the landscape, a single knothole in one particular tree in a certain patch of forest. And as the group closes on its destination, it gradually lowers its flight speed so that it stops precisely and gracefully at the front door of its new home. How do 10,000 bees accomplish this magnificent feat of oriented group flight? In the past few years, with the introduction of digital video technology, it has become possible to perform the sophisticated data collection and image processing needed to track individual bees in a flying swarm, and thus unravel the mechanisms of flight guidance in honeybee swarms. In this chapter, we will look at these mechanisms and we will see that the scout bees, yet again, play the leading role in our story. Swarm Chasers In the summer of 1979, I returned to my family home in Ithaca, New York, to work again with my first mentor and good friend, Roger Doc Morse, professor of apiculture at Cornell. A few years before, Doc and one of his students, Alphonse Avitabile, now Professor Emeritus at the University of Connecticut, had found that when a swarm of bees flies to its new home, the workers continuously monitor the presence of the queen within the swarm cloud by smelling the queen substance pheromone that wafts steadily from her body. This pheromone, the major component of the material secreted by the mandibular glands in the queen's head, is a 10-carbon fatty acid whose exact name is E9-oxo-2-decanoic acid. I will simply call it 9-ODA. If the bees in an airborne swarm keep smelling this particular chemical substance, they will keep flying toward their new home address. But if they don't catch its aroma because their queen has dropped out to rest, they will cease flying forward, mill about until they find their missing queen, and then cluster around her wherever she has alighted. Sooner or later the swarm will again take off and proceed to its destination. Clearly, the workers in a flying swarm take great care to avoid losing their all-important queen. To test whether 9-ODA is the critical indicator of the queen's presence, Doc and Al Avitabile had conducted a slightly evil experiment. They had set up artificial swarms so that each swarm's queen was imprisoned in a small cage, and then, when each swarm had finished its house-hunting and was taking off to move to its chosen site, they had painted nine ODA on the backs of five worker bees as they launched into flight. Each swarm, treated in this way, took off, flew out of sight, and never returned. Swarms that were treated identically except that no workers were painted with nine ODA also completed the takeoff process, 
but they flew off only about fifty meters, a hundred fifty feet, before they returned and resettled around the caged queen. Clearly, the presence of a bee bearing the special fragrance of 9 ODA suffices to convince an airborne swarm that its queen is on board. To this day, I feel sadness for the orphaned swarms produced in this otherwise superb experiment. In watching his 9 ODA treated swarms fly out of sight, Doc became intrigued by how they conduct their flights, and in 1979 he invited Kirk Vischer, just starting graduate studies with Doc, and me, to help him tackle this problem. Our first goal was simply to watch a swarm perform a flight from start to finish. To do so, we went to Appledore Island, where we knew we could control a swarm's flight path. We took with us a medium-size, 11,000 B swarm, and we carefully positioned it and a nest box on the island so that we would be able to run beneath the swarm throughout its flight. The jungles of poison ivy on Appledore limited us to running along its roads and trails, none of which is straight, but we managed to find a sufficiently linear track, 350 meters, 1150 feet long, that would enable us to stay close to our swarm throughout its journey. At one end we placed the swarm, at the other end the nest box, and every thirty meters, one hundred feet, in between, a flagged stake. By noting when the center of the flying swarm passed over each stake, we could later calculate its speed during each stage of its flight. As expected, a scout from our swarm soon found our nest box, and the bees dancing for it quickly dominated the scout bees' debate. While we were waiting for the scouts to finish their deliberations, we applied a dot of blue paint to every bee that performed a dance for the nest box, and we noted every five minutes the percentage of bees visible at the nest box that were marked with blue. Knowing that we painted 143 scout bees, and finding that on average 29% of the scouts at the box were painted, we estimated that approximately 495 bees, 143 equals 0 0.29 times 495, had visited the nest box before takeoff. Thus, we learned that fewer than 5% of the 11,000 bees in our swarm were familiar with its destination upon takeoff. Equally interesting is what we learned about swarm flight speeds once the swarm became airborne. We saw that the cloud of swarming bees hung over the bivouac site for about 30 seconds, then began moving slowly off in the direction of the nest box. It covered the first 30 meters, 100 feet, at less than 1 kilometer per hour, about 0 0.5 miles per hour, but accelerated steadily so that after 150 meters, 500 feet, it had reached its top speed of 8 kilometers per hour, 5 miles per hour. What was most surprising was the way that the swarm somehow managed to apply its brakes before it reached the nest box. Starting about 90 meters from the box, it gradually trimmed its speed and finally came to a halt with the center of the swarm cloud less than five meters, fifteen feet, from its goal. Over the next two minutes, the scout bees appeared in increasing numbers at the box's entrance opening, five after twenty seconds, forty after fifty seconds, and over one hundred after ninety seconds, releasing nasonif gland pheromones to show the ignorant bees the way into their new residence. Within three minutes of the swarm stopping before the nest box, the bees were landing so heavily on it that they blanketed its front. Soon they were marching inside en masse, creating a whirlpool of bees that wheeled slowly around the entrance hole. The queen slipped in without fanfare six minutes later, and before ten minutes had elapsed since the swarm's arrival, nearly all the bees were safely inside their new home. I took a liking to chasing swarms that day, but didn't follow up on our observations until twenty-five years later, in the summer of 2004, when I had the immense good fortune of being joined by Madeleine Beekman, a behavioral biologist from the Netherlands. Madeleine had recently completed postdoctoral studies in England with my friend Francis Ratniex, a noted bee expert, and had become intrigued by the mystery of swarm flight guidance. 
she joined me for a summer of swarm studies at cornell and turned out to be the best possible collaborator intelligent hard-working and good-natured she is now on the faculty of the university of sydney in australia the observational setup on appledore island had been rather crude and we looked for ways to improve it we wanted to describe the flight behavior of the swarms more precisely and to perform controlled experiments we decided the way to do this was to fly swarms across the large meadow beside my laboratory at the liddell field station just off the cornell campus in the middle of this twenty six hectare sixty five acre expanse of grass stands one large ash tree fraxinus americana with spreading limbs which provided a perfect place for hanging the nest box that we wanted our swarms to choose for their new home of course there were attractive natural nesting cavities in the woods surrounding this field and beyond but i had learned from my studies on appledore that if i watched a swarm with infinite patience and plucked from it every scout bee performing a dance for some site other than my nest box i could keep the swarm's attention fixated on the nest site i was offering this worked well we flew many swarms along a two hundred seventy meter eight hundred eighty six foot flight path that ran from near the laboratory out to the ash tree we divided this flyaway into thirty meter ninety eight foot segments so we could make measurements of swarm flight speed also to make accurate measurements of the dimensions of swarm clouds upon takeoff we created a twenty by twenty meter sixty six by sixty six foot launch pad for our swarms this was a closely mowed area that was gridded with stakes spaced four meters apart and in which we erected a six meter tall pole with one meter markings each swarm was set up in the launch pad's center and upon takeoff we measured its clouds length and width with reference to the grid and the heights of its clouds top and bottom with reference to the pole we also photographed the flying swarms from the side for later analysis of the movement patterns of individual bees we began by watching the flights of three swarms each containing approximately eleven thousand five hundred bees which is the median size of natural swarms in launching itself into flight each clustered swarm exploded into a buzzing cloud of bees some ten meters thirty three feet long eight meters twenty six feet wide and three meters ten feet tall the bottoms of these swarm clouds swirled about two meters six feet from the top of the meadow grass hence thankfully a bit over our heads knowing these dimensions we calculated that within each swarm cloud the flying bees were spaced on average only about twenty seven centimeters ten inches apart which means that they were functioning at a density of some fifty bees per cubic meter one point four bees per cubic foot amazingly the bees rarely if ever suffered mid-air collisions the flight patterns of all three swarms matched what doc kirk and i had seen with our swarm on appledore island each swarm at first moved very slowly then smoothly accelerated to a top speed of about six kilometers per hour four miles per hour and finally braked gently coming to a full stop at its new home and as before we noticed a brief delay between when each swarm had reached its destination and the moment its scouts began settling at the entrance hole and releasing nasenough gland pheromones but that once this chemical signal was being discharged the rest of the swarm cloud quickly settled on the nest box the bees didn't hesitate to move inside and within ten minutes nearly all had disappeared indoors each swarm executed the entire migration process take-off flight landing and entry with precision and so completed it in less than fifteen minutes leaders and followers what makes the precisely oriented flight of a honey-bee swarm to its new home so wondrous is that only a small percentage of its members know the swarm's travel route and final destination as mentioned already less than five per cent of the swarm that doc kirk and i studied on appledore island had visited the nest box and so knew its exact location before the swarm made its flight to its new home 
This finding was later confirmed by Susanna Berman and me in the study in which we prepared swarms of individually labeled bees, video recorded the scouts' dances, and determined which proposed nest site each scout advertised. In all three swarms that we studied, only 1.5 to 1.7 percent of the bees performed dances for the chosen site. This figure, combined with the figure of approximately 50 percent for the fraction of the scout bees from a high-quality site that advertise it with a dance, what Kirk and I found in our study of how scouts encode nest site quality in their dances, see Chapter 6, yields the estimate that only three to four percent of the bees in each swarm had visited the chosen site and so knew the exact location of their swarm's future dwelling place. Clearly, when a swarm flies to its new home, it relies on a relatively small number of informed scout bees, approximately 400 individuals in an average-sized swarm of 10,000 bees, who function as guides or leaders of all the rest. How does this system of leaders and followers work? Three hypotheses have been proposed for how an informed minority guides the ignorant majority when a swarm flies to its new home. The first hypothesis suggests that the transfer of information from leaders to followers relies on a chemical signal. In their 1975 paper on how the workers in a swarm perceive the presence of their queen by sensing the nine ODA she releases, Al Avatabile, Roger Morse, and Rolf Bach proposed that scouts provide flight guidance by means of the attraction pheromones produced in the Nasanov gland that is part of the scent organ at the tip of a worker bee's abdomen. Their idea was that scouts might discharge these pheromones along the front of the swarm cloud to attract, and thereby guide, the non-scouts to move in this direction. The other two hypotheses suggest that the information transfer from informed bees to ignorant bees works by vision instead of olfaction. One hypothesis, called the subtle guide hypothesis, was proposed in 2005 by a team of biologists from Princeton University in the United States and the Universities of Leeds and Bristol in the United Kingdom. Ein Cousin, Jens Krause, Nigel Franks, and Simon Levin. According to this hypothesis, the informed bees do not conspicuously signal the correct travel direction. Instead, they steer the swarm simply by tending to fly in the direction of the new home. By making computer simulations of airborne swarms, the authors showed that if each bee in a flying swarm, one, attempts to avoid collisions by turning away from any neighbors within a critical distance, two, tends to be attracted toward and aligned with neighbors outside the critical distance, and three, flies either with a preferred movement direction, informed bees, or without a preferred movement direction, ignorant bees, then the swarm will be steered toward its new home, even if the proportion of informed individuals is very small. Remarkably, in large groups like honeybee swarms, this proportion can be less than 5%. It is an intriguing hypothesis, for it shows that the bees in a flying swarm might not need to know which of them know the travel route, hence are the leaders. The second vision-based hypothesis, called the streaker bee hypothesis, was sketched out in 1955 by Martin Lindauer. At the very end of his magnum opus on house hunting by honeybees, Lindauer reported having seen that several hundred bees in more rapid flight always shoot forward toward the front of the swarm cloud, that is to say, in the direction of the nest site. While the swarm cloud slowly continues its flight in this direction, these guiding bees slowly fly back along the border of the swarm cloud and again shoot to the front in rapid flight. The streaker bee hypothesis suggests that the informed bees conspicuously signal the correct travel direction by repeatedly making high-speed flights through the swarm cloud. Note, according to the subtle guide hypothesis, the informed and ignorant bees fly at the same speed. In the streaker bee hypothesis, the ignorant bees behave as is suggested for the subtle guide hypothesis, except for one thing. Rather than align themselves with neighbors in general, the ignorant bees preferentially align themselves with fast-flying neighbors. 
So, the two key differences between the subtle guide and streaker bee hypotheses are whether or not the informed bees, leaders, point the way with high-speed flights, and whether or not the ignorant bees, followers, favor alignment with fast-flying bees. Computer simulations, similar to those done for the subtle guide hypothesis, have shown that the streaker bee hypothesis is a plausible mechanism of swarm flight guidance. Thus, both the subtle guide and the streaker bee hypotheses for swarm flight guidance are a possibility. The burning question is, which, if either, is the reality? Scent Organs Sealed Shut After describing the flights of swarms across the meadow at the Liddell Field Station, Madeline Bickman and I set ourselves the goal of testing the hypothesis that scout bees guide their swarm using the attraction pheromones produced in their scent organs. We knew we had to prepare swarms in which every worker had her scent organ sealed shut and then see if these swarms could perform a well-oriented full-speed flight down our flyway at Liddell. The scent organ of a worker honeybee lies on the dorsal surface of the abdomen at the front edge of the last abdominal segment. It consists of several hundred gland cells, the Nasinov gland, named after the Russian scientist who first described it in 1883, whose ducts open onto the membrane that connects the last two plates, tergites, covering the top of the abdomen. The secretion, which consists mainly of citral, geraniol, and neurolic acid, and has a pleasant lemony aroma, collects on this membrane. Usually this area is concealed by the overlap of the two tergites, but if a worker bee bends the apical segment of her abdomen downward, she exposes the membrane and releases the scent. Using a fine paintbrush, one can paint over the joint between the last two tergites, and when the paint dries, the two tergites will be stuck together so that the treated bee can no longer expose her scent organ. We tried various paints. The first ones tended to crack easily, so that after a few days many bees were able to release the balmy Nasinov gland pheromones from the scent organ, but eventually we found that Testor's gloss enamel paint makes a lasting seal of a bee's abdominal segments. At this point, we adopted a standard procedure for preparing our test swarms. After immobilizing groups of 10 to 20 bees in plastic bags in a refrigerator, we put one group of these chilled bees at a time on ice, painted over each bee's scent organ, and then poured the still immobile bees into a screened cage with their queen where they would warm up and become part of the artificial swarm we were creating. We did this over and over until we had 4,000 bees properly painted, enough for a small treatment swarm. To control for any effects of chilling, painting, and handling, we also prepared 4,000 bee control swarms in which we did everything the same except that we applied the dot of paint to each bee's thorax instead of her abdomen. We eventually flew six swarms, three treatment swarms and three control swarms. The two types, when airborne, formed similar-sized clouds of flying bees, eight meters long, eight meters wide, and three meters high. Most importantly, both treatment and control swarms flew directly and quickly to the nest box. As we had seen previously with the large swarms, these small swarms accelerated steadily for the first 90 meters, reached peak flight speeds after flying 90 to 120 meters, started slowing down after flying 210 to 240 meters, moved very slowly during the final 30 meters, and finally stopped at the nest box. The maximum speeds of the treatment swarms were 6.8, 3.6, and 6.8 kilometers per hour, while those of the control swarms were 6.7, 6.4, and 7.2 kilometers per hour. The second treatment swarm flew more slowly than the others because it flew against a fierce headwind, whereas all the rest encountered at most a slight breeze. There was, however, one important way in which the two types of swarms did behave differently. Once they reached the nest box, the treatment swarms took much longer than the control swarms, 
20 minutes versus 9 minutes on average, to move into the box. Why? Almost certainly it was because the scouts in the treatment swarms were unable to help the non-scouts find the entrance to their new home by marking it with Nasanov gland pheromones. They certainly tried hard to do so. The scouts landed at the three entrance holes in the nest box and stood there flamboyantly with abdomens elevated and wings whirring, but they could not bend down the last abdominal segment to expose the scent organ. To be sure about this, we inspected 250 bees from each swarm shortly after it entered the nest box and found that only a minuscule percentage of the bees, less than 1%, had cracked paint seals. Because our treatment swarms executed their flight plans as flawlessly as our control swarms, except during the landing phase when the scent organ clearly plays an important role, we concluded that the informed scouts don't provide their ignorant sisters with flight guidance information using the Nasen of gland pheromones. Streams of Streakers Madeline and I next started to test the streaker bee hypothesis. We believed that we had seen, while watching our swarms sweep across the meadow to the nest box, what Lindauer had reported seeing in an airborne swarm. Most bees fly about within the cloud in rather slow and looping flights, but a few shoot straight through the cloud in the direction of the swarm's new home. Also, it looked to us like the streaking bees zoomed mainly through the top of the swarm cloud but we were not 100% confident of our sightings, and certainly we had no hard data. So we decided to try to use conventional still photography to get solid information and check our impressions. Using a 35mm camera, color transparency film with a slow film speed, DIN 64, and a moderately long exposure time, 1 30th of a second, we found that if we photographed a flying swarm from the side and under a clear sky, we could get photos that captured the entire swarm cloud and in which individual bees appeared as small dark streaks on a bright background. The length of each bee's streak indicated her flight speed, and the tilt of her streak indicated her flight angle relative to horizontal, the orientation of level flight. These photos showed unambiguously that a small minority of the bees in an airborne swarm do whiz through it at the maximum flight speed of a worker bee, about 34 kilometers per hour, 20 miles per hour, and that all the rest of the bees buzz along much more slowly. We also found that the streaks of the fast-flying bees compared to those of the slow-flying ones are more apt to be horizontal, indicative of straight and level flights. Finally, we gleaned from the photos the finding that the speeding bees, the streakers, do indeed operate mainly in the top of the swarm cloud. This makes sense, assuming that these bees are providing flight direction information to the other bees, for by streaming over their sisters the fast-flying bees position themselves where they are easily seen against the bright background of the sky. Computer Vision Algorithms for Tracking Bees the photographic study that Madeline and I made in 2004 gave support to the streaker bee hypothesis, but it was not a rigorous test between this hypothesis and the subtle guide hypothesis. This is because our photographs, taken from the side of a flying swarm, could not tell us the flight directions of the fast-flying bees, whether toward the new home site, away from it, or some angle in between and the key to resolving the subtle guide and streaker bee hypotheses is knowing whether or not the flights of the speedsters in a swarm point mainly toward the swarm's new home. The two hypotheses make distinct predictions about this matter. The subtle guide hypothesis predicts that the fast-flying bees will not be heading mainly in the direction of the new home site because, according to this hypothesis, the informed bees don't signal the travel direction with high-speed flights through the swarm cloud. In contrast, the streaker bee hypothesis predicts that the fast-flying bees will be heading mainly in the direction of the new home site because, according to this second hypothesis, this is how the informed bees share their knowledge of the swarm's travel direction. 
some of the speedy bees will be informed bees indicating which way to go and probably some will be ignorant bees reacting to the informed bees in two thousand six when it became possible to track individual bees in a flying swarm and measure each bee's position flight direction and flight speed it became clear that the high-speed flyers in a swarm are indeed zipping toward the swarm's new home so now it seems clear that the streaker bee hypothesis is correct the two people who were instrumental in developing the tools for tracking individual bees in an airborne swarm are kevin passano professor of electrical and computer engineering at ohio state university and his brilliant graduate student kevin schultz one of the great benefits of the academic life is that it gives you opportunities to visit other universities and meet remarkable people some of whom share your intellectual excitement about a particular mystery i met kevin passano on a trip to ohio state university in the spring of two thousand two i was there on a lecture engagement not to enlist an engineer for collaborative work but upon meeting kevin i sensed he was a marvelous engineer with precisely the right inclination for a joint scientific venture here was someone who devised automatic control systems for technological applications but who also liked to look at biological systems for inspiration i was to learn later that biomimicry is a hot approach among control engineers for the methods of automatic control in living organisms are exceptionally powerful and robust having been tested and tuned by natural selection for millions of years as i recall the outcome of our first meeting was an agreement that we would team up already we had found splendid common ground on the puzzles of forager force allocation and swarm flight guidance in the words of kevin the honeybees have evolved a cooperative control strategy for groups of autonomous vehicles and he was keen to join in exploring it once madeline bakeman and i had disproved the pheromone hypothesis for swarm flight guidance and had published the results of our simple photographic analysis that confirmed the existence of streaker bees in swarms kevin realized that what was needed next was to video record an airborne swarm from below using a high-definition video camera he had a hunch that by tapping into the latest video technology especially point tracking algorithms invented by engineers working on computer vision it should be possible to track individual bees as they flew over the video camera and determine for each bee her position in the swarm cloud her flight speed and her flight direction so kevin purchased the necessary camera and joined kirk visher and me during our field trip to appledore island in the summer of two thousand six we set up a swarm by the old coast guard building at the island's center placed an attractive nest box on the eastern shore two hundred fifty meters eight hundred twenty feet away and charged up the camera's battery our goal was to video record the swarm as it flew over the camera at two points along its flight path fifteen meters fifty feet from the bivouac site when the swarm had just taken off and was still moving slowly and sixty meters two hundred feet when the swarm was well under way and had picked up considerable speed the camera was equipped with a wide-angle lens so its field of view included most of the width of the swarm cloud though not its entire length the camera also had an extremely high shutter speed one ten thousandth of a second so in each frame of the video recording a bee appeared as a short blob not a long streak our biggest obstacle to success that summer was the wind sweeping over appledore island which made it difficult to get swarms to fly directly over our camera in still air a swarm will course along a predictable bee line to its new home but in windy air the track of a swarm's flight is wildly unpredictable as chaotic gusts push the airborne bees about knocking them off a direct line of travel and appledore island anchored in the atlantic ocean six miles off the southern coast of maine is thoroughly windblown it is so much so that in two thousand seven the shoals marine laboratory erected on the island a twenty seven point five meter ninety foot tall wind turbine to harvest some of the wind's energy 
Now the laboratory acquires a substantial portion of its electrical power from this limitless source. On June 29th and July 2nd, 2006, however, we were blessed with two days of wonderfully calm air, and twice we got a swarm to fly directly over the video camera at both the 15-meter mark and the 60-meter mark along the line running straight to the bee's new home. With these two sets of recordings of swarm flyovers in the can, Kevin Passano had material for his Ph.D. student Kevin Schultz to tackle. Over the next two years, Kevin S. created a computer algorithm that semi-automated the data-gathering process. In essence, the procedure involves examining each ellipsoidal blob, B image, in a given video frame, noting its orientation, the angle between the major axis of its ellipse and the bottom edge of the video frame, and then pairing it up with the blob on the next video frame that represents the same B. The pairing process involves finding for a given blob in the first frame the blob in the second frame that best matches its position and orientation. This process is repeated, with the blobs of the second frame being paired with blobs of the third frame and so on, to build up, frame by frame, detailed trajectories of the individual swarm bees as they flew across the video camera's field of view back on Appledore Island. The size of a blob, the length of the major axis of a blob's ellipse, indicates the height of the bee above the camera, so the bees in the top and bottom portions of the swarm cloud were distinguished, and it was even possible to make three-dimensional reconstructions of the individual bees' flights. What a tour de force! It is hard to convey in words what it is like to go from watching thousands and thousands of swarm bees swirling overhead in seeming random motion to seeing graphs that show wonderfully clear patterns in their movements. Every detail of the swarm bees' collective motion was a complete revelation, for before Kevin P. and Kevin S. devised their process of blob tracking on digital video recordings, no one could even begin to see these patterns. The human visual system is a stupendous biological computer capable of amazing feats of information processing, such as instantly recognizing a face not seen in years, but even it is overwhelmed by so many bees moving so rapidly and so wildly. The most important pattern revealed by the analysis of the video recordings is that the fast-flying bees were indeed streaking in the direction of the chosen home site. Looking at one study, which shows the individual bees' flight speeds in relation to flight direction, we can see that the speediest bees were zooming directly toward the new home, while the slowest ones were heading in the opposite direction. By comparing the plots for the top and bottom portions of the swarm cloud, we can also see that the speedsters were mainly in the top portion of the swarm, confirming what Madeline and I had detected with our side-view photographs of moving swarms. A third important feature of the plots is that the peaks in flight speed are higher at the front section of the elongated swarm cloud than at its rear, true for both the top and the bottom of the swarm cloud. This shows that the fastest bees tended to be in the front of the swarm. A painstaking analysis by Kevin S. of the velocities of individual bees found that not only do bees that are flying in the direction of the nest site tend to fly with the highest velocities, but also they tend to accelerate, increase their velocities, as they move from swarm rear to swarm front. It seems likely that some of this rise in flight speed comes about as the ignorant follower bees latch on to the informed leader bees, boosting their speed as they chase after the streaker bees. If so, the information about flight direction, expressed in the flight direction of the fast-flying bees, and the boosting of flight speed, are likely to spread from the informed bees to some of the ignorant bees who, through their own faster flights, will start to influence other ignorant bees. This chain reaction of informed leader bees begetting more informed leader bees could lead to a widespread induction of bees to fly toward the nest box and to fly faster. This may explain the increase in overall swarm speed over time, 
and that is so impressive to any beekeeper who tries to follow a fugitive swarm to its new home by running along beneath it. The discovery that the bees flying toward the new home are traveling far faster than the other swarm bees led Kevin Passano, Kevin Schultz, and me to conclude that streaker bees, not subtle guides, appear to provide the flight guidance to an airborne swarm of honeybees. We would like, however, to test the streaker bee hypothesis more rigorously by performing an experiment analogous to the sealed scent organ test of the attraction pheromones hypothesis. Block the proposed means of guidance and see if this renders a swarm incapable of making a well-oriented full-speed flight to its chosen destination. Unfortunately, Nobody has succeeded yet in figuring out how to prevent the informed bees from performing high-speed flights. Madeline Bakeman tried trimming the wingtips of scout bees by a millimeter or so, a manipulation that is known to reduce a bee's maximum flight speed, but she found that this surgery also caused her bees to stop scouting. Maybe some other approach will do the trick. Glue small airfoils or short strings to scout bees to increase the drag they experience during flight? Find bees that have genetic mutation that causes them to fly slowly. Anyone who figures out a way to prevent streaking by scout bees will have set the stage for a beautiful experiment. In the meantime, Madeline Bakeman and two students, Tanya Lati and Michael Duncan, have succeeded with a different approach to testing the streaker bee hypothesis. They performed an ingenious experiment in which they caused numerous fast-flying forager bees to zoom through an airborne swarm in a direction perpendicular to the swarm's intended flight path. If the streaker bee hypothesis is correct, the foragers sweeping in from the side should create conflicting directional information in the swarm and thereby disrupt its flight guidance. This is exactly what was found. Of six test swarms that attempted to fly to a nest box 100 meters, 330 feet, away when foragers were zipping back and forth across the swarm's flight path, only one reached the nest box intact, and even this swarm was knocked temporarily off course. The other five swarms all started out, as usual, by moving straight toward the nest box, but upon hitting the forager highway, they either fragmented or veered widely off course. In contrast, when the experimenters flew four control swarms, ones identical to the test swarms but without the cross-traffic of foragers, they saw each one stay together and fly directly to the nest box. Clearly, the heavy traffic of foragers crossing the flight path of the test swarms disrupted their mechanism of flight guidance, evidently by injecting misleading visual information into the clouds of swirling bees. Assembling the Flight Navigators There are many questions left unanswered about the remarkable flights of honeybee swarms. How does the moving group apply the brakes when it arrives within about a hundred meters, 330 feet, of its new residence? Also, how do the informed bees make their repeated streak flights through the swarm cloud? Do they stop when they reach the front and let the other bees fly past? Or do they fly inconspicuously rearward along the swarm's bottom, where they may be nearly invisible against the underlying vegetation? There is also the mystery of how a swarm makes sure that it is fully stocked with bees who know its flight route before it begins its journey to the new home. It is striking how virtually all the scout bees who have visited the chosen home site, and so can steer the airborne swarm to it, abandon the future dwelling place and assemble on the swarm cluster shortly before it launches into flight. I first witnessed this phenomenon in August 1974, shortly before I started graduate school, when I first watched a swarm go through its house-hunting process. I had set up an artificial swarm at a nest box behind my parents' house in an abandoned field dominated by blooming goldenrod plants, solidago spp, and young white pine trees, pinus strobus, one of which supported my box for the bees. To my great good fortune the scout bees chose my humble plywood box for their future home. Soon I was dashing back and forth along the 150-meter-long 
500-foot-long path between swarm cluster and nest box, doing my best to watch both the growing party of excited dancers on the swarm and the strengthening throng of scout bees scrutinizing the nest box. Partway through the afternoon, I was shocked to see a sudden drop in bees at my box. On my previous visit, fifteen minutes earlier, I had counted some twenty-five bees examining the box. But now I saw only two or three bees, and in a few more minutes the place was totally deserted. This collapse in the scout bee's interest baffled me, until I glanced back toward the swarm's bivouac site and saw my swarm, now a diffuse ball of swirling and shining bees, rolling straight toward me over the sunny field. Evidently the scouts had abandoned the nest box to be in the swarm cluster at its moment of departure. Since then, when performing experiments on swarms, I have come to rely on the conspicuous drop in scouts at the nest box as a reliable indicator that the swarm has completed its decision-making and is about to take off. It certainly makes sense for the scouts to assemble at the swarm shortly before departure, for we have seen how only three to four percent of a swarm's bees know its flight plan, and with such a small minority of navigators it is probably important to have as many as possible on board. But precisely how this is achieved remains a mystery. Does the gathering of the scout bees on the swarm arise simply by these bees returning to the swarm as usual, and then lingering there when they detect one of the flight initiation signals, either worker pipings or buzz runs? Or might their assembly on the swarm be triggered by them hearing, feeling, seeing, or smelling an unknown signal of impending departure that is produced at the nest box? I wouldn't be surprised if the bees possess some secret gadgetry for ensuring that a swarm about to take flight is well stocked with the informed bees who can pilot it safely to its new home. 9. Swarm as Cognitive Entity I'm a systems neurobiologist who studies how the three pounds of goo we call a human brain makes decisions. William Newsom, 2008 the previous six chapters of this book describe what is known about how the three pounds of bees we call a honeybee swarm makes a decision about where it will build its new home. The starting point was the mystery of how a bunch of tiny-brained bees hanging from a tree branch can make a good choice for their future living quarters and can take timely action on their decision. We then reviewed the observational and experimental evidence concerning each specific mechanism of the house-hunting process, an ingenious and sophisticated tangle of behaviors, communication systems, and feedback loops. Throughout, we've seen that a swarm of bees is a democratic decision-making body that is remarkably accessible to analysis, since we can easily observe what the individual bees are doing while an entire swarm is conducting its decision-making process. It is an amazing bit of good fortune that all of the important individual-level actions occur in full view, either on the surface of the swarm or at the prospective home sites, not deep inside the mass of tightly clustered bees. It has been important to first work our way through the nuts and bolts of the bees' house-hunting process, so we really know this process, but now it is time to step back from the detailed analysis and synthesize what we know by considering the general features of a swarm as a decision-making system. In doing so, we will find it useful to compare what is known about the mechanisms of decision-making in bee swarms and primate brains. This may seem a bizarre comparison, for swarms and brains are vastly different biological systems whose subunits, bees and neurons, differ greatly. But these systems are also fundamentally similar in that both are cognitive entities that have been shaped by natural selection to be skilled at acquiring and processing information to make decisions. Furthermore, both are democratic systems of decision-making, that is, ones in which there is no central decider who possesses synoptic knowledge or exceptional intelligence and directs everyone else to the best course of action. Instead, in both swarms and brains, 
the decision-making process is broadly diffused among an ensemble of relatively simple information processing units each of which possesses only a tiny fraction of the total pool of information used to make a collective judgment we will see that natural selection has organized honeybee swarms and primate brains in intriguingly similar ways to build a first-rate decision-making group from a collection of rather poorly informed and cognitively limited individuals these similarities point to general principles for building a sophisticated cognitive unit out of far simpler parts conceptual framework for decision making in essence decision making is a process in which information is acquired and processed in order to make a choice between two or more alternatives thus a honeybee swarm performs decision making when it obtains information about the qualities of a dozen or more potential home sites processes this information and selects the most desirable site for its new residence a good example of a primate brain performing a decision-making task is when a monkey is presented with a visual display consisting of a cloud of white dots moving against a black background most of the dots move randomly but a small fraction move coherently in one of two possible directions left or right the monkey has been trained to decide whether the motion direction of the coherently moving dots is left or right and to indicate its decision by making an eye movement to a left or right target the percentage of the displayed dots that move coherently can be varied to make the quality of the information higher or lower and thus the decision-making task easier or harder while other behavioral biologists and i have been working to understand the mechanisms of a honeybee swarm's decision-making at the level of individual bees neuroscientists have been working to understand the mechanisms of a human brain's decision-making at the level of individual cells the best progress in unraveling the neural basis of human decision-making has been made by studying monkeys serving as human surrogates as they perform the decision-making task just described in which a monkey sees a noisy visual stimulus makes a decision in the two alternative left or right choice test and indicates its decision with an eye movement by recording neural activity in the various areas of the brain involved in reporting visual information in processing this information and in controlling eye movements neurophysiologists have identified the neural processes that underlie this particular decision-making task the starting point is the middle temporal mt area of the brain which processes sensory information about the motions that the monkey sees each neuron in the mt area has a receptive field that corresponds to a particular portion of a monkey's entire visual field also each mt neuron is motion sensitive for a particular direction of movement that is it is activated to fire when a stimulus moves across its receptive field in the preferred direction and it is inhibited from firing when the moving stimulus travels in the opposite direction thus the population of neurons in the mt area is a set of direction tuned motion detectors that report in their firing rates information about the strength of visual movement in their preferred directions within their particular portions of the monkey's visual field collectively they provide the monkey's brain with information regarding the strength of rightward motion and leftward motion over the monkey's whole visual field hence over the full display of moving dots at any given instant however this information is somewhat ambiguous because of randomness in the moving dot display and because of noise random fluctuations in the representation of the information by the mt neurons the next step in the monkey's decision-making process occurs in the lateral intraparietal lip area of the brain the neurons in this area receive inputs from the mt area and they are organized into direction-specific integrators that sum over time the noisy information being provided by the corresponding mt neurons thus as time progresses in the decision-making task evidence about what the monkey is seeing accumulates in the lip neurons for example if a monkey is watching a visual display containing rightward moving dots then lip neurons that function as rightward motion integrators will increase gradually their firing rates 
The rate at which their firing rates increase depends on the stimulus strength, that is, the number of the dots moving to the right. Also, the various integrators corresponding to different motion directions are mutually inhibitory. One effect of this mutual inhibition is that even if the firing rates of the LIP neurons associated with rightward and leftward motion increase at approximately the same rate at first, later only those neurons associated with the stronger stimulus, rightward motion, will continue to increase their firing rate. Those associated with the weaker stimulus, leftward motion, will start to decrease their firing rate. Each population of LIP neurons inhibits the others to a degree proportional to its level of activity, so eventually only the neurons in one LIP population will have high firing rates. This mutual inhibition improves the monkey's discrimination by enhancing the perceived difference in strength between rightward and leftward stimuli, and so helps the monkey avoid attempting to make rightward and leftward eye movements simultaneously. When the activity of one integrator exceeds a threshold, the decision is made and an eye movement in the appropriate direction is initiated. The eye movement is driven by the output, motor, neurons in the final stage in the monkey's decision circuit. These are neurons in the frontal eye field, FEF, and superior colliculus, SC, regions of the brain, and they receive inputs from the LIP area. Here again, the FEF and SC neurons are direction-specific. Each neuron will drive an eye movement in just one direction. Leo Chagru, Greg Corrado, and William Newsom, neuroscientists at Stanford University, have devised a helpful conceptual framework for thinking about the multiple stages of information processing that underlie making a simple perceptual decision like what we've been considering. Their framework contains three stages or transformations. First, a sensory transformation converts the information about the external world that has been registered by the animal's sensory organs into a sensory representation, which makes the information available for further processing within the animal's brain. This is what the MT neurons do in the monkey's motion detection task. Second, a decision transformation converts the sensory representation into a set of probabilities for adopting the alternative courses of action. In the monkey's brain, this transformation is implemented by the LIP neurons as they convert the sensory representation of visual motion into a set of evidence accumulations, specifically the set of firing rates of the integrators representing different motion directions. The level of firing in a particular integrator population determines the animal's relative probability of choosing the alternative represented by this population. Third, an action transformation converts this set of probabilities into a specific behavioral act. This final process of action implementation is performed in the monkey's brain by motor output neurons in the FEF and SC regions when they are activated by the population of LIP neurons whose firing rates have reached a threshold level. Remarkably, even though this conceptual framework was devised for helping us understand decision-making in primate, including human, brains, it can also help us conceptualize the decision-making process in honeybee swarms. In both types of decision-making systems, sensory units create a representation of the outside world inside the system. Also, in both types of systems, the processing of the information in the sensory representation consists of a competition between mutually inhibitory integrators of the information, evidence, flowing into the system. And finally, in both brains and swarms, the decision is made when the accumulation of evidence in one integrator reaches a sufficiently high threshold level. The Sensory Transformation in a Swarm In reflecting on the structural parallels between swarms and brains, I like to think of a swarm as a kind of exposed brain that hangs quietly from a tree branch but is able to see many potential nest sites spread over a vast expanse of the surrounding countryside. 
as we have seen what gives a swarm such an immense visual field is its squadron of several hundred scout bees who fly out for several kilometers in all directions and scour the environment for prospective dwelling places we now know that when a scout bee finds a site sufficiently desirable to be worthy of attention by others she flies back to the swarm and reports her find on the swarm's surface by performing a waggle dance we also now know that the strength of her dance the number of dance circuits performed is proportional to the quality of the site thus a scout bee functions as a sensory unit of the swarm one that transduces the quality of a nest site into the strength of a dance signal it should be noted too that each scout is a site specific sensory unit for each bee reports on just one nest site in the surrounding area much like each mt neuron reports on just one small portion of the visual field over time as dozens of scout bees return to the swarm and perform dances they gradually deliver a body of sensory information about the locations and qualities of the potential nest sites that they have found this display of bee dances can be thought of as the swarm's sensory representation of the landscape of possible nest sites it is analogous to the pattern of mt neuron firings that forms a monkey's sensory representation of the stimuli moving across its visual field several features of the way that the scout bees build their swarms sensory representation are worth noting for each makes an important contribution to the success of a swarm as a decision-making system one the sensory apparatus of a swarm is a sizable population of scout bees by fielding several hundred scout bees, a swarm is able to gather a wealth of information about potential nest sites, usually within just a few hours. We have seen how a swarm's scouts can locate, inspect, and report on nearly a dozen possible home sites in an afternoon. Also, by distributing the information collection process among numerous bees, a swarm averages out the bee-to-bee -bee variations in strength of dancing for the sites and thereby increases the accuracy of its information acquisition. 2. Scouts collect sensory information for several hours or several days. It is important that swarms base their decisions on an extended sequence of samplings of sensory information, because this information is acquired sporadically, especially at first. We have seen that even with several hundred scouts exploring simultaneously, several hours may pass before one of them returns with news of an outstanding find and even after news has been received about all the alternatives the further reporting on them tends to be episodic a lengthy period of information gathering enables a swarm to assemble a sizable and thus reliable body of sensory information on each site three each scout makes an independent evaluation of a site even though most of the scouts reporting on a site are recruited to it, the recruitment process only brings a scout to a site. It does not compel her to report favorably on the site. Instead, each scout makes an independent evaluation and decides for herself how strongly to announce the site when she returns to the swarm and performs a dance. This independence of the scouts means that an evaluation error made by one bee won't be propagated or amplified by blind imitation, and this helps ensure that the total amount of dancing for a site in a swarm's sensory representation is an accurate indication of the quality of the site. 4. Scouts reporting on a site recruit additional scouts to the site. Recruitment by scouts creates positive feedback in the number of scouts reporting on a site as recruited bees become recruiters. This means that the sensory information representing a particular site can amplify itself. Because the strength of each scout's dance depends on her site's quality, the positive feedback, amplification, is stronger for higher quality sites and eventually the better sites will tend to monopolize the display of dances on a swarm. Thus, over time, a swarm's sensory input or attention will become focused on superior sites. 5. Scouts reduce their dance responses over time. Even though the quality of a nest site generally does not change, the dances produced by each scout reporting on it gradually weaken over time. 
this decay in the dance response gradually purges a swarm's sensory representation of information about inferior sites the purging occurs because scouts that report on poor sites with weak dances tend not to attract replacements so the feeble reporting of these poor sites withers away thus the decay in the dance response also contributes to the way that a swarm over time increasingly focuses its attention on better sites six scouts may adaptively choose between exploring versus exploiting it remains to be shown but it may be that scouts choose between exploring for unknown and potentially better sites versus exploiting already known sites and that they do so by sensing the abundance of dances on the swarm if so then this would endow a swarm with a means of regulating its intake of sensory information increasing it when the swarm's sensory representation is still poorly formed and limiting it when the swarm is well supplied with sensory information besides these six features of scout bees as sensory units that foster successful swarm decision making there are two features that almost certainly hamper successful decision making the first is that scouts often make their reports asynchronously which means that at any given moment their dances will tend to provide a poor indication of the true qualities of the alternative sites for example we can note that from ten to ten fifteen all of the dancing on this swarm represented the fifteen liter medium quality nest box as if this were the only and thus the best option available the second shortcoming of the scout bees reporting system is that each scout provides noisy information regarding site quality for any given site different scout bees produce markedly different numbers of dance circuits to cope with this time-based and individual-based variation in the reporting system a swarm integrates its sensory information over several hours and across hundreds of bees this critically important integration of the sensory information occurs during the next stage of a swarm's decision-making process the decision transformation in a swarm the second stage of decision-making in a monkey brain or a bee swarm is a decision transformation this is where the sensory representation is converted into a set of probabilities for adopting the alternative outcomes the main function of this second transformation is to integrate noisy sensory information so that the decision-making system brain or swarm knows how much evidence overall it has received in support of each of its alternatives these evidence totals determine the relative probabilities of choosing the different courses of action in a monkey's brain the sensory information provided by neurons in the mt area is integrated by neurons in the lip area as explained earlier different populations of lip neurons representing different motion directions are stimulated by their corresponding mt neurons and each population of lip neurons sums over time the input stimulation that it receives and adjusts its output firing rate according to the total input received in effect each population of lip neurons functions as an integrator accumulating evidence in support of one possible direction of eye movement and providing a readout of how much evidence it has tallied thus the greater the visual motion in a certain direction the stronger the reports by the corresponding mt neurons and the faster the evidence accumulation in the associated lip neurons the more likely the monkey is to move its eyes in this direction the decision transformation process in a honeybee swarm works in basically the same way as in a monkey brain just as a monkey brain has an integrator of sensory information for each eye movement direction a honeybee swarm has an integrator of sensory information for each nest site option the integrator for each potential home site is the number of bees visiting that site as we have seen in chapter six uncommitted scouts are stimulated by the dances they encounter on the swarm's surface to visit the sites represented by these dances the dances for any given site start and stop as the scouts committed to each site come and go from the swarm and different scouts from the same site produce dances that differ in strength 
so there is much minute-to-minute -minute variation in the strength of the signals activating additional scouts to visit any given site. But the number of bees visiting the site reflects the total number of dance circuits that were produced to advertise this particular site over the previous several hours, so the number of bees at a site integrates the noisy sensory-slash-dance information about the site. And the better the site, the greater the pool of dances advertising it, and the stronger the stream of newcomers to it. Hence the evidence in support of a particular site, the number of bees visiting it, accumulates most rapidly at the best site. In this way the best site acquires the highest probability of becoming the chosen site. An important design feature of the integrators in monkey brains is that they are mutually inhibitory. That is, as evidence builds up in one integrator, it inhibits the accumulation of evidence in all the others. We see this same design feature in honeybee swarms. In one study, for example, we see that in each instance of swarm decision-making, the steep rise in the number of bees at the chosen site was accompanied by conspicuous declines in the number of bees at all the rejected sites, similar to the pattern of rising or falling firing rates for different LIP neurons. The mutual inhibition among the populations of bees at the different candidate sites results from competition for a finite pool of uncommitted scout bees. As more uncommitted scouts are recruited to one site, fewer are available for recruitment to other sites. Hence, when the total strength of dancing for a superior site and then the number of bees visiting this site goes up, there is inhibition of recruitment to the inferior sites. Eventually, the number of bees visiting the poorer sites will decrease because when the bees from these sites retire and re-enter the process as uncommitted scouts, as discussed in Chapter 6, they are likely to be recruited to a better site whose pool of dances has grown faster and become a larger fraction of the dances on the swarm. One can think of the mutual inhibition among integrators as a means of preventing the emptier ones from refilling after leaking. Indeed, another shared design feature of the integrators in monkey brains and honeybee swarms is that they are leaky. In other words, in both systems, the accumulation of evidence in any given integrator declines unless additional evidence flows into it. In Chapter 6, we saw how each scout bee's commitment to advertising and visiting her site steadily declines over repeated visits to the site. Hence, each scout eventually leaks from the accumulated evidence supporting the choice of her site. Leakage in the accumulation of evidence is a key feature of several models developed by mathematical psychologists to model the information processing that underlies decision-making in primate brains, for example, the leaky competing accumulator model developed by Marius Usher of the University of London and James McClelland of Stanford University. In these models, leakage evidently improves decision-making by increasing the time over which the noisy evidence accumulates until sufficient information for a decision is gained. Leakage also enables a decision-making system to update itself if the situation changes, as when a superior alternative is discovered. In other words, leaky integrators help a system avoid producing fast mistakes. This explanation for the function of leakage evidently applies also to honeybee swarms. I make this claim based on what Kevin Passano and I learned when we explored the design of a swarm as a decision-making system by building a mathematical model of the nest site selection process. Our model simulated the activities of 100 scout bees presented with a landscape containing six nest sites that differed in quality. Each scout bee was endowed with all of the known behavioral rules of these bees. Uncommitted scouts search for new sites or follow dances to be recruited to known sites. Committed scouts evaluate their sites and advertise them with dances whose strengths depend on site quality, and so forth. We first checked the validity of our model by testing whether it would replicate real-world examples of nest site selection. In fact, it does so beautifully. Then we used our model to create 
pseudo-mutant swarms, ones whose scout bees behave a bit differently from what we see in nature, that would show us how small changes in the behavioral rules of the scouts affect a swarm's decision-making performance. For example, we varied the dance decay rate of scout bees to see how this affects the speed and accuracy of decision-making by swarms. In nature, the average scout bee reduces the strength of her dancing by 15 dance circuits per trip back to the swarm. So we looked at what would happen if this dance decay rate were raised, up to 35 dance circuits per trip, or lowered, down to 5 dance circuits per trip. Changing the dance decay rate also changes the integrator leakage rate, since a scout bee stops visiting a site, hence leaks from the integrator, shortly after she stops dancing for the site. We found that when we lowered the dance decay rate so that bees continued dancing longer and leaked from the nest site more slowly, our model of swarms made more rapid but less accurate decisions. Their decision-making deteriorated because slowing the leakage accelerated the evidence accumulation at all the sites, so if the best site happened to get discovered late, one of the inferior sites could accumulate the threshold level of evidence first and win the competition among the sites. Conversely, when we raised the leakage rate, our model swarms made less rapid but more accurate decisions. They were sluggish decision-makers, because the scouts quit visiting their sites so quickly that even the best site's integrator had difficulty accumulating the threshold level of evidence. It was extremely pleasing to discover that the dance decay scout leakage rate that we measured in natural swarms is such that these swarms operate with a good balance between speed and accuracy in choosing their homes. The Action Transformation in a Swarm the final stage of the information processing that underlies decision-making is the rendering of a single response from the multiple readouts of all the integrators. It is now clear that both in monkey brains making eye movement decisions and in honeybee swarms making nest site choices, a response is made when the evidence accumulation in one of the integrators reaches a threshold level. In both systems, the mechanism for choosing a discrete response from a distribution of integrator states is simply one of letting the choice fall to whichever alternative first gains the threshold level of evidence in its integrator. This usually generates a good decision because the relative level of evidence in each alternative's integrator normally reflects the relative strength or quality of each alternative. We have seen, for example, how the better the candidate nest site the stronger the dances produced to report it, and the swifter the build-up of scout bees at the site. Moreover, the self-amplification of the sensory input for each alternative, as recruits become recruiters, and the mutual inhibition among the integrators for the alternatives, by competition for the uncommitted scouts, help ensure that the best nest site will prevail in the contest to accumulate the critical level of evidence even if the best candidate enters the contest late, as often happens. We have seen in Chapter 7 that the decision-making system of a honeybee swarm senses when one of the alternatives has amassed the threshold level of evidence by means of quorum sensing. That is, the scouts at each candidate's site somehow monitor how many of them are at the site, and they note when they have assembled the threshold number, quorum, needed to take action. We have also seen that when the scouts at the chosen site have sensed a quorum, they stimulate the swarm to prepare to take action by returning to the swarm and producing worker piping signals that stimulate the non-scouts to warm up their flight muscles. It seems likely that the worker piping signals also stimulate any scout still committed to a losing site to quit this site. This way, while the non-scouts in the swarm are preparing for flight, the scouts are consolidating the consensus they must build lest they give mixed guidance signals when the swarm takes flight. Eventually, once all the bees in the swarm cluster have warmed their flight muscles to a flight-ready temperature of 35-plus degrees centigrade, the scouts who primed the swarm for flight with piping signals begin to trigger the swarm into flight with buzz-running signals. Finally, the scouts who know the way to the chosen site steer the swarm along its chosen course of action. A critical element in the design of this decision-making system 
is the quorum size, for it turns out that it strongly influences the speed and accuracy of a swarm's choice of its new home. This fact was revealed when Kevin Passano and I turned up and down the quorum number of bees in our mathematical model of the bees' nest site selection process. We found that, adjusting the number downward from its normal value, some fifteen bees present simultaneously outside the nest site, caused swarms to make quick but error-prone decisions, while adjusting it upward gave rise to slower but only slightly more accurate decisions. It looks, therefore, like the bees normally operate with a quorum set high enough to guarantee that swarms make highly accurate decisions rather than super-speedy ones. This makes sense, for a swarm has just one crack at correctly making the life-or-death choice of its dwelling place, so it should choose carefully, not rapidly. The high quorum number may also be favored by a swarm's need to have a sizable crew of scouts who have visited the chosen site and so can guide the swarm to its new residence. There does exist the possibility that the bees will lower the quorum number in an emergency, such as when the weather turns dangerous or the swarm begins to starve. This way, a swarm that is in mortal danger may gain some shelter without further delay. Whether this possibility is an actuality remains, however, a subject for future study. Convergence on Optimal Design Thirty years ago, in his book Gödel, Escher, Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid, the computer scientist Douglas Hofstadter presented the intriguing idea that ant colonies are no different from brains in many respects. He pointed out that in both systems a higher-level intelligence emerges from groups of dumb beings, groups of ants behaving and groups of neurons firing. At the time of Hofstadter's book, the similarities between social decision-making systems and neural decision-making systems could be seen only hazily, for example by noting that both kinds of systems encode information about the external world in the activity patterns of their elements. Now we know a great deal more about the decision-making mechanisms of insect societies and primate brains, and what we have learned over the past three decades provides striking support for Hofstadter's idea that evolution has built intellectual strength in ant or bee colonies and in primate brains using fundamentally similar schemes of information processing. We have recently realized that primate brains and honeybee swarms are faced with the same basic problem of choosing between alternative courses of action based on a body of noisy information that is dispersed across many component parts, none of which will ever acquire global knowledge of the alternatives. And as we have seen, the solution that both have hit upon is an information processing system which has the design that has five critical elements. 1. A population of sensory units S sub I, that provides input about the alternatives. Each sensor reports, noisily, on just one alternative, and each sensor's input strength is proportional to the quality of its alternative. 2. A population of integrator units, I sub I, that integrate the sensory information over time and over sensory units. Each integrator accumulates evidence in support of just one alternative. 3. Mutual inhibition among the integrators. So the growth in evidence in one suppresses with increasing strength the growth of evidence in the others. 4. Leakage of the integrators. So the growth of evidence in an integrator requires sustained input of sensory evidence supporting its alternative. 5. Threshold sensing by the integrators, such that the decision falls to the alternative whose integrator first accumulates a threshold level of evidence. What underlies this striking convergence in the design of decision-making systems built of neurons and bees? Also of ants, a beautiful set of studies of collective decision-making during house hunting by the rock ant Temnothorax albipennis has revealed an information processing scheme that is remarkably similar to the one described here for honeybees, though of independent evolutionary origin. 
A strong possibility is that this striking similarity exists because this design is a means of implementing robust, efficient, and possibly even optimal decision-making. It has been shown mathematically that the scheme can implement the statistically optimal strategy for choosing between two alternatives. This is the Sequential Probability Ratio Test, SPRT, which specifies when to stop integrating further evidence in order to achieve a given error rate. Among all possible tests, this one minimizes the decision time for any desired level of decision accuracy. In other words, this test achieves the optimal trade-off between decision accuracy and decision speed. Recently, James Marshall, a computer scientist at the University of Bristol in England, and a team of colleagues, have examined, theoretically, how honeybee swarms might implement optimal decision-making in the simple situation of a binary choice between two possible home sites. They point out that, in a race between two evidence totals, the evidence for one alternative can be seen as evidence against the other, so, in effect, the evidence can be accumulated as a single total. This means that, as time passes and the decision-making system acquires evidence for the two alternatives, at any one time, only one alternative will have accumulated a non-zero level of evidence in its favor. In other words, the accumulation of evidence can be thought of as a random walk along a timeline where the positive direction represents increasing evidence for one of the alternatives and the negative direction represents increasing evidence for the other alternative. The drift of the evidence line, up or down, denotes the tendency of the line to move toward the better alternative, and the jaggedness of the line represents the noisiness or uncertainty in the incoming evidence. It turns out that this random walk or diffusion model of decision-making implements the statistically optimal SPRT. In the case of a swarm making a choice between two possible nest sites, the existence of strong mutual inhibition between the two integrators, the two groups of scout bees visiting the sites, makes it possible that the evidence for one site will be evidence against the other. Strong mutual inhibition is likely to exist, however, only when there are few uncommitted bees in the swarm, at which time each gain of a supporter by one site will come at the cost of a supporter from the other site. This situation, or at least something close to it, is apt to arise only rather late in the decision-making process when most of the scout bees have entered the process and have become committed to a site. This is also the time when many of the less desirable sites have been eliminated from the contest and new sites are being discovered only infrequently. Thus it seems that optimal decision-making, as modeled by the SPRT, may happen only toward the end of a swarm's decision-making process. But this is probably just when the greatest skill in decision-making is needed, for toward the end only a few relatively high-quality sites are likely to remain under consideration, which makes it difficult to identify the best site. Clearly, future studies will need to examine closely whether in a binary-choice situation it is typical for all of a swarm's scouts eventually to become committed to one site or the other, whereupon the decision-making between the two sites is expected to proceed optimally. Of course, in nature, decision-makers are rarely faced with the simple binary-choice situation for which the SPRT is provably optimal. Certainly, we have seen that most honeybee swarms are faced with choosing among a dozen or more possible nest sites, and that even toward the end of a swarm's deliberations, the race to gain a threshold level of evidence often involves more than two sites. Nevertheless, because the SPRT remains effective in situations with several alternatives, so long as some are markedly better than others, it is possible that primate brains and honeybee swarms have independently evolved the same basic decision-making scheme precisely because it provides a good approximation of optimal decision-making. If this hunch proves correct, then we are looking at an astonishing convergence in the adaptive design of two physically distinct forms of thinking machine, a brain built of neurons and a swarm built of bees. 10. Swarm Smarts For so work the honeybees, 
creatures that by a rule in nature teach the act of order to a peopled kingdom. William Shakespeare, Henry V, 1599. Let us now consider what lessons we humans can learn from honeybees about how to structure a decision-making group so that the knowledge and brain power of its members is effectively marshaled to produce good collective choices. This is an important subject, for human society relies on groups to be more reliable than individuals when it comes to making weighty decisions. This is why we have juries, boards of trustees, blue ribbon panels, and nine justices on the U.S. Supreme Court. But as we all know, groups don't always make smart decisions either. Unless a group is properly organized, so that the face-to-face -face deliberations of its members result in collective reasoning that is broadly informed and deeply thoughtful, the group is apt to be a dysfunctional decision-making body. If so, then the judgments issued by the group can produce fiascos for the affected community. Fortunately, the house-hunting bees show us a brilliant solution to the puzzle of what gives rise to good group decision-making. It is a solution that has been honed by natural selection for many millions of years. Fossils from the Oligocene epoch indicate that honeybees have existed for at least 30 million years. So it is certainly a time-tested method for achieving collective wisdom. Of course, employing insects as management gurus has its limitations, and we should not blindly imitate their methods. Nevertheless, I will claim that the bees demonstrate to us several principles of effective group decision-making, and that by implementing them we can raise the reliability of decision-making by human groups. The latter part of this claim is not merely hypothetical, for I have applied what I have learned from the bees to humans, especially to my colleagues at Cornell. In 2005, just as the shape of the bees' decision-making process was becoming clear, I became head of the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior. For fun, and as an experiment, I decided to introduce some of the ways the scout bees go about choosing a home to the ways my fellow professors and I hold deliberations in our monthly faculty meetings. Unlike the swarm bees, we do not face life-or-death decisions, but we do face ones that are difficult enough. Choices about hirings, promotions, and other matters with long-term consequences for our tight-knit academic community. I am probably blissfully blind to my colleagues' true thoughts about our collective decision-making, but I think that they have been satisfied with the tough decisions we've made, even though things certainly haven't always gone the way that each professor wanted. And I'd like to think that their apparent satisfaction reflects how our decisions have been based on open and fair discussions. In any event, I will explain how I have tried to put the five habits of highly effective groups that I have learned from the bees to work in a university setting. To strengthen further my case that what has been learned from the bees has relevance to humans, I will discuss some intriguing resemblances between honeybee swarms and New England town meetings in how they are organized to produce good decisions. Why use the New England town meeting as a point of comparison? It is because this special form of small-town government, which has existed for more than three centuries and is arguably the most authentic form of human democracy in the world, uses a collective decision-making process not unlike that used by the swarm bees. Once a year, on town meeting day, traditionally the Tuesday following the first Monday in March, the citizens in a town come together in an open, face-to-face -face assembly and render binding collective decisions, laws, that govern the actions of everyone in their town. Each town meeting is a fascinating blend of communal ambience and individual enterprise, as is each honeybee swarm. We will see that there are compelling similarities in the inner workings of these two proven forms of democracy. I don't think it is a happenstance that what works well for bee swarms also works well for town meetings. Lesson 1. Compose the decision-making group of individuals with shared interests and mutual respect. For the members of a decision-making group to work together productively, they must have a fair amount of alignment of interests so that they are inclined to form a cooperative and cohesive unit. It is also helpful if the group's members have a fair amount of mutual respect, 
so that they will constructively debate the proposals offered by one another, consider the other individual's points of view, and refrain from bruising egos and arousing anger when it comes time to critically evaluating one another's ideas. Certainly a decision-making group composed of clashing curmudgeons is unlikely to have the morale and working relations needed to function effectively. The house-hunting bees exemplify a group whose members have shared interests and mutual respect. Biologists now understand that the genetic success of each worker bee in a honeybee colony depends on the fate of the entire colony. No individual bee succeeds unless the whole colony survives and reproduces. Furthermore, it is now understood that the virtual absence of reproduction by the worker bees in a honey bee colony means that these bees all propagate their genes through one shared channel, the reproductive offspring of their mother queen. And since these reproductive offspring, the queens and drones produced in the spring, contain an unbiased sample of the colony's genes, the colony propagates the workers' genes with a high degree of fairness. So, because the workers have a common need for their colony to thrive, and because a thriving colony passes the workers' genes into the future with near-perfect impartiality, it is not surprising that the workers of a honeybee colony cooperate strongly to serve the common good. The humans in a community rarely share a singularity of purpose like the bees in a swarm, so humans are less inclined than bees to be highly cooperative when tackling a problem they must address together. Nevertheless, there are certain things we can do to encourage ourselves to work together. One is for a group's leader to remind the members at the outset that they all have a large stake in the welfare of the group. At the start of the annual town meeting in Bradford, Vermont, for example, the moderator, Larry Coffin, who has served in this role for 38 years and probably knows more about this job than anyone else in the state, begins the meeting in the traditional way by asking for a moment of silence out of respect for the exercise in democracy that we are about to engage in. This gently reminds everyone in the auditorium that they have assembled to make decisions and pass laws for their community. Similarly, at the start of the monthly faculty meetings in my department at Cornell, I generally make a few remarks reminding everyone that our overarching goal is to make decisions that will strengthen our department and so ultimately benefit us all. A second way to foster good working relations within a human group charged with a decision-making task is to stock it with genuinely reasonable people, ones who are known to be respectful of others and constructive in their comments, while at the same time good at spotting hidden problems and engaging in vigorous debate. Often, however, one cannot choose the members of a decision-making group. But even when the personality mix of a working group cannot be shaped, Norms of behavior and procedural practices that foster good morale can be promoted. In Bradford, Vermont, for instance, Larry Coffin reminds everyone at the start of the yearly town meeting to address their comments and opinions directly to him, the moderator, rather than to other citizens. This helps keep tempers from flaring and the debate moving forward. Likewise, in my department's faculty meetings, I sometimes find myself gently cutting off demoralizing stalemates by noting when contrary viewpoints are being needlessly repeated. And twice I have had to cool an overheated exchange between two faculty members by nudging them off a personal quarrel. Such things reawaken my appreciation of the marvelous absence of corrosive relations among the debating bees. Lesson 2. Minimize the leader's influence on the group's thinking. One of the most striking features of the swarm bee's decision-making process is that it is a perfectly democratic endeavor, one in which the power is evenly diffused among all the scout bees in a swarm. In other words, the swarm bees choose their new home without a leader integrating information from different sources or telling the others what to do. Even the all-important queen, who is certainly the genetic heart of a swarm, is merely a bystander. Indeed, in many of the experiments described earlier in this book, the swarm's queen was confined in a small cage around which the swarming bees clustered. So she was physically separated from the scout bees' deliberations, and yet the swarm skillfully chose its new home. 
By operating without a leader, the scout bees of a swarm neatly avoid one of the greatest threats to good decision-making by groups, a domineering leader. Such an individual reduces a group's collective power to uncover a diverse set of possible solutions to a problem, to critically appraise these possibilities, and to winnow out all but the best one. Unlike honeybee swarms, most human groups operate with a leader. So clearly, a prominent question we must address is how the leader of a decision-making body should behave to promote sound thinking by the group. I suggest the answer is that the group's leader should act as impartially as possible, so that his or her influence on the outcome of the decision-making process is minimized. Only then can the group fully exploit the power of collective choice. This means that at the start of deliberations, the leader should limit his or her comments to neutral information about such things as the scope of the problem, the resources available to solve it, and the rules of procedure. Also, the leader should refrain from advocating any solutions he or she would like to see adopted and instead should show an open-minded desire for fresh ideas. By functioning not as a proselytizing boss but as an impartial information seeker, the leader creates an atmosphere of open inquiry that helps the group tap its summed knowledge to assemble a wide range of possible actions. In addition to conducting meetings in a non-directive way, the leader should encourage the airing of doubts and disagreements, even ones that are critical of the leader. This fosters the free discussion and careful debate that the group will need to thoroughly evaluate its options. If a leader shows partiality at the outset of the deliberations, or expresses displeasure if the discussion is not going in a certain direction, then he or she is likely to subvert good group decision-making. One problem with both of these leadership practices is that they can lead to a premature consensus by the group as its members, consciously or unconsciously, seek to please their leader. An example of this phenomenon is the decision made by President George W. Bush and his foreign policy team to invade Iraq in 2003. As explained by Scott McClellan, Deputy White House Press Secretary at the time, Bush's style of leadership was headstrong. He told his foreign policy advisers of his deeply held belief that Saddam Hussein was an international pariah who possessed weapons of mass destruction and so should be removed. Evidently, Bush's foreign policy advisers, including his national security adviser Condoleezza Rice, went right along with his thinking as they sought to please the president. They did little to question his thinking, engage in extended debate about the possible policy options, or delve deeply into the consequences of going to war. In short, they squandered their opportunity to use group intelligence. Thus, we now know that the hasty and flawed decision to invade Iraq was based largely on the gut feelings of just one man, George W. Bush. Larry Coffin, the gentleman who has served for nearly four decades as the moderator of town meetings in Bradford, Vermont, shows us how an impartial leader can promote the emergence of a group's collective wisdom. Although the moderator has sole authority for running the town's annual meeting, he or she must always remember that the will of the people comes first. One way that Coffin avoids influencing the townspeople's will is the way he starts the discussion for each question, or article, on the meeting's published agenda. After reading the article, for example, Shall the town of Bradford purchase a fire truck for an amount not to exceed $306,000? Coffin asks the crowd, What is your pleasure? Soon a townsperson will raise a hand, Coffin will recognize him or her to speak, and the process of open deliberation on this article is underway. In a New England town meeting, the moderator is responsible for making sure that every registered voter is allowed to speak, that the competition among competing views is conducted fairly, and that the group makes its decisions in a timely manner. To fulfill these duties, moderators are instructed not to rely on personal authority, but instead to lean on Robert's Rules of Order, which Major Henry M. Robert, an engineer in the U.S. Army, published in 1876 as a Guide to Fair and Orderly Procedures in Meetings. If a town's moderator defers to these rules and so acts with some humility, 
then the general will of the town's citizens will emerge on each problem they address. Lesson 3. Seek Diverse Solutions to the Problem Sometimes a problem's architecture defines the possible solutions. To open a door, we know our choices are limited to pushing or pulling. But other times the available options are not well defined. Then the logical first step toward solving the problem is to uncover a profusion of possible solutions in the hope that one will prove excellent. And here is where a democratic group can vastly outperform a despotic individual, since a group's power to explore for options can greatly surpass that of a lone individual. This is especially true if the group's members are numerous, diverse, and independent. With many individuals bringing unique experiences to the problem and searching independently for possible solutions, the chances are high that someone will come up with a radically new option which might be just what is needed. The house-hunting bees provide a beautiful demonstration of the effectiveness of a large and diverse search committee whose members explore on their own. As we have seen, a swarm sends out hundreds of scout bees that explore for potential home sites over an area stretching five or more kilometers, at least three miles, from the bivouac site. Each intrepid scout bee works by herself, diligently poking around tree trunks and rock outcrops in search of small, dark openings that might lead to a suitably roomy and protective nest cavity. Whenever a scout chances upon a possible dwelling place, she scrutinizes it, and, if it proves acceptable, she returns to the swarm and freely reports her discovery with a waggle dance. This puts an option on the table for further consideration. It is as if each scout that announces a new site says to her fellow scouts, Shouldn't we give some thought to this possibility, which is located X degrees to the right or left of the sun and Y meters away? The distributed reconnaissance process of the scout bees often continues for hours or days, so it is not surprising that a swarm typically uncovers ten to twenty or even more possible places to live. Clearly, the house-hunting process of a honeybee swarm is open to the widest possible array of choices, and this gives the bees a strong start in selecting the best available living quarters. What can we humans do so that our own decision-making groups, when faced with complex problems, also develop a broad set of alternatives from which to choose? Considering what the bees do, I suggest four things. First, make sure the group is sufficiently large for the challenge it faces. Second, make sure the group consists of people with diverse backgrounds and perspectives. Third, foster independent exploratory work by the group's members. And fourth, create a social environment in which the group's members feel comfortable about proposing solutions. If a group implements all four suggestions, then it is likely to achieve a thorough exploration of its options. Often one cannot shape all of these four elements of a group's search for alternative solutions, but it will still help to improve some of them. For example, in organizing a faculty meeting in my department at Cornell, I cannot adjust its size or composition. I can, however, encourage creative thinking about possible solutions and can foster the reporting of them to the group. To help get new ideas, I will present the problem to my colleagues well in advance of the meeting. This way, each one can wrestle with it privately prior to the meeting. And to encourage everyone to contribute their ideas, I will begin the meeting by suggesting that we start tackling the problem by getting a wide range of options on the table. My colleagues are always good scout bees, and most are as uninhibited as a dancing bee about sharing their knowledge. So this brainstorming phase quickly yields a broad set of proposals. But to be sure that we are looking at all the conceivable options, I will ask each person who has not spoken if he or she has something to add. Often, the quieter folks will further broaden the list of options with thoughtful proposals. Given the importance of endowing a decision-making group with diverse knowledge, it is noteworthy that Robert's Rules of Order, which provides the exact rules of procedure for a New England town meeting, includes a nifty rule that helps ensure that every participant at the town meeting gets to express his or her thoughts on each issue. 
No one may speak more than twice on a particular issue until everyone who wants to speak on the issue has had an opportunity to do so once. So long as a meeting's moderator strictly enforces this rule, nobody can dominate a discussion. This certainly boosts the fairness of a debate. It also boosts the debate's effectiveness because this rule helps ensure that a town meeting's decision-making benefits from the full range of facts and opinions held by its participants. Evidently, Major Henry M. Robert understood the importance to a community's deliberations of tapping fully the collective knowledge of its members. Lesson 4. Aggregate the Group's Knowledge Through Debate Probably the greatest challenge faced by a group that makes decisions democratically is to know how to turn the knowledge and opinions of its many members into a single choice for the group as a whole. Indeed, this is a problem that has challenged social philosophers and political scientists for centuries. We humans have devised a variety of voting procedures to single out one option from a list of possible choices. Majority rule, plurality wins, weighted voting schemes, and others. However, the problem of social choice is not unique to humans. In many other species, the same problem arises. How should a democratic group's members reach a decision when they strongly disagree? The house-hunting process of honeybees provides us with an intriguing answer to this question, one that has been shaped by natural selection over millions of years. We have seen that the heart of the bee's decision-making process is a turbulent debate among groups of scout bees supporting different options, potential nest sites. These groups compete to gain additional members from a pool of scout bees who are not yet committed to a site. Whichever group first attracts a quorum of supporters wins the competition. The winning group then goes on to build a consensus among the scouts so that when it comes time for the scouts to pilot the swarm to its new home, they are in complete agreement about the flight plan. What is perhaps most impressive about the bees' system of social choice is its ability to distinguish good options from bad ones so that almost always a swarm selects the single best site from among the dozen or more possible home sites that its scout bees have discovered. And what I find most noteworthy about a swarm's skill in decision-making is how it arises from a truly ingenious balance between interdependence and independence among the debating scout bees. The scouts operate interdependently in that they communicate with one another about their swarm's options. This communication is crucial because it is what makes it possible for one scout bee's news about a dream home site to percolate among the hundreds of scout bees in a swarm. We have seen how a committed scout can advertise her site to uncommitted scouts by performing a waggle dance. The uncommitted scouts who follow another scout's dance are then recruited to the advertised site, and these recruited bees can in turn advertise the site and thereby recruit still more scouts to this particular site. Thus, there is potential for runaway growth, positive feedback in the number of scout bees visiting each site. And we have seen that the better the site, the stronger the dancers advertising it, hence the greater the positive feedback for this site. Thus, by grading their dance advertisements according to site quality, the scouts adaptively bias the competition for more supporters in favor of the superior sites. And once a bias in favor of the better sites is established, it will grow and grow. The rich will become richer as the process of positive feedback amplifies the starting bias. Sooner or later, the supply of uncommitted scouts will dwindle, further intensifying the competition among groups of scouts and leading, ultimately, to the bees' interest shooting up at one site while fading away at all the others. Almost always, the best site prevails in this winner-takes-all contest. The system works so well that even when the best site is discovered several hours after all the others, it can still quickly dominate the competition. Such come-from-behind success is made possible by the strongest advertising and thus strongest positive feedback coming from the crowd championing the tip-top site. The interdependence among the communicating scout bees 
is certainly a crucial part of the social machinery by which they aggregate their many pieces of information about potential home sites. Their capacity for recruitment communication and the positive feedback it engenders is what gives their decision-making system the ability to concentrate its attention, the build-up of scouts on one site. But what guarantees that the scout bees focus on the best site is one small but utterly critical piece of independence among them. Each one decides whether to advertise a site, and if so, how strongly, based on her own independent evaluation of the site. No scout bee, not even one that has encountered a wildly exuberant dancer, will blindly follow another scout's opinion by dancing for a site she has not inspected. This is critical. If scout bees were to blindly copy dancers, then their decision-making system would be prone to catastrophic amplifications, again through positive feedback, of errors in the reports by the first scouts who discover potential home sites. It would be much like what happened in the stock market bubble in the late 1990s, when investors bought stocks in telecommunication and technology companies based on watching what others were buying, the conventional wisdom, rather than checking carefully for themselves the fundamentals of these companies. Mindlessly joining a stampeding herd, investors sunk hundreds of billions of dollars in companies that lacked solid value and eventually went bankrupt. So, rather than perform slavish imitations of dancers, the scout bees perform judicious imitations. A scout will copy the dance that informed her of a site, but only after she has scrutinized the site herself and has concluded it truly deserves to be promoted. Thus, the scout bees make use of the power of communication to help good ideas spread, while at the same time they avoid the risk of creating an information cascade about an inferior site. By evaluating sites independently, they invest their attention wisely. How can humans use what the bees have demonstrated about aggregating the knowledge and opinions of a group's members to make good choices for the group as a whole? I suggest three things. First, we use the power of an open and fair competition of ideas, in the form of a frank debate, to integrate the information that is dispersed among the group's members. Second, we foster good communication within the debating group, recognizing that this is how valuable information that is uncovered by one member will quickly reach the other members. And third, we recognize that while it is important for a group's members to listen to what everyone else is saying, it is essential that they listen critically, form their own opinions about the options being discussed, and register their views independently. These three principles will be familiar to residents of New England towns where the annual town meeting is conducted in the old-fashioned way, with citizens coming together on town meeting day and making decisions through face-to-face -face deliberations. Just as the bees engage in courteous but free-wheeling debates, so townspeople hold civil but spirited exchanges of views. Just as the bees share their knowledge and opinions about nest sites with concise dances, so townspeople contribute their facts and feelings about fire trucks, bridge repairs, and tax rates with brief speeches. And just as the bees show support by dancing and visiting for sites based on their independent evaluations, so townspeople show support by shouting I or nay, standing or using handwritten ballots, for articles based on their personal judgments. In both bee swarms and town meetings, the heart of the decision-making process is an open competition of ideas that are publicly shared but privately evaluated. How do the faculty in my department at Cornell use what has been learned about the bees' means of deliberating to make smart decisions in our meetings? First, just like the scout bees that begin their hard work by searching widely for possible dwelling places, we begin tackling a tough issue by looking broadly at our options, as described earlier. Next, we use the same method as the scout bees for turning the diverse pieces of information in the minds of many individuals into one chosen course of action, a friendly competition of ideas. To get the give and take of deliberation going, I usually say something like, Well, folks, I'd like us to kick these ideas around a bit. This works. 
Most of my colleagues are comfortable sharing their thoughts, and those who are quieter will be drawn into the discussion when I go around the room and ask them to share their views. One of the best things about this approach is that it lets different individuals contribute different pieces of the puzzle. One person will mention something that we've overlooked so far about one of the proposals. Somebody else will say he or she doesn't understand the last person's point, and another person will provide clarification. Somebody will then say there is something about one of the proposals that bothers him or her, and others will agree or disagree with this and explain why. If the meeting is going well, there is a noticeable forward movement to the discussion. Once it feels like everything that needs to be said has been said, and my colleagues indicate that they have the information they need to make a decision, we will take a vote. In the past, we generally took votes by show of hands, but now we use secret ballots. Some people balked at first. We've never done this before except on tenure decisions. But after I explained that I really want to get each person's independent opinion free of peer pressure that could produce conformity, they realized that voting by secret ballot is the best way to know our true collective judgment on an issue. Lesson 5. Use Quorum Responses for Cohesion, Accuracy, and Speed One might think that when a democratic group has to make a decision that will apply to everyone in the group, it is best to let the group's debate continue unhindered until the opinions of the participants have coalesced around a unified choice. After all, if a problem has an underlying correct solution, then it might pay to argue things through until everyone accepts this solution. This would both ensure that an accurate decision is made and promote broad acceptance of the decision. Sometimes, however, there isn't one solution that serves everyone's interests, in which case more discussion is unlikely to produce agreement, and the best thing is probably to cut off a bitter debate with a vote. But even when there is an optimal solution, likely for groups whose members have common interests, it may not be worthwhile arguing on to reach complete agreement. Usually there are costs associated with investing more time in the decision process, and the accumulating costs of further debate can eventually outweigh the benefits. The house-hunting honeybees show us a clever way for a decision-making group to make an accurate consensus decision and also save some time. Their trick is to have the scout bees make quorum responses, that is, to have these bees make sharp changes in their behavior when a threshold number, quorum, of individuals support one of the alternatives. Let's review how this works. We have seen that the bees in a swarm must choose accurately to survive, and that they must stay together to survive, so they need to reach an accurate consensus decision about their new home. We have also seen that these bees will invest heavily up to several days in searching for possible home sites and publicly debating which one is the best. And we have seen that once the population of scouts at one of the potential home sites exceeds a threshold or quorum, the scouts visiting this site will abruptly change their behavior and return to the swarm to perform piping signals. Their piping induces the many thousands of non-scout bees to warm their flight muscles in preparation for the swarm's flight to the chosen site. This piping probably also tells the scouts from the non-chosen sites, the ones without a quorum, that they should cease advertising and visiting these sites, which in turn will speed up the consensus building among the scout bees. Thus, because a quorum of scouts at the winning site triggers key changes in the behavior of the scouts from this site, the decision-making system of honeybee swarms has a means of accelerating consensus formation once evidence sufficient to guarantee an accurate decision has accumulated at one of the sites. Brilliant! An additional benefit of the scout bee's sharp quorum response is that it enables the thousands of non-scouts in a swarm to start their flight preparations long before the scouts reach their consensus, which further shortens the time the swarm spends hanging precariously from a swaying tree branch. Quorum responses can also help human decision-making groups that need to find agreement do so with high accuracy and all possible speed. For example, 
in the faculty meetings of my department when we face a major decision that should be resolved with a unanimous vote one way or the other such as whether or not to recommend an assistant professor for promotion with tenure we will take straw polls by secret ballot periodically during the discussion to see how close we are to consensus if a poll reveals that we are far from unanimity then we all know that further careful debate is needed for everyone to become of one mind but if a poll reveals that we are close to agreement the few folks supporting the minority position usually will realize that a collective decision has essentially been reached that prolonging the debate is pointless and that it is best to switch to the majority position to build the needed consensus thus the device of taking straw polls can give the members of a decision-making group the information they need to make quorum responses that will accelerate their consensus building of course in a human group as in a bee swarm individuals should operate with a high threshold when making a quorum response to avoid sacrificing the accuracy of the group's decision-making i believe this is how it works in our faculty meetings although i don't know for sure i estimate that my colleagues will change their votes and minds for the sake of achieving consensus only when at least eighty per cent approximately sixteen out of twenty of us are already in agreement e pluribus unum through quorum responses yes but do so carefully using a quorum that is sufficiently large to ensure accurate decision-making by the community epilogue sixty years ago martin lindauer happened upon a beard-like cluster of honey-bees hanging on a bush and noticed something odd the handful of bees on the swarm that were waggle dancing were black with soot red with brick dust and gray with soil why were they so grubby could it be he wondered that while most of the swarm bees had been quietly bivouacked in the bush these dirty dancers had been out searching for nest sites with this chance observation and the insight it sparked lindauer embarked on what he would later describe as the most beautiful experience of his life probing the mystery of how a honey-bee swarm finds a home this book has reviewed how lindauer and his scientific successors have solved the mystery of how a bunch of bees can wisely choose their new residence we have seen that this decision is made by a search committee composed of a few hundred scout bees all of whom have previous experience as foragers but have switched to exploring dark cavities instead of visiting bright blossoms and we have seen how these house hunters search for candidate dwelling places share their findings by performing dances conduct an extended debate about which one is best and eventually come to an agreement about the swarm's new home almost always the collective wisdom of the scout bees chooses the best available option so that the swarm occupies a nest cavity that provides good protection and sufficient space to hold the large honey stores that the colony will consume in keeping itself warm throughout winter we now know that the amazing feat of democratic decision-making performed by the scout bees offers us deep lessons about how a group of individuals with common interests can structure their group so that it functions as an effective decision-making body it is worth taking careful note of how the scout bees manage to be so good at all three of the key ingredients of good decision-making by a group identifying a diverse set of options sharing freely the information about these options and aggregating this information to choose the best option remarkably the scout bees do all these things without working under the guidance of a leader doing so certainly steers the bees clear of one of the greatest pitfalls to good group decision-making a dominating leader who advocates a particular outcome and thereby inhibits the group from taking a broad and deep look at its options but the absence of a leader among the scout bees also means that they operate without the benefit of someone in charge to state the group's objectives define the group's methods of deciding keep the group on track during its meeting foster a balanced discussion among the group's members and identify when a decision has been reached the scout bees in a swarm are able to work together well without supervision 
partly because each bee has a strong incentive to make a good decision. Their swarm's survival depends on the scouts finding it a suitably secure and roomy place to live. The success of the leaderless scout bees is also favored by the reality that they have just one problem to solve. So there is no confusion about their objective and no tendency for their discussion to drift off topic. And, by the way, they have rules of procedure that are hardwired into their nervous systems. So there is no need for someone to define or enforce their rules of procedure. Thus, the house-hunting bees remind us that the leader in a democratic group serves mainly to shape the process, not the product of the group's deliberations. The bees also demonstrate that a democratic group can function perfectly well without a leader if the group's members agree on the problems they face and on the protocol they will use to make their decisions. The first challenge faced by every decision-making assembly is to identify the available options. Ideally, its members will uncover all the relevant possibilities. We have seen that the house-hunting scout bees approach this ideal by searching widely for prospective nesting sites and discovering a few dozen candidate home sites. The bees' success in finding a broad range of options reflects two things. First, they are a large group, usually several hundred individuals, so they bring considerable bee power to the search for possible places to live. Second, they are a diverse team of explorers, with no two individuals probing the exact same region of the surrounding countryside. For example, one bee will fly off in one direction and examine the dusty knot holes that she finds in the trees on a certain hillside. Meanwhile, her fellow scouts will set out in various other directions and inspect the cracks in buildings, abandoned woodpecker nests, and whatever other possibilities they encounter. The differences in where the scout bees explore for future accommodations may reflect differences in where they previously worked as foragers, differences in their personalities. Some may prefer to search far out, while others may wish to hunt nearby, or differences in combinations of these and other factors. Whatever the exact cause of the variance in where the scouts conduct their reconnaissance, the result is that they discover a broad assortment of possible living quarters. This variety makes it likely that at least one of their finds will provide the bees with an excellent home. Besides doing a good job of uncovering options, the members of a decision-making group must also do a good job of sharing the news of their finds. If an individual doesn't make the news of her discovery public, but instead keeps it private, this information will go unused, and this can lead to an inferior decision by the group. Imagine, for example, someone in a group uncovering a first-rate option, but then not revealing it to others. The group cannot incorporate this information in their discussion. Given the critical importance of exposing all private information that is relevant to a group's decision-making, it is not surprising that when a scout bee in a honey bee swarm locates a potential nesting site, scrutinizes it, and concludes that it has high value, she quickly flies back to the swarm cluster and excitedly announces her discovery. We have seen that she does so by performing a waggle dance that reveals the direction, distance, and desirability of her find. The more highly the little scout bee values her property, the more dance circuits she performs, and the more as yet uncommitted scout bees she attracts to her site. We have also seen that the scouts who make the original discoveries of potential home sites tend to announce their finds especially persistently, probably to help ensure that the information that they alone, at first, possess gets passed on to others and so becomes part of their swarm's pool of public information. It should be noted, too, that every scout bee is free to advocate whatever site she finds, even one that is a relatively poor option. In a sense, then, on a honey bee swarm, all views are welcomed and respected, all opinions may be voiced. Once a decision-making group has gathered and shared the information about options, it next faces the challenge of aggregating this information to choose a winner. We have seen that the bees do so in a most ingenious way, 
by conducting a frank debate among the scout bees supporting the various proposed nest sites. This debate works much like a political election, for there are multiple candidates, nest sites, competing advertisements, waggle dances for the different candidates, individuals who are committed to one or another candidate, scouts supporting a site, and a pool of neutral voters, scouts not yet committed to a site. Also, the supporters for each site can become apathetic and rejoin the pool of neutral voters. The election's outcome is biased strongly in favor of the best site because this site's supporters will produce the strongest dance advertisements and so will gain converts the most rapidly, and because the best site's supporters will revert to neutral voter status the most slowly. Ultimately, the bees supporting one of the sites, usually the best one, dominate the competition so completely that every scout bee supports just one site. A unanimous agreement is reached. It is important to note that even though the scout bee's way of making a decision ends with a consensus, the bees do not minimize conflict to reach this consensus. Specifically, there is no suppression of dissenting views in the debate. Moreover, there is no pressure toward social conformity. Instead, each scout bee makes her own independent decision of whether or not to support a site based on her own personal evaluation of the site, not on how others judge the site. Thus, the bees aggregate the information about their options by conducting an open debate in which the best site prevails by virtue of its superiority, as judged time and time and time again by dozens if not hundreds of independent-minded scout bees. For millions of years, the scout bees on honeybee swarms have faced the task of selecting proper homes for their colonies. Over this vast stretch of evolutionary time, natural selection has structured these insect search committees so that they make the best possible decisions. Now, at last, we humans have the pleasure of knowing how this ingenious selection process works and the opportunity to use this knowledge to improve our own lives. Some have said that honeybees are messengers sent by the gods to show us how we ought to live, in sweetness and in beauty and in peacefulness. Whether or not this is true, I believe that the story of house hunting by honeybees can inspire the light of amazement about these beautiful little creatures, a light that I hope has shined through each chapter of this book.